Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and welcome to our April 11th board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are with us here today and those who are watching this meeting via live stream. Now let us begin, by stand, uh, let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call the roll to recognize board members and establish that we have a quorum. Mr. Saeed. Hello, everybody. Sammy Saeed, student member of the board, and as always, I am thrilled to be here today. Good morning, Chevra Evans, District 4. Good to see everyone. Good afternoon, I guess. Um, Rebecca Spondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an at-large member of the board. Good afternoon, everyone. Brenda Wolf, District 5. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Good day, Rivera Oven, District 1. Good afternoon, Julie Yang, District 3. I'm happy to be here today. Good to see everyone. Great, now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous. Okay, moving on to agenda item three, human resources and development. Um, Dr. Felder, do you have some recommended appointments? Indeed I do. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Silvestri, members of the board, and everyone joining us today. We have seven appointments today. Very excited about that. Uh, first would be Ms. Liliana Lopez, Press Secretary, uh, Public Information Officer, Office of Communications, Office of the Chief of Staff, and she's attending. Joining her today is her sister, Carla Lopez Arias. Ms. Lopez comes to Montgomery County Public Schools with more than 15 years of communications and public relations experience. Ms. Lopez is eager to join the MCPS communications team and contribute to amplifying the stories of students' academic success. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Next is Miss Anita O'Neill, Principal, Clarksburg High School. She's attending. Joining her today is her husband, Andrew, and son, Clayton. Miss O'Neill has been employed with MCPS for 28 years as a substitute teacher, teacher, staff development teacher, resource teacher, supervisor, assistant school administrator, assistant principal, principal intern, and most recently, acting principal, Clarksburg High School. She looks forward to continuing to be part of the Clarksburg community and leading such a wonderful school. Shout outs to her parents, W.D. and Shirley Spangler, who are watching online from Roanoke, Virginia. Her daughter, Devin, son-in-law, Victor, daughter-in-law, Maddie, and to the MCPS mentors who have supported her throughout her professional journey. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. Abstaining. Motion passes. Congratulations. Next would be Mr. Bradley Rohner, Principal, Damascus High School, attending. Joining him today is his wife, Rochelle, a former MCPS special education teacher, may need to recruit her back, <laughs> uh, Dr. Deborah Monk, retired principal, and Kimberly Bolden, uh, MCPS consulting principal. Mr. Rohner has been employed by MCPS for 19 years as a resource teacher, assistant school administrator, assistant principal, principal intern, and most recently as assistant principal, Thomas S. Wooten High School. He is honored to join the Damascus High School community where he will contribute to provide a dynamic, supportive, and healthy learning environment to ensure all students thrive in accordance with the school's vision. Shout outs to his three children, 
Jackson, Grant, and Alyssa, Dr. Jennifer Webster, and his entire family watching online from New Jersey. <laughs> Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Congratulations. Next would be Mr. Samuel uh, Levine, principal of John T. Baker Middle School. Joining him today is his wife, Allie, and his father, John. Mr. Levine has been employed by MCPS for 14 years as a teacher, physical education resource teacher, assistant school administrator. He was a principal intern and most recently as assistant principal of Dessa Shannon Middle School. Mr. Levine is very excited to join the John T. Baker Middle School and is grateful and honored to serve the school community. Shout outs to his family members who are watching from afar. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations. Okay, so next up is Dr. Sophia Vega Ormina, uh, Principal Gaithersburg Middle School attending. Joining her today is her fiance, Nathan Grant DeWitt, and her mother, Juana Ormino, who was an MCPS employee. So Dr. Uh, Vega Ormino has been employed with MCPS for seven years as a teacher, resource teacher, assistant principal, and most recently as principal intern at uh, Lakelands Park Middle School. She looks forward to cultivating an inclusive environment that fosters student growth and achievement and is committed to collaborating with passionate educators and stakeholders to enact positive change within the Lakelands Park community. Shout outs to her family and friends watching online from Maryland, New Jersey, Connecticut, Canada, and Peru. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Congratulations. Next is Mrs. Jessica Bay Graber, principal, Clear Spring Elementary School attending. Joining her today is her husband, Brian, and son, Ethan. Ms. Graber has been employed with MCPS for 10 years, serving in the role as teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, and most recently as principal intern at Dr. Ronald E. McNair Elementary School. Mrs. Graber is thrilled to be joining the Clear Spring community to serve and support the academic and social emotional growth of all students. She looks forward to harnessing the arts, and other creative outlets to increase classroom engagement and afford students ongoing opportunities to share who they are and what they can do. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations. And last but not least is Cynthia A. Houston, Principal Woodfield Elementary School, and she's attending. Joining her today are her parents, Roseanne and Andy Armis, and her youngest daughter, Annabelle. Mrs. Houston has more than 30 years experience in education as a teacher and administrator. She looks forward to working with the staff, students, and parents of the Woodfield Elementary community, where she will continue to foster a welcoming, caring environment, which promotes a love for learning and academic excellence. Shout outs to her son, Andy, and daughter, Emma, who are watching online. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations. That concludes appointments for today. I'll give some folks time to transition out of the room.
I'd like to take a moment while we transition uh, to introduce the board's new coordinator for communications, that's the Chris, Ms. Christy Scott, if you could wave. Okay, we're moving on to agenda item number four, recognitions. Dr. Felder? Yes, we we have several recognitions uh, today. Uh, the first would be School Nutrition Employee Appreciation Week and School Lunch Hero Day. So whereas uh, School Nutrition Association has announced um, April 29th through May 3rd, 2024 as the annual School Nutrition Employee Appreciation Week and May 3rd, 2024 as School Lunch Hero Day, and whereas the school nutrition program and the service provided by its personnel to students, faculty, and staff are integral to the operations of Montgomery County Public Schools, and whereas the more than 16 million meals that are served to Montgomery County Public School students participating in the National School Lunch and School Breakfast programs are testimony of the valuable contribution made by school food and nutrition service personnel each year, and whereas school food and nutrition service personnel relentlessly have navigated unprecedented food shortages and supply chain disruptions to serve meals in Montgomery County schools to Montgomery County school students, whereas school food and nutrition services personnel deserve to be recognized for their dedication and continuing commitment uh, to feeding and educating students and offering a variety of nutrition services to the community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools do hereby recognize food and nutrition service personnel uh, in honor of School Nutrition Employee Appreciation Week, May, uh, tw April 29th through May 3rd, and School Lunch Hero Day, May 3rd, 2024 in Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, and just to speak on this a little bit, I see uh, Miss Liz Leach in the audience. Can we give her a round of applause, the director of the Division of Food and Nutrition Services, and all of her hardworking staff who help make sure that our students are fed every single day. Just wanted to give that acknowledgement before we move approval. Absolutely. Uh, move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Awesome. All right. So next would be National Volunteer Week. So whereas National Volunteer Week is an opportunity to recognize and thank the volunteers who lead their, lend their time, talent, voice, and support uh, to our students and schools. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to collaborating with parents, guardians, community members, and organization partners who volunteer to expand opportunities for students and families and positively impact our schools and community. And whereas more than 50,000 individual volunteer, individuals volunteer to provide extraordinary acts of service to support our students, these volunteers act as listeners, role models, motivators, tutors, mentors, field trip chaperones, and classroom assistants. They also can, uh, coordinate school events and programs and participate on school system committees, work groups, and advisory groups to improve um, educational experiences, opportunities, and outcomes for all students. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools supports the county executives, Montgomery serves awards through the Montgomery County Volunteer Center. These awards celebrate volunteers who make invaluable contributions to Montgomery County and other initiatives to encourage volunteer service, now therefore be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education join with the interim superintendent of schools in recognizing the week of April 14th through the 20th, 2024, as National Volunteer Week in Montgomery County Public Schools, and be it further resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools honor and celebrate our volunteers for dedicating their time in service to education and the students of Montgomery County Public Schools, and recommend acknowledgement to all of our volunteers. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Next would be a National Student Leadership Week. So whereas National Student Leadership Week serves as an annual recognition of the commitment student leaders make um, 
in, uh, make to affect change in our schools, our communities, and the world. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools recognizes the innovative ways student leaders have worked to build their leadership skills, develop leadership in others, and use these skills to make a positive impact in their communities, and whereas student leaders from across Montgomery County Public Schools serve on principal advisory councils, district committees, and work groups, testify at Board of Education meetings to uh, share the student experience and advocate for the interests of schools and their student peers, and whereas student leadership opportunities continue to grow in Montgomery County Public Schools, from traditional school-based student government associations to a multitude of leadership groups, including the Minority Scholars Program, uh, MoCo Empower Her, MoCo Pride Youth, uh, the Superintendent's Leadership Academy, and a host of school-based leadership programs that further extend uh, leadership development opportunities to students across the district. And whereas, in April 2024, student leadership activities include the election of the student member of the Montgomery County Board of Education, uh, the election of the Montgomery County Regional Student Government Association officers, the Next Generation Leadership Day for incoming grade five students and a high school voter registration drive. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education hereby join the interim superintendent of schools in recognizing the week of April 22nd through the 26th, 2024, as National Student Leadership Week in Montgomery County Public Schools, and be it uh, resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and Interim Superintendent of Schools commend student leaders for their hard work and positive contributions on behalf of Montgomery County Public Schools and urge citizens to recognize student leaders and support their accomplishments as they develop the skills needed for future local, state, and national leaders. Uh, on behalf of all student leaders, I proudly move approval. <laughs> Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, and last would be, but not least, Administrative Professionals Week. And so whereas Administrative Professionals Week will be celebrated nationally the week of April 22nd through the 26th, and whereas the Board of Education wishes to recognize publicly the high level of dedication and ability of its staff of administrative professional employees and express its appreciation for their efforts in the productive, courteous, and efficient operation of Montgomery County Public Schools, and whereas the Board of Education thanks its administrative professional staff for their commitment and contributions that positively impact teaching, learning, and the overall academic experiences of our students on a daily basis, now therefore be it resolved that Administrative Professionals Week be observed by the school system during the week of April 22nd through the 26th, 2024, and be it further resolved that Wednesday, April 24th, 2024 be designated as Administrative Professionals Day in Montgomery County Public Schools. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay. Uh, moving on to public comments. Public comments is one of the opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 11 people who have signed up to provide in-person testimony. 
Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have one person signed up to provide video testimony. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs on our website where they are posted with other materials for this meeting. Okay, let's call up our first three speakers to come to the table, Anya Kleiman, Luca Sarovich, and Christine Handy. You may begin. Put the Remember? button, put the, it didn't turn on. Button? Yeah. Members of the board and Dr. Felder, my name is Anya Kleinman and I am a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. Last year, I testified before the board about anti-Semitism and the need for more Holocaust education. When I testified, Richard Montgomery High School was one of the few schools in the county that had not yet faced an anti-Semitic attack. However, in the past few weeks, multiple swastikas have been found in our school bathrooms and stairwells. And as the great granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, this was heartbreaking. And while I'm thankful that my administration has taken steps to address the swastikas, lessons about the meaning of the symbol and the severity of the Holocaust were only facilitated after the attack. MCR, excuse me, MCPS response mechanisms when it comes to anti-Semitism are reactive instead of proactive. Students from across the county have varying levels of Holocaust education, and if they do have Holocaust education, this education doesn't elicit an emotional understanding that communicates the sheer and egregious inhumanity of the Holocaust. The Jewish community has been fighting for more Holocaust education for years. I work closely with the Montgomery County Jewish Educators Alliance, and we have developed and shared page-long reports outlining potential solutions when it comes to lacking Holocaust education, but I am tired of fighting. There needs to be change, and that is evident when swastikas are popping up as early as middle school. I learned about the lynchings of the Reconstruction in seventh grade. I was taught about the civil rights movement in elementary school, but I didn't hear about the Holocaust in school until just last week. That's simply not enough to address the growing anti-Semitism in our county. There need to be graphic and communicative Holocaust cost documentaries that are shown to students in the county so that they understand the deep severity of the Jewish genocide, why a swastika isn't just a symbol, why it has meaning and resonates, and why it pertains to the death and killing of millions of Jews. Books about the Holocaust shouldn't be recommended. They need to be mandated. We need to see these changes to ensure that the Jewish students of our county feel safe in their schools. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. You may begin. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Lucas Sarachevich, and I'm a sophomore here in MCPS, as well as the school-wide treasurer for my school, BCC's SGA. I'm here to talk to you today about a pressing issue that students from around the county are facing, the high cost of summer schools. Students take summer school for a variety of reasons, ranging from retaking classes that they failed so they're able to graduate high school, to completing required classes during the summer so they can take more challenging classes during high school. Uh, all of these and more are valid reasons to want to be taking summer school courses, but this summer, a price tag has been put on this education. Currently, one semester of summer school costs $350. That's just for half a credit. For, to get one full credit of a course, you have to pay $700. This is a significant amount of money for thousands of families across the county to pay for something that should be free, an education. While there are tuition waivers available to families that qualify, they are still expensive. Currently, there are two tuition waivers that exist. Families that are eligible for the first level have a familial income of $39,000 to $55,000, and families that are eligible for the second tuition waiver have an income of under $39,000. With, with, with these tuition waivers, families would still be forced to pay $140 and $98, respectively, for half of a credit. And 
uh, when you put this into perspective, for both of these levels, this, is, this amounts to just over half a percent of their familial income per year for something that, again, should be free in education. Getting an education here in MCPS shouldn't come with a price tag. Subsidize summer schools for families across the county who need it. Put a stop to these high prices for summer school, and we can make MCPS the best place it can be. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Earlier this week, I testified before the county council passionately advocating for the full funding of the proposed operating budget. However, I acknowledge the stark reality that the budget presented by the county executive falls short of the mark set forth by you. I understand the formidable challenge that lies ahead of you, the Board of Education, and the superintendent as you navigate the daunting task of making further cuts to an already tight budget. As we contemplate where these cuts may be made, I recognize that approximately 90% of our budget is allocated to personnel. This means when cuts must be made, positions are inevitably on the chopping block. However, I implore you to approach this task with thoughtful consideration for the impact on our dedicated staff members. When positions are slashed, it is not merely a matter of reducing numbers on a spreadsheet. We must recognize the intricate web of responsibilities and tasks that each position entails. Cutting personnel without corresponding reduction in the workload is not a viable solution. We are dealing with human beings, not machines. It is unrealistic to expect that others can absorb the duties of eliminated positions, especially when our staff members are already stretched to their limits. We often look first to central services when making cuts. The word central means paramount, key, or important. Our central service employees provide essential services for our schools, paramount to their success. Thus, we must consider what we can do without. It is a tough task, and I acknowledge that. Thus, as we navigate this budget season together, I urge you to remember the human element at the heart of our educational system. Let us prioritize our students, as well as the well-being of our staff members and the integrity of their work. When considering cuts, let us not only assess positions, but also look what work you can do without and ensure that the necessary adjustments are made to maintain a sustainable and equitable environment for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. If we could have our next three speakers, Jordan Masker, Tamar Pinto, and Valerie Davis. <coughs> you may begin. Hello, my name is Jordan Masker and I am a behavior support teacher at one of the special education schools, Rock Terrace. I want to thank Dr. Felder for coming to our school and listening to our concerns on Monday and Jennifer Martin for giving me time to speak for MCEA and my school community today. Historically, Rock Terrace has been structured and staffed to educate students working towards alternative learning outcomes. We support students from all over the county with some of the most demanding academic and behavioral needs. We are also one of the most restrictive environments in the entire county. This year has been extremely difficult for our school as we were faced with the new challenge of educating sixth grade special education diploma bound students. Our educators were provided with a three day notice of the curriculum and student population change during the pre-service week and received limited support from leadership with the diploma bound curriculum. Our school is not designed or staffed to meet the needs of our diploma bound students. Our students do not have access to content certified teachers, typically developing peers, health classes, reading support classes, and extracurriculars. Our school is now contending with a surge in the frequency and severity of behavior incidents. Incidents including physical aggression towards staff and students, self-injury, running out of the building into the community, and bullying have more than doubled since last year. Our workers' compensation claims have increased by more than 60%. As of Friday, April 5th, we have documented 1,231 significant behavior incidents. We have 79 students in our school. We have 36 work workers' compensation claims, and the school year is not even over. Before this year, I had never filed for workers' compensation. This year alone, I have been out on leave three separate times for injuries I sustained supporting students in crisis. 
We love all of our students at Rock Terrace and we need your help. We need resources and training to meet the specific needs of our diploma bound cohort. We need a lower student to staff ratio to maintain the safety of our students and staff and meet legal requirements for students IEPs. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tamar Pinto and I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you today. I come before you today with a heavy heart. I'm um, deeply troubled by the alarming increase of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiments in our country, in our county, and in, in our schools, such as the recent incident at Tilden Middle School, where hurtful anti-Israel graffiti was discovered in the in the bathroom of a school that boasts a large Israeli uh, population. This despicable act, along with others like it, has made the school environment uncomfortable and unsafe for many. It is important to note that calls like from the river to the sea are actually calls to eliminate the existence of the state of Israel, and we need to um, consider the impact on the students that are um, uh, facing it, um, the impact on the Israeli and the whole Jewish community in an um, educational environment that allows for that. We must prioritize education and awareness to combat these worrisome uh, messages. Um, it's crucial to educate our teachers and students about the connection between anti-Israel sentiments and anti-Semitism. While criticism of the state of, the is of Israel or the policies is legitimate, it often crosses the line into in anti-Semitism when it demonizes or delegitimizes the state of Israel, denies its right to exist, or holds all Jews accountable for the actions of the state of the Israeli government. This form of anti-Israel sentiment can easily morph into anti-Semitism and contribute to the hostile environment of Jewish individuals and communities. And this should not be part of our students' educational environment experience. As we approach May, the Jewish American Jew, um, Heritage Month, and the time when we commemorate the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust, it is essential that we remember the most horrific outcome of anti-Semitism in the dark in history and, um, and draw lessons from them. We must educate the future generations about the events and, that led to this dark chapter of history, and never again is now is not just a hashtag. Thank you. Thank you. Here are three facts to focus on whenever school safety and security are discussed. The top three safety issues in our school are assaults and fights, drugs, and lack of communication, not guns. MCPS does not collect, use, and share all of the necessary data to keep our schools safe. And thirdly, safe and safety and security work is not an appropriate place for on-the-job training. Let's talk priorities. Weapon detectors, student code of conduct reminders, and police officers will not reduce assaults, eliminate drugs, or keep us informed. Facts. Let's talk data. If MCPS leaders used comprehensive school and industry data, we could focus on our priorities and stop useless debates. If they use data to address the connection between learning and safety, we could better understand how to help students feel and be safe. A high school student on an eighth grade level being taught on a 10th grade level will disconnect from learning and make other connections. If they accepted that the date data show that having a police in schools will not address our top safety issues, we could stop surveying and debating the issue. When police are in schools, they are ultimately there to reduce crime. That's it. I hope we hear from MCPS today about whether that's happening. As for communication, if MCPS leaders valued safety and security of children and their colleagues over reputation protection, we wouldn't get more safety information from the media than we do from them. Chief Operating Officer Brian Hall has stated, we don't tend to share that data because it could paint the district in a bad light. Hoarding data to protect reputation is the worst possible light for MCPS right now. Lastly, no more on-the-job training, period. So let's hold MCPS accountable to focus on assaults, drugs, fights, and communication, collect, use, and share data, and bring in competent professional experts to do their most basic duty, keeping children safe from harm. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. If we could get our next three speakers to come forward. David Gebler, Ricky Ribeiro, Meseret Chaka. Thank 
You may begin. Thank you for taking the time to receive my testimony. My purpose is to bring awareness to the threat of drug use in our high schools. Today I will speak on my own personal experiences, and I want to make it very clear that these are not exclusive issues to Kennedy High School. This statement of universal substance abuse across all high schools is clearly represented by the annual survey data collected from the MSDE. On that questionnaire, some items are more alarming than others, questions such as, do students use drugs on campus, or at school, is it easy to use drugs without getting caught? Over a three-year span on a 10-point scale, all MCPS high school students indicated an average score of 2.08. Every single year, these were the lowest numbers on safety topics. What that looks like in our schools is daily, rampant, and repeated substance abuse. Half the time I leave my classrooms, the halls reek of marijuana. Usually drug use occurs in our bathrooms, but vaping directly in the hall is becoming popular. And make no mistake, the ever-rising op opioid epidemic is in our buildings. I'm not an expert, but I do know what it means when the odor turns metallic and chemical. In the last three years, I've had two students go to rehab only to relapse within two weeks of their return. Disturbingly, student distributors avoid disciplinary action by weaponizing county and state policy against security. All they have to do is refuse a self-search or leave the building. With the increase of absenteeism and hall walking, we must realize what our students are being exposed to when not in class. Last school year, we had vape detection sensors active in our bathrooms to detect drug use. They were removed over the summer without the knowledge of our new and incoming administration. There are reports of outside students and unknown persons entering MCPS school grounds and buildings to engage in drug trade. In January of this year, a detective with an MCPD referred to my school as an open drug market that was infested with fentanyl. Before I close, I would like to reiterate that the data illustrates that these dangers to our students are not exclusive to a single school. Thank you. We have your testimony. Dear members of the Board of Education, the last time I came before this board in November, I testified about my frustrations with the lack of seriousness with which MCPS has treated safety and security. In a letter I sent to the board last week, I shared the full details of my experience as a member of the safety and security community of practice, which was a failure. Why does this failure matter? Because not taking swift action to restore a genuine sense of safety and security in our schools is deeply corroding the learning experience for our students and particularly so for black and brown students whose schools are overwhelmed by traumatic, scarring, serious incidents that seem tolerated in ways that aren't accepted as normal in schools with greater proportions of white student populations. If the board does not insist on MCPS prioritizing a complete overhaul and reimagining of our safety and security operations and policies, things will not improve. To that end, I would like to see the following. Require MCPS to hire outside experts with resources and expertise so we can build a 21st century evidence-based safety and security model with updated best practices and policies. This was what the community of practice should have accomplished but didn't. That doesn't mean that that work wasn't, wasn't valuable, but it just meant that MCPS lacked the internal capacity and competence to do that. Two, re-examine the role and responsibility of principals with regard to safety and security. By and large, principals are instructional leaders, not safety and security experts. And central office really puts a lot of emphasis on principals making a lot of safety and security decisions when that might not make sense in 2024. We need to relook at that model and look at the reporting structure. Lastly, three, conduct root, root cause analysis to prioritize addressing the two safety and security incidents areas of greatest concern, physical fights and drug distribution at school. Um, the violence is escalating in seriousness and it's terrifying. And whether it's fueled by social media, drug trafficking, shoe and clothing robbery, gang conflicts, romantic spats, or petty insults, it's unacceptable. And we need to do more on that front with urgency. Um, and more closely. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon, MCPS board members. As a mother, I'm deeply troubled by the biased and partial approach MCPS has been taking in its current curriculum. That's a direct assault to our community. The education system should be fair, balanced, and partial. But MCPS is light years away from impartiality on the issues of teaching gender identity within our schools. The current practice of forcing our children to read materials that promote the idea that 
gender is a choice, not a sign at the birth, can never be access acceptable. This approach not only lacks scientific proof, but also fails to acknowledge and respect the diverse beliefs and perspective of our community. If Amy Space must teach about gender spectrum, it should be at least presented in a manner that offers both sides of uh, the argument. Just as topics like evolution are taught with a balanced perspective, the same should apply to discussion around gender identity. I urge, I urge the board members to rectify this situation immediately. It's crucial that MCPS remains a public school system that welcomes everyone without promoting any specific agenda or viewpoint. I implore you to erase this issue now and ensure that our children receive an education that is free from bias and influence. Please fix issue, this issue now, not tomorrow, not next year, but now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We get our two, final two speakers to come forward, Chris Persak and Kirabel Fresenbet. I'm an engaged dad with two girls in MCPS. Let's have a conversation removing your typical responses from the people you disagree with. So let's remove your phobias, your ists, your isms, your bigotry, and your book banning. I'm going to go through the definition of insanity. It's failing, yet continuing to entrust the same people with the same policies expecting a different result. Here we are, in the den of insanity, where failure begins. The four key constituencies that you continue to fail, number one, the students. Over 50% of our kids can't read, write, add, or subtract on grade level. That's pathetic. Number two, the teachers. The Farquhar Middle School debacle, is where my daughter goes to school, is emblematic of the issues at this Board of Education. You can't protect the teachers. You sit here and say that we need trust and accountability. That's an oxymoron in this room. It should be incompetence and clandestine. Number three, you're failing the, ki the parents. Beyond the fact you can't teach our kids, you now have a policy where eight-year-olds can fill out a gender intake form and hide that from their parents. Unbelievable. Let that sit in for a minute. And four, you fail the religious. You allowed Kristen Mink from the Echo Chamber County Council to come in here and, as, and make a comment that our Muslim community members were aligning with the, the thoughts of white supremacists. I watched children who bravely sat in front of you, who sat there and said they were being ostracized for the religious beliefs based on policies that you implemented in 2023. Lynn Harris responded to those kids, it's a shame they're parroting dogma of their parents. And not one freaking person here stood up for those community members. My comments back to the leadership of Montgomery County. Help us understand the groups that you protect and defend versus the groups you allow to be attacked. Now there's an election coming up for three of these seats. There's some incredible board members with different ideas. But if you still feel that you need to vote for any of these incumbents, or anyone affiliated with MCCPTA, or God forbid vote like a sheep and follow the apple ballot from the teachers union, then jump on the merry-go-round of insanity. Because it's gonna continue, continue to fail. And look in the mirror and say out loud that you're anti-student, anti-teacher, anti-parent, anti-religious. Jefferson said, when tyranny becomes law, rebellion becomes duty. I say, welcome to the rebellion. We begin. Good afternoon, board members. As I have been doing for the past few months, I am here to speak to you again today with a sense of urgency and purpose. As a parent deeply invested in the education of my children, while I applaud our, com our commitment or your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I must address the act of impartiality, in exclusion, and bullying being committed against, against our children. It's really frustrating that MCPS, in its pursuit of the noble ideals of diversity and inclusion, appears to be excluding certain viewpoints on gender-related issues. While we embrace diversity, we cannot do so at the expense of impartiality. As a public institution, our schools have the responsibility to remain neutral on matters of lifestyle choices. It's not the school's place to sway the perspective of young minds or endorse specific ways of life. But yet, it is what's happening every day at public schools, school classrooms across our county. 
It's a, it's in a diverse society, it's crucial to respect the various ways of life embraced by different groups. However, it's not the role of, or the, role of the school to dictate or, or affirm what constitutes an identity or what does not. We must tread carefully to avoid crossing the line from education to advocacy. If MSP has continued down this path of accepting everything labeled as an identity without impartiality, it risks abandoning its duty as a public office and become a mere special interest group. Superintendent Fedler, I urge you, as I urged Dr. McKnight, to consider the importance of maintaining neutrality in our educational system. Please ensure our schools remain places of learning and enlightenment, free from influence of any particular political agenda. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our final testimony is a video testimony from Danielle Soccer. Please, Danielle Soccer, please play the video. Hi, I'm Danielle Soccer. I went to MCPS schools from K through 12, as did my three children. Currently, I'm a paraeducator at Northwood High. I'm here to talk about the appalling anti-Semitism within MCPS, and specifically a couple incidents that happened at Northwood. First, in response to the October 7th massacre in Israel, the MSA, Muslim Student Association, organized a walkout in November that included calls for intifada. Intifada means uprising, and mainly in the form of violent terrorism against Jews. You can still hear the calls for intifada on our school Instagram account. Secondly, in March, the MSA hosted Hijab Nova, inviting all students and staff to wear a hijab for a day. In a coincidence too big to be credible, they chose the very name of the Nova Music Festival where 1,200 innocent people were burned, murdered, raped, beheaded, and taken as hostage on October 7th in Israel. Although our principal admits the name Hijab Nova is offensive to Jewish people, he allowed the event to go forward name unchanged. Our social media still has posters from Hijab Nova, as well as pictures of staff participating with a kafia in hand, a symbol of uprising that holds the weight of a modern day swastika. These acts of poison, coupled with the absence of concern, of protectiveness, of championing for Jews, and we have created a toxic atmosphere for our Jewish students. This kind of hate would never be allowed against any other group. Would MCPS tolerate a student-led KKK group, an overtly anti-LGBTQT group? I think we all know the answers to those questions. For years, the Jewish community has asked you to protect our Jewish students as you do all other targeted groups. You can start by taking a few minimal steps, publicly condemn anti-Semitic incidents, punish the perpetrators, mandate anti-Semitic training, and incorporate Jewish culture and history into the K through 12 curriculum. Thank you. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Thursday, April 25th, 2024. Signups for public comment will open on Thursday, April 18th at 6 p.m. In addition to the online signups for public comment, we allow for in-person, same-day signups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis, basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. Okay. I will now turn um, to my colleagues to see if there are any comments or questions. Please turn your light on. Mrs. Evans. Yes, so um, I will say today that each and every person that came to give comments. We appreciate the feedback and what we've heard. Um, I'll go to our students and I won't, I won't touch on everybody because I know my colleagues will have comments and stuff. Um, so to the gentleman, I, I didn't catch your name, that talked about rebelling. We don't want you to do that. So if there's a way that we can have somebody in the audience, staff member, to get with the parent because um, this is what I'm going to say. <clears throat> there has to be a way that we can disagree better, but there also is a way that we all um, can get together to talk about where our interests align. And I just don't want you to feel that hostile um, having your children come into our school system every day. We do want to ensure that all of our parents feel comforted in knowing that when, they're when their children come to our school system, that they're safe and they're learning, and they are. So we can just talk to you, have a conversation. That would be great if we have not done that apologies um, and 
yes. Can you tell me your name? What's your name? Chris Persack. Chris, I'm yes. Me yep. Me and others, but particularly the um, Dr. Moran, yes. Mm -hmm. And then for our student, um, um, we had two students, one come talk about summer school and then the other talk about anti-Semitism. So guess what? We are trying at all costs, um, <clears throat> whenever we can, to ensure that our curriculum allows each of our students to see themselves. Um, Dr. or I don't want to give her a title that she doesn't have, um, Tracy Oliver Gary has been great um, in trying to ensure that our curriculum is infused with the history and culture of our very diverse school system. So I just wanted to state that. And um, I know that every time, and I'll just speak for myself, every time our public comes and gives comments, I'm listening, and then there are times when we comment and say the work that's being done. So what I don't do every single meeting is I don't repeat every single thing that we're doing every single time. But sometimes it just bears remind. It, it just bears for us. It, it, we need to remind people what we're doing, and that this is ongoing work. It's a continuous thing, and we're going to make sure that um, we get it because we do want our kids to be educated at the elementary level, middle school, and high school. That's how we make this world just a little bit more better, right? We all act kind. We understand that we all have various living experiences, and we want to be able to live and work in the same community together and just um, have empathy and understanding. Yep. So I will stop there and, um, and just thank... Um, Ms. Davis, and then Ricky, um, he is a parent at John F. Kennedy High School. I saw your comments in the article of MoCo 360. I saw your email. I've talked to you. And so we hear you. And so we just um, value all of the feedback that we get from all of our parents. So just wanted to state that. Thank you, Ms. That's Harris. That's it for me. <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, Thank you, echoing uh, Ms. Uh, Evans' comments. I did want to thank specifically um, because I think the way that we get better as a school system is we really listen to our customers and the lived experience that they have every day, and that includes our students. And so with Ms. Kleinman's observations around um, the content she's been taught now after uh, 11 years in our school system, I think giving our students, you know, in partnership with our curriculum folks to really take a look at um, what is included in our curriculum, what's missing. We hear from students a lot. We hear, you know, this is redundant, but we never get to this. Um, and so hoping that we can really, you know, bring the wisdom of the students and their experience in the classrooms into our curriculum, because I don't think MCPS is interested in creating an educational experiences that our students don't find valuable, and that doesn't really prepare them for the, from the, the world that they live in and the experiences that they're having. Um, and I, Ms. Masker, um, very much, there you are. Uh, very much appreciated your comment because it really reminded me of some of the special educators we've seen, including, um, for instance, Sarah Fink from Westover Elementary, who uh, came in November with her 20, you know, acknowledging we can't really hire our way out of the special educator crisis in the country, but she had these 20 great common sense ideas, and that's the kind of thinking we need. That's the kind of, you know, no more excuses, no more defensiveness. We really need to think about. We know what we can't do but what can we do to make that experience better? Because I really do think our special educators in those enclosed classrooms have the hardest jobs in the system. And um, we, need to, we need to honor that, and we need to do much, much better. Um, and I did, um, Mr. Gabler and Mr. Ribeiro, I really think that is also the work we need to do. Drug use in our schools is a huge problem. And I'm looking back at the back at, at um, Dr. Kapunin, who is uh, such an asset to the system. This is an area of work that she has been really sort of embracing as we've looked at, you know, we've looked at this from the perspective of the opioid crisis and counterfeit drugs getting in schools and how do we increase awareness and Narcan administration training and that kind of thing. But I don't think we're, we're addressing the issues that you raised. You talked about the day-to-day -day in schools. And we, um, that's work that we just have to do. And I'm, again, looking at Dr. Moran um, for, you know, how we're partnering with the, the people that live it every day um, the administrators in our schools, the security staff in our schools who may or may not have the skills that they need to really address that issue head on. Um, but that's something that I know that we want to do better from a very common sense 
uh, way, not being um, not being harshly judgmental um, or reactive, but really, how do we focus on the prevention side of this? So, um, I just appreciate everything that people have to say today. Mr. Said. Uh, yes. Uh, again, you know, thank you for everyone uh, for testifying. Um, just to be brief here, you know, of course, associate myself with the comments of my board members. I do want to say, you know. Um, to anyone you know who has unique viewpoints on the system, I always implore you to to talk to us directly. I'm I'm very open to hearing all types of viewpoints. Um, you know, my email is public. Um, I, I definitely implore everyone to just have conversations. I think a lot of people, you know, will get a lot of new information. All that that kind of changes perspective. So I, I definitely agree with that. And I just want to quickly acknowledge the the two testimonies about safety and drug use in our schools. 100%. I think those two testimonies hit a lot of issues. Um, you know, right on things that we need to address, things we're going to be talking about today. And I have, you know, a lot of comments and questions later today as well. And I just want to, to, to thank you for coming to the table and especially Ricky as well for being such a passionate advocate on this and not just, you know, saying what's wrong with the system, but offering real constructive solutions to fixing it. That is always what I know I'm looking for is, okay, here's the issue. What can we do to solve it? And, and Ricky has just been fantastic about doing that consistently. So I really, really appreciate um, those comments. And I just wanted to say thank you. And of course, thank you for the, to the students for testifying as well. Ms. Wolf? Uh, I too wanted to thank uh, Mr. Ribeiro for coming in with his comments and for having and suggesting actual solutions that we could consider because it's always helpful when our people who are out there on the ground, boots on the ground, are able to tell us what they're thinking about and what they think might help. Likewise, I'd also want to thank um, everyone that came, particularly our students. I, I really, the anti-Semitism that you're feeling is really a climate issue. We have not done a great job with climate. School safety is, is priority for us, and everybody needs to feel safe in our schools. I don't say that we have the answer. Everybody has to take a part in this answer, because the school itself can't solve the issue. We have to work together with the community to solve it. So your coming in here helps us remember that we need to keep safety and security at the forefront of the discussion, and it is on the agenda for today. I also, for Ms. Masker, every year I have a discussion with, with teachers from the special ed centers. And every year, this kind of story comes forward. We're not going to be able to find enough special educators in order to alleviate the situation. So we appreciate your coming in and reminding us what you need. Definitely, I will try to get by Rock Terrace. And just look at your security situation also, because you know it, it, it breaks my heart that you have been, I don't want to say attacked three times, but essentially you have been attacked three times, so that there's something that we must need to do in that building to assist and, and, and help you with that situation. I know before that other uh, centers have asked for additional security assistance in the building, because some of the students, and you're in a, a kindergarten, I mean a, an elementary level, high school, because you said diploma bound. Yeah, and we do know that some of the students are, are pretty big students, so we may need to look at adding some assistance over there. And it's one of the things that, that um, Mr. Hull can help us take a look at. Likewise, um, for Dr. Handy, we appreciate all the help we can get on the budget. <coughs> You know, we really do. That's all I'm going to say on that issue, because you know what we're working with at this time. So I'm going to let my colleagues uh, take it from here. Thank you. Mr. Vidavan. Thank you. Um, you know, t today it was a very heartfelt testimony um, that really <coughs> left me pondering um, how important it is for community members to share their perspective from all backgrounds because we are one of the most diverse systems in the country. You know, we have over 150 languages that are spoken every day in our school system, right? Um, I'm a product of MCPS, my kids are a product of MCPS, and the beauty of MCPS is that they get to have relationships with folks from all over the world and with different religions. But with that being said, we need to do a better job. <laughs> and uh, 
a, a couple of things. Um, so we hear you. Um, I totally support and echo uh, my colleague's comments, Mrs. Evans that it is important to hear each other's differences, as it is important to hear how we are, you know, alike. To me, um, we are better human beings and we grow better as a human beings when we're able to listen to each other and respect each other's differences and learn from each other. And this is what I think we want to foster with our kids. We want our children, every child in MCPS, to thrive, to be their best they can be. Um, with that being said, we know we have a lot of issues, you know, security issues. I want to thank Ms. Ms. David, Mr. Gabler, Mr. Ribeiro. Uh, and Mr. Ribeiro knows that um, we have had so many issues with, with drug use and fentanyl use, and, and we're still kind of doing catch up. And, and it's not just MCPS's job, but this is, uh, this is an issue that needs to be lifted by a local government, by HHS, by our police department, by the state attorney's office, by so many other partners, right? Because we cannot do this alone. And by the parents, and by the community members, and by our faith community. This is really an issue that needs to be across the broad, you know, and, and all hands on deck. Um, and as someone who actually went to one of those funerals, that young women from Kennedy, and saw the pain of the other students, because you have to remember, the kids are the ones who are suffering. The students are the ones who are carrying the burden with a lot of this pain. You know, we have gone through high school, we're done, right? But the kids who walk through the, through the halls every day, right? They're the ones who are feeling that sense of insecurity, that sense of anti-Semitism, that sense of, you know, uh, of being different, of having a different faith, of, of worshiping different and, and, um, and feeling targeted. And that we need to do a better job at. Um, just because we need it. It's, it's, it's part of the fostering that we do. Um, I would like to see if somebody from NCPS can give us a little bit of an answer to Mrs. Masker from Rock Terrace. Because even though we hear about it, I'm just really bothered mm -hmm. by, by the level um, uh, of, 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 uh, of incidents that Rock Terrace, you know, I mean, one of the things that Red Terrace is known for is for helping every child thrive. But at the same token, we need to ensure that our staff is safe, that they have what they need to ensure that our children can thrive, right? So if anybody can speak to that, I would really appreciate it because it breaks my heart that a teacher like yourself, who is so committed to the children in that building, has to burden that kind of pain. And you're just representing all the teachers in that building. So thank you, because that takes courage to come here and say that. Um, so to all my special ed education teachers, my special per educators, right? You are special people in every sense of the word. So I just want to know what are we doing to foster a better environment? And what are we doing to support um, Rock Terrace that it seems that, it's, that needs a lot of TLC, uh, for lack of better words. May I? Yes, of right. course. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Peggy Pugh uh, to the table. She actually joined me on Monday. Uh, I'm meeting with uh, staff at uh, Rock Terrace, and um, Dr. Pugh is the chief academic officer. Dr. Pugh. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yes, we met um, with the team from Rock Terrace and really heard from a variety of staff uh, people and the data that they shared was compelling. They also had four recommendations for us to go back and consider of things that, that would be very helpful to them. So I appreciate the thoughtful and very calm given the they know their purpose. They're very invested in the students being there, but they need some help. And so we've committed to getting back to them. Um, another meeting with the principal. I needed to meet with my staff to find out what kinds of things that we can do most immediately and long term. And then we'll be meeting next week with the staff to, to uh, respond to their four recommendations. And, and can I just do a follow up to that? Because everybody says, oh, let's just put more security in the building. That is not the answer to a lot of these issues. A lot of them has to do with training and with different kinds of support. So I hope that, you know, we see this issue more of a holistic issue of what is it that, you know, and the best people to tell us that are the folks who are there every single day. Um, and also to involve the parents 
right? Because that's, that's, to me, that is such an important ingredient um, to have the parents involved because um, one of the things I think that we are extremely blessed in Montgomery County is that we do have a very welcoming, inclusive um, system where we want every every kid, every child to thrive. And this is, you know, and and this program is is high school bound, right? Is to actually help some of these kids be able to become as much as independent as they can. So I just hope that we we have that holistic approach. I appreciate that. One of the very things that the t staff talked about was the fact that um, even though positions are allocated, they have been unable to fill them, right? And so subs are not willing to come in. And then when you have fewer people trying to do the work to, to, to um, support the students in the way that they can, sometimes basically it's an all hands on deck and everyone is jumping in. And they may or may not know specifically what that child needs, but they're just trying to help. And so then if you have staff out who are injured or who are ill, it just compounds. So our, you know, our, our first commitment is actually making sure they have the full staff that they've been allocated and that we do it in a way that honors the difficult work that they do each day. So thank you. Ms. Yang. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming in to uh, testify. I think uh, I'm going to be additive uh, instead of repetitive. Um, many things have been mentioned by my colleagues, but there are two things. Um, one about anti-Semitism. Um, we can say that our curriculum include uh, Jewish experience throughout different grades, but we really need to look at, because today we hear students say they never actually got it, right? They all, they don't, it didn't leave an impression on them. Whatever the reason, it talks about execution and consistency of how we deliver curriculum materials. And so we cannot rely on staff member who only have a passion for a topic to be able to deliver that uh, content to the students in, in the classroom. It should, it speaks about training. It speaks about um, our, our sheer commitment of covering um, the content material that reflect the experiences of our students and the content we want the students to get. So, so I, I do think this is a, it's not enough for us just to say, oh, I think we have that in the fifth grade or, or second uh, or, or seventh grade, but it really deliver. Um, that's one thing to look at. Um, uh, we hear multiple um, testimony on safety and security. And I think one of the words that is mentioned in those testimony is reimagine. So we are going to have a conversation today about safety and security. You know what three things I'm going to look for in that presentation? Number one is urgency. Number two is leadership. Number three is courage. So that's what I will be looking for today. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Madrowski. Yep. So I don't think there is anything actually that I can say that would be additive and as opposed to repetitive. But I, so I just want to associate myself with you know all of the comments of my colleagues. Um, years ago, um, we used to utilize this time to list the places that we went and things we did throughout the county and visit school visits and stuff like that. Um, and I just think that this is so much better. I think this is so important that we are able to have the opportunity to hear from our communities, to be able to address some of the issues right then and there. Um, you know, I, I, I'm with you 100% on whatever efforts are made in terms of uh, offering better opportunities for communication um, for folks. Um, and as far as the uh, anti-Semitism stuff goes, um, you know, I have been listening um, to the concerns from our community um, and our schools and for a long time now, and we need to do more. And if it's a matter of the education aspect of it, then I know you're not the <laughs> chief academic officer, but, um, but 
you know, we need to make it more specific, more uh, recognizable. Um, I personally have asked our staff to see if there's a training that could be set up that I could participate in. I believe this stuff starts at the top and goes down. I would hope, um, you know, we could start there. And um, I look forward to seeing what comes of that. Um, but I just, again, want to say, you know, that I very much appreciate the thoughtful um, and poignant testimony that we heard here today. So thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I did wanted to add one more note. Um, and I appreciate what um, Dr. Pugh said about looking at the four suggestions that were coming from the team at Rock Terrace. But I'm just incredibly frustrated because we have been hearing this from our special educators for years. None of this is new. None of this is new. We have been hearing from teacher, from, you know, administrators at schools that have PEP classrooms that they keep adding more students and and when I tell them I don't have staff they're like well we gave you an allocation well yeah it's an allocation not a person and so we got 20 great suggestions common sense suggestions from special educators in November to my knowledge we haven't acted on any of them we got four suggestions from the Rock Terrace team this week I want to see some urgent action directly addressing what the boots on the ground and our most challenged classrooms are telling us they need. We know we can't hire the special educators we need, but we can't keep doing nothing or saying or making excuses. So I really want to see, Ms. Yang said it, I want to see urgency. I want to see urgency around this. I don't want to be sitting here. The next board meeting is the 25th. I don't want to be hearing the same testimony again that about what is happening in the classrooms. And I'm spending time right now with Sarah Fink at, at Westover Elementary School in her contained autism classroom, seeing firsthand exactly what they're talking about. And I think everybody in our central offices who's working on this issue, needs to, they need to be in those classrooms as well. You need to see what these classroom teachers are going through every single day. Sevens. Um, just one more thing. I wanted to, um, I want us to take advantage of Dr. Kapunin, she's here. I, I didn't know if there was something that she heard in the testimony today that she can share light on in terms of what we're doing to support our schools where we're seeing fentanyl, or there's programs that we know that exist that maybe our community is not aware of. Um, are there any instances where our students know they're in need of support and they actually come to the system? I just didn't know if there was anything that you could shed light on or share as a result of what you've heard around um, what the um, ge gentleman said earlier before um, Mr. Ribeiro spoke and gave testimony today. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question and thank you again to our community members who testified and really showed the complexity uh, of um, addressing youth substance use in our community. As Ms. rivera Oven said, this is not something that we could do alone and we're pretty fortunate in Montgomery County as far as having partnerships with the Department of Health um, who have youth uh, substance use prevention experts who have engaged with our youth leaders to uh, hold uh, information and education events. You know, to, to my knowledge, we're the only district who has high school students who are trained as trainers to train other students in Narcan administration. Um, and we, you know, have been invited by other districts across the country to talk about um, some of the infrastructure that we've built with our county in terms of making Narcan available uh, in our schools um, and how we work with our community partners. That said, um, that's only one level of, uh, of uh, how we address this topic in terms of making sure there's enough resources, which there aren't, making sure people know what resources are available, which we have lots of work to do uh, yet, and even the, the resources that are available in our own community and schools. Um, there is much work to do in terms of how we connect families uh, and students to those resources. Um, one important question for 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 us is, you know, as a school system, what is our work within our own school walls? And that um, is different than the work that we engage with uh, with our community partners in as much as community violence, substance use, um, the availability um, to youth and the, the reasons and the situations in which they seek uh, um, 
and make decisions uh, when there are not other places for support uh, and other places for connection, right? If there's no place for them to connect, what do you you look for? So th it's a it's a huge problem, um, and there's a part of that problem that we engage with our community outside our walls because it's the only way that we can we can connect people to to resources and make any impact in our community at large. Uh, and then we need to continue to define as a school system with our community's help. You know what isn't being done every day that our students and teachers are having specific experiences around um, their personal safety, exposure to substance use. I mean, I think we hear loud and clear uh, from our parents and from our students the the environment that they want to be able to teach and learn in. And there's complexity in terms of all the different players and what they uh, have to offer in terms of keeping our schools drug free, in terms of empowering our, our students to, to help uh, find their best lives, empowering their family members to support them, each other, empowering our teachers. Um, so it's a you know, all hands on deck effort. You know, I'm ha happy to have been part of the part where we can engage with our community externally to understand what work needs to be done. But as Mr. Rivera said, there's a lot of work to be done um, inside our walls in terms of keeping our schools safe, um, understanding how we enforce expectations that I think are clearly uh, iterated to us by our community in terms of the type of environment they want. Um, and there's no way that we can you know, do this by the next board meeting, but we can continue uh, to um, listen, work, and define those spaces, those areas, those locus of control uh, that we can that we can work in. And also, like, who are the best partners and the best experts to understand how to do that? But it's going to be a multi-layered uh, strategy. But I did want to acknowledge that there are there's plenty of work um, already going on, and our community has recognized as a whole that there's just not enough treatment resources, that we need more prevention um, resources and um, you know conversations we have been having today about having uh, a standardized way <laughs> to get resources, information, prevention, support to all of our students and families and not have it be kind of piecemeal. Thank you. Um, I apologize if this was covered. I stepped out of the room about the Rock Terrace School. Um, Mr. Hull, um, Please remind me if in contract negotiations we were able to come to an agreement about paying paraprofessionals in these types of schools any additional funding. Because I think that's a big issue, right? We always talked about you can't fill them because these are very difficult jobs and they're getting paid the same amount as they're getting in a kindergarten classroom. Um, so could you just remind us if we made any breakthroughs there? Yeah, and I'm just uh, looking to Ms. Martin behind me here. But to my recollection, um, we did not, uh, we were not able to um, put a differentiation and pay in for those particular um, schools. Um, and here comes That's Ms. Wilds. That's the bulk of our problem there. We keep, I mean, those are really, really hard jobs. Yes. And if we can't pay them a little more, that's going to be an ongoing issue in terms of being fully staffed and having the right trainer. supports that they need to have a safe work environment. Good afternoon, um, board members, <laughs> President Silvestri. Um, I just wanted to add that <clears throat> while we were not able to negotiate additional pay during negotiations last year, there's a current uh, reclassification study going for paraeducators in every job code and classification um, to make some recommendations about how to improve the uh, workload, um, as well as um, I'm, I would assume that they would make recommendations in terms of whether or not a differential is appropriate and to what extent we should be differentiating pay based on the particular paraeducator positions that um, they hold. There was some work done in that area prior to COVID, um, and I, um, as I was told, they were pretty close to making some um, changes. COVID derailed that, um, but the work group that is um, handling the reclassification, reclassification study has that information as well. So um, they are in the process now of doing focus groups with paraeducators to get feedback from them on um, what their job experience is and what their needs are. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Please keep us uh, up to date as those conversations evolve, and uh, let's get some solutions as a result of this uh, study. Mrs. Rivera-Raven. Just, just a quick um, <coughs> uh, statement on this. I have been to classrooms. I have seen the hard work that many paradicators do in classes with kids with autism and, and so on and, and special ed. With all the respect to the system, I don't think we need to ask the paraeducators what they need. They need a raise. As simple as that, I don't think we need really to. It is, if you do a, a regular paraeducator, but a special paraeducator has so many more risks, including physical risks that many of them take on, and they do it because it is a calling. Because that's literally, many of us would not be able to do that job even for all the money in the world. Let's just be real. So we're, you know, so for me, I, I, I don't need to do assessments. I don't need, I think it is a confirmation from the system saying that we recognize the work that you do. We recognize the dignity of your job. And therefore, we are going to compensate you for that kind of work. With all the respect to the system and to Mr. Hall and his team, I think we know the answer. And I know it's monetary, but since COVID, we also know how many challenges our kids have emotionally and so on. And if, if COVID taught us anything is the fact that we were lacking things before COVID. So we know what we were lacking before. We know things have gotten worse emotionally for our children. So for me, it's like very clear. Thank you. Well, no, seeing no other lights, and given that we need to move on with our agenda, uh, I'll take us on to our agenda item number six, consent items. And I will ask my colleagues if there's any consent items that they would like to pull. Ms. Harris. Uh, 6.2 and 6.10. Okay. I see no other, oh, Mrs. Wondrowski? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, go ahead. I was going to move them in the block. Oh. <laughs> um, do you have one to pull? Yes, I do, but I don't know what the number is on this thing. What's the topic? It's the uh, purchase of replacement and additional more vehicles. Do you know what that I would be? I got that one. I already pulled it. Oh, you already pulled it? Okay. Ms. Harris already pulled okay. it. Okay. Yeah. 6.2. Okay. So I will move the rest in block. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. All right. Let's start with 6.2. Uh, and uh, won't anybody, nobody will be surprised. I'm just interested in knowing. Um, so these are not buses. These are regular other vehicle replacements. Um, what we're doing to conform our procurement of vehicles to our sustainability goals uh, to buy clean vehicles. Uh, so I can address the first part of that question. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ms. Harris, the $1.5 million, it's a bridge contract for spending authority for all vehicles other than buses. So we're talking about our pool vehicles, which includes our cargo vans, pickup trucks, our SUVs, um, and the awardee was uh, Chriswell. Um, so just to give you an idea of what this uh, contract is for, in Department of uh, Transportation, we typically replace uh, vehicles every seven to we replace seven to 10 vehicles each year, and their pool of population for the vehicles is about 200. Um, in maintenance, that's the other user of this, these vehicles. They have about 500 uh, vehicles in the pool, so a total of about 700. Um, and those, uh, they replace more often uh, because of the increase. Now, this contract does not specify um, particular, you know, I mentioned four or five different types of vehicles. It doesn't mention uh, uh, limits or amounts of each of the vehicles, nor does it uh, specify amounts um, for different types of vehicles. So when, um, you know, DOT is looking at electric vehicles if they're available. Um, there, there would be cost savings um, for electric vehicles, uh, but part of the issue is the infrastructure, um, you know, uh, addressing that, that issue. But in this particular uh, award, this bridge award, it does not say for uh, it doesn't allocate for a specified number of particular vehicles, if that answers your question. Well, so, but internally, policy-wise, what are we doing to make sure when, when whomever is, is responsible for these procurements that our first choice, if it's available, is going to be a clean vehicle, hybrid, or electric? Yeah, so obviously we have um, a very robust plan for our uh, bus fleet 
and the transition to electric there. Um, there has not been um, uh, a similar type of effort with our white fleet, and so that's something that I've been in conversations with our DOT about and how we can, you know, consolidate purchases, uh, which currently happen uh, within each department across the district um, in a more centralized way so that we have more control over, you know, what is being purchased and we can prioritize, as you said, uh, vehicles that are greener, that be that electric or hybrid or, you know, whatever it might be. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, it's the same. It's the same one. Yes. So I'm just going to do a follow up. If that's okay. So, um, so help me understand a little bit on on how um, it doesn't say how many vehicles we're we're buying for 1.5 million. Can you? Yeah. So we're we're using estimates based on replacement cycle. Um, Yes, vehicles. So, so that so we're looking for spending authority. So, um, chances are we're not going to use that 1.5 million dollars. Uh, what's going to happen is, as uh, departments need these vehicles, they'll put in for purchase orders, and then you know we'll actually make those uh, purchases at that point or lease. You know, it it's, gives us the option to lease these vehicles too through oh, this. Okay, that was part of my confusion. So I thought you already. Okay, so this is literally just a contract of 1.5. And then when you need the vehicle, so it's like an open credit 1.5 with Chris Will that you're going to have? Uh, like a blanket <laughs> purchase <laughs> order. <laughs> okay. And then as you need it, for how long is this contract? Uh, one year. We do this annually every year. And we, we, we revisit, we look at the needs of each of the, the departments mentioned. And, you know, when, when I, I can't compare it to a CPS, but I have a small nonprofit. I usually negotiate the best deal. Do you guys do that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, in this case, this is a bridge contract, so okay. so uh, I think it was Baltimore County Public Schools. They they kind of did that initial negotiation. We look at the scope and what we're looking for in the contract, and if it mirrors that, then we say, hey, they do the work for that, the due diligence there, and then we bridge that contract. And then the maintenance is by them? Uh, maintenance is the same. So they're part of the, this $1.5 million as well, too. As they need vehicles, they're going to go to the awardee of the contract, okay. um, set up purchase orders and then uh okay um, and then start invoicing okay. yeah. thank you and if you don't need all the money in well one year what happens to the extra money yeah so that just dropped so at this point for spending authority you're not going to see that in our in our reports when we talk about our monthly financial reports you're going to see it once it gets converted into a purchase order um, and then purchase orders if they roll to the next year that that becomes an encumbrance but um, that's how that those dollars are reflected if you don't use the whole amount it's not really savings to us because it's really just spending authority anyway. So uh, you can think of it as kind of like a pre-encumbrance, like we're not really encumbering those funds yet. Um, okay. It's it's more of a letting the board know this is our intentions of okay. what we could be spending. Oh, I, I just want, I want a little bit more understanding that too because we have a total budget and you have allocated things in different area. Some are up to a spending um, authority I have seen we authorized half a million for file cabinets or $200,000 for file cabinet, which I doubt because I see a lot of them in our high school buildings empty. Then what, then, but this is the money allocated to certain department. So if we don't spend them, where does this money go? So once it gets to a purchase order, once the, there's a commitment to actually purchase using that spending authority, then if it's not used, it drops to the bottom line. But it would have been in somebody's budget, line item budget, right? This Correct. this exercise here is just giving you all the uh, authority to. So it's not in somebody's Correct. actual line budget. Okay. So Thank you. yeah. So e each, de like I mentioned, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, it, the current state is departments purchase their own vehicles. So if safety needs a vehicle, they buy a vehicle. If maintenance needs a vehicle, they buy a vehicle. So there are various. Um, budget lines within the budget for that. This is just an overall authority that we're asking the board for to say, you know, each year we purchase approximately this number or cost of vehicles and we're asking for an extension for another year so that we can continue to purchase those vehicles. The checks and balances um, within the budget is, you know, each uh, department would have a budget line for said uh, items and they you know, would not go above that. And if they did, they would contact Mr. Riley's office and say, hey, we're going to need to 
uh, you know, go over our budget in this, and this is how we plan to cover it from another category. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the year-end transfers where, you know, because the budgets are obviously estimates. We're building a budget now that we'll be using 12 months and 16 months from now. And so when the actual expenditures happen, then we go back at the end of the year, if necessary, uh, and, and do the categorical transfers. But it really is within the budget lines within each department, and this is just an overall authority that we're asking the board for to purchase the vehicles. And, and if we see that we're going to exceed that, we come back to the board and say, so one, I think it was 6.6. .6. That's an area where we're looking for additional funding. Because of inflation, um, uh, we're, we're looking for more spending authority um, because it was beyond what was originally projected. Just a follow-up quick question. Put your mic on. Sorry. So, sorry. so you said it, it's about seven to eight vehicles per year? Uh, DOT is like seven to ten seven that they'll 10? replace each year. Yeah. That just seems really high, 1.5. I can bet you I can. No, I, but I, I mentioned the DOT, but but <laughs> maintenance also does uh, okay. replacement too, and they're they're going to be higher. I don't so have that. So that's part of this. Okay. It, maintenance is part of that too. Oh. Um, yeah. So I will move uh, 6.2. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. 6.10. Yes. Monthly financial report again. Um, not to sound like a broken record, but looking at our employee benefit trust fund predict projections, and especially now with more concern, what we're hearing from council or from the county executive's office about an uh, unwillingness to uh, make the allocations that we need to shore up that trust fund, um, because we are um, we need to keep our promises to our retirees and our employees. So where where are we at here? Yeah, and I, th I think it's important to note because when the board did their budget, they, you know, they acknowledged that our compensation packages is salary and benefits, and, and benefits is in the, uh, you know, the, the association agreement. So, um, so that's where we're having an issue in the benefits, particularly the health insurance. So, um, as everyone's aware, we went through a, a expenditure restriction. Um, uh, uh, policy in January. Um, so what, what this, what the monthly financial report kind of gives you is a, an idea of where we're at. So on page two, uh, uh, we were up to $18 million um, that, has, that we recruit through savings. Um, and the $5 million that was last year's fund balance, we've already, alloc we've already allocated towards the employee uh, health plan. Um, so as you know, our long-term plan, we, we feel based on expenditures, projected expenditures and usage um, and inflation, uh, we feel we're going to need injection of $40 million over the, over the next three years. So that's why the board has put in $40 million um, for next year for FY25. Um, we're probably going to need the same thing for FY26. And this year, since that additional funding was not in the budget and we had uh, we had projected, based on our healthcare consultants, a 9% increase. We're over 12% increase now. So that's what's hitting us right now. That was the need for that expenditure restriction. So, um, so uh, it, it's not easy, but the, the money we're saving is, um, is going to be helping us make those last payments to make sure we can pay for uh, health insurance for our employees. And I appreciate the way we're focusing on this every month. Um, I found it very telling in the financial report you highlighted the fact that this year alone, we have three separate employees whose health benefits under the, from this trust fund have exceeded a million dollars each. So these health care costs are real. And um, hopefully we don't have many employees with that level of, ser of acuity to their health needs, but that's our reality. So I thank you for this work. We'll keep focusing on it. and. Um, I do think it behooves us, as we're having these conversations with council, that when we're talking about compensation in MCPS land, that is salary and benefits. Mm -hmm. We have to provide those benefits. Mm -hmm. And this, the, the, the conversations that are, we're having right now around the budget put some of that at risk. And I think that's something that we need to really not forget. Mr. Riley, related to that, um, how much have we saved because of the savings plan? Um, so, that's an 18 million amount. Yes, that 18 million amount. Yes, yeah. So we're working towards what amount? 40. Uh, we're working. So, so when we talk about the 40 million dollars, it's a combination of active and retirees. So we still need another um, seven to 10 million million dollars just to get us through this year. How much? Seven to 10 million. Okay. And are you expecting that we'll meet that? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, based on uh, so another. Um, tool that we use when we're looking for savings is we 
close the books early. Um, we've been doing that the last yeah. two or three years, and that's how we kind of funded the issue last year. Um, so there are savings in that, too. Again, not at the uh, um, we don't like to do it where it's uh, uh, hurting critical needs for our students, um, but it not only helps us with savings, it helps us with the accounting process because we have a very short turnaround time between when we have to close the books and we have to present our statements. So. so that's good. Yeah. Um, the other side of that is what we're hearing from teachers that they don't have what they need in the classroom to do their jobs, mm -hmm. that they're pulling together money to buy copy paper, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Hall, you have addressed this, so I think there's a proper route that they're supposed to go through that maybe they're not going through because maybe there's backlog, maybe it's inconvenient, and so they're turning to their own more efficient, effective devices, but could you just shed some light so that we could have a perspective from the school system about why that might be happening? I don't doubt that they are buying materials, but I uh, just wanted to understand how it's supposed to be happening given the budget uh, circumstances. Yeah, and I, I certainly don't doubt that either, um, but is not what we want to be happening and not the process that we put in place. Um, so uh, when a, a teacher or a staff member needs additional supplies um, that are, you know, um, critical to teaching and learning, uh, instruction, uh, obviously printing supplies, what they would do is fill out the um, expenditure restriction form um, or I guess work with their principal to have their principal fill out the expenditure restriction form. Uh, the principal would then send that in. Uh, the um, uh, expenditure review committee, which is run out of Mr. Riley's office, but encompasses, the committee actually encompasses uh, leaders from all across the school district so that they can speak to specific needs. Um, the vast vast majority of those that have come through have been approved. So, um, you know, it is one additional hoop to jump through, and the reason that we have that in place is because of the very critical financial uh, challenges that Mr. Riley highlighted earlier. But uh, certainly anything that comes through that has to do with teaching, learning, uh, classroom supplies, we're making sure that that is approved, expedited, expedited and um, provided back to the school so that they can move on with their business of teaching and learning. Are you hearing that the process is working well? I mean, yeah, we've had some lesson, we've had some lessons learned because uh, the first time. Uh, whoops. Yeah. Oh, one, one more time. One more, one more time. time. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Um, we've heard that, uh, you know, we could make improvements in the process, not that we ever want to do it again. Uh, but some of the things that we realize is when we were looking at paper, um, some of the schools were requesting like three pallets or a lot of paper. And we said, hey, what are your re uh, requirements for this year to get us through this year? Because there'll be funding in July 1st. Um, and then we determined how much is on a pallet of paper so we can kind of make those approvals based on the unit of uh, measure for some of these things. Um, so, so that's one of the lessons learned. Um, and, and also, we, we, we did do a lot of communication in January before we started this, but there were still folks out. I don't know if you recall, we had two snow days, too. So there was um, issues there with kind of getting the ball rolling. Um, but just uh, while we were talking about the monthly financial report, um, when we talk about the expenditures, we do give an explanation of most of these savings are coming in uh, categories four and five, which category four is textbooks and supplies. We're seeing mainly paper and toner requests. And the, the thing that the committee's doing is, you know, is it for this year? But tech, category five, just to give an idea, that's travel for professional development, furniture and equi equipment replacement, uh, dues, registration, and fees. That's all outlined here. Not that any of the, these items are easy, but I just wanted to share some of the items that are being considered for um, either cut or for um, telling folks to wait till next year. What did you say about toner and paper? Um, paper is the most, uh, in, mo the largest request that we've been seeing, yeah. and toner. Yeah. This is Madrasi. Yeah, just sticking with the uh, monthly financial report, um, I've been hearing concerns from some of our retirees about uh, us differentiating benefits, and you know we all say all the time, you don't do this for the money, you do it because you're passionate about it. But a big part of what we of our payment to the, to our staff is through their benefits as and that having it continue on as retirees. So I was just curious if you could speak to that at all. And um, because the last thing I would ever want with these budget deficits is for us to put the weight of um, our needs on the backs of our employees. Um, and so I, I'm just curious, number one, do they have a seat at the budget table? And number two, if you can explain um, a little bit about 
Um, that's a good question about uh, seat at the budget table. Um, we do, uh, and, and uh, for clarification, when, uh, when we say EBP, Employee Benefit Plan, we are talking about the actives and the retirees. Um, so I did go, I met with the retirees about a month ago just to see what their, uh, you know, because a lot of uh, questions came up about, about with the move to Cigna. So as we mentioned, we, we have actually saved um, 10 or $11 million by doing that move. All of the things we're talking about is after that saving, so it could have been worse, um, in other words. Uh, but we do, the, so we have um, agreements in place with the retirees, and when we talk about the EBP, I, I just did it before, I said it's $40 million combined. Um, we actually have separate, it's two separate trusts and two separate spreadsheets that we record the projections, separate revenues. So it really is two separate trusts, and we look at it differently, and we don't intersperse the revenues or expenses. So it's important that we make that clear. Um, but that, yeah, I, I think it's when I say EBP, but it's partly me because I'm combining the two. Um, but that's. But are so are we differentiating the, the benefits for? Um, they, well, they have a different cost share the, um, than the actives. So that that you know part of the actual plan is you know cost share, and that is different from retirees and actives. Okay, I didn't think that we used to differentiate, but maybe we did. Um, not with the plan necessarily, but just with the cost share. And uh, your question about them having a seat at the table, um, they are part of our uh, JEBC, JEBC meeting, which is where we work with all of the associations and the retiree um, association to talk about benefits and make sure that, uh, you know, their input is being heard and at the table. Uh, they, unlike the uh, active employee associations, they do not negotiate, collectively bargain uh, their benefits, uh, but they have the same plan um, and uh, benefits as, you know, the active employees would. Um, and then I'll also just mention, too, Dr. Felder reminded me that uh, we did recently send out a memo just clarifying around the spending freeze as far as uh, what is included, what are exemptions, and then the process for um, moving that forward. And if I could just add that that communication went to all staff because we wanted to ensure that not only the district's leaders, but all staff uh, are, have further clarity. And if we need to communicate further, we certainly will. Mr. Vedavan? Um, just, just something to take into account when, when, I don't know how you guys allocate funding for print paper because that's actually the number one thing I mean, I have been, uh, people calling me about um, in the up county area. But one thing that I noticed is it's from schools that have either their dual language because they have to print more because they have to do it in, in Spanish and, and English. So, um, so for me, if you can take those factors, because for me it's an equity issue, if you can take those factors into account that you know, if you allocate the same for everybody, well, not everybody's going to use it at the same level if you have to print twice as, as many papers. Um, and I'll give you a quick example. Brown Station, even though these parents, you know, they have emails, they don't, they don't access their email, they get their information on paper. That's how they communicate better. So in order for, for the school to communicate directly with the parents, they do a lot of printing. Mm -hmm. So it's really embarrassing for me to get a call from one of the council members at the city of Gates where to call me and say, why am I buying printing paper for my daughter's classroom, right? So, and explaining, but there is, there is a process. I don't know how long the process takes, but just take into account that there are some schools that not just, you know, they have other languages that they do have to print information in. Yeah, that's a good point. How we address that is, I, I was saying that we kind of limit it to one pallet, uh, but that's not always the case. And sometimes we'll get the principal on the phone while we're meeting with the committee and say, hey, you know, you're looking for two pallets. Is there really a need for that? Um, and that the form that people send it in, sometimes they'll put, hey, we need this before the end of the year. We need two pallets. So, so, um, so there are different situations in different schools. Thanks. Okay. If there's no other question or discussion, we need a motion to move. Six one zero. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Okay. Thank you for that uh, very worthwhile discussion. We will now move on to agenda item number seven, action on board policies, and I pass it to Mrs. Madrowski. Yes, so thank you very much. The policy committee is bringing um, today one policy forward uh, for your full board consideration. Um, we're going to be looking at policy IOD, currently titled Education of English Language Learners. 
This policy lays out the board's vision and expectations for the educational experience of our multilingual learners. And the revision, the revision changes the name of the policy to reflect the assets-based approach to instruction for our multilingual learners. Uh, the policy management committee has, in fact, uh, already reviewed and um, sent it forward to you. So we are now asking after our lovely staff discusses it with everybody, um, us to take tentative action and have it sent out for public comment. And I will turn it over to you all. <laughs> I just want to, um, sorry, I was just going through it and, and I, I just saw emergency multilingual learners and I said, that is a terrible name. I don't like it, but then I read the whole thing. So I just want to make sure that all the stipends through the, the the document are, are okay. And also for you know, and I just learned, just learned the newest, the newest form of saying, you know, from ESOL to EELL. Now I have to learn a new one. So, but uh, thank you. That's all. Good thing you're a quick learner. Exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, Leslie Turner Percival, Legal Director in the Office of General Counsel. With me at the table is Sally Davis, who is a supervisor over policy and regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, also joining us at the table to discuss policy IOD is Mr. Jared Velasquez Guidar. Mm -hmm. Velasquez. Okay. <laughs> uh, who's a supervisor in the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. So the Policy Management Committee, um, as Mrs. Smondrowski said, was briefed on a framework for policy development at its May 2023 meeting, then reviewed the first draft of IOD at its most recent meeting. Today, we seek the board's approval for tentative action to move the policy forward for a public comment period. When Policy IOD, Education of English Learners, was last revised in 2011, state and federal legislation used the term English language learner. The federal government still uses the term English learner. In alignment with the Maryland State Department of Education's Blueprint for Maryland, the Center for Applied Linguistics Report, and current research, this revised policy <coughs> recasts the, the deficit orientation <coughs> of viewing students as only being deficient in English language proficiency to an asset orientation perspective, which means that all of our students are learning to listen, speak, read and write, but these extraordinary children are simultaneously learning to do this in at least two and possibly multiple languages. And emergent multilingual learners vary in their ability to listen, speak, read or write, and these children and youth will gain these skills in various ways and on various timelines. So Mr. Jerry will speak a little bit more about what an asset orientation <coughs> is in practice based on the findings from MCPS specific evaluations and research. Jared. Hola, good afternoon, members of the board, Dr. Felder. My name is Jared Velasquez, and I am the elementary ELD supervisor. Happy to be here. Um, multilingualism is an asset, and promoting an asset-based perspective highlights the strengths of our students. An asset-based approach recognizes diversity, cultural perspectives, and individual traits that contribute to the enriching tapestry, tapestry of strengths within our schools. This is why you'll find references to students as emergent multilingual learners, or EMLs. As a result of this policy revision, this will allow for MCPS to shift the way we speak and in turn support our fastest growing population of students receiving English language development services. Our emergent multilingual learners are our collective responsibility. And so shared among the students, educators, families, and this community. This responsibility, it includes maintaining consistent frequent and meaningful two-way communication to ensure that parents, guardians of our EMLs are well informed about crucial educational information. An example of this is our recent implementation of the messaging platform, Remind. School staff, central office staff, students, and parents 
all have Remind accounts to enable them to send and or receive messages using a preferred mode of communication, such as text messages, email, or phone calls in their preferred language. What this means is that all parents or guardians receive the same messaging. Changing our language is a big shift of shifting the mindset towards the shared responsibility we must all embrace to ensure that a well-rounded, high-quality instructional program for our EMLs, as identified in MCPS's anti-racist audit, Cal's ELD report, and really and truly the research and best practices around our emergent multilingual learners. Language should not, <laughs> it should not serve as a barrier preventing emergent multilingual learners from accessing high quality educational opportunities. Instruction should facilitate students in inquiring English swiftly while also staying on par with their grade level peers in content areas. This includes targeted language support, differentiated instruction, and ongoing analysis to tailor the learning experiences of our EMLs. It also means staff planning and talking about leveraging the strengths and domains of our EMLs to provide them with access and opportunity to the grade level curriculum. MCPS's emergent multilingual learners are a diverse group of students representing many countries and languages. As the board affirmed in policy, ABC Family School Partnerships, all parents, guardians, have dreams for their students and want the best for them. And all parents and guardians have the capacity to support their students' learning with an awareness of the resources and opportunities available to them and their students. Our journey in shifting towards an asset-based approach is informed in part by several points that are in alignment with research and our various audits. All students should be prepared to access rigorous instruction, all. All stakeholders and educators in MCPS must share responsibility for supporting the engagement, learning, and academic success of our EMLs to ensure that they will all become college and career ready, all. And the need for us to disrupt the status quo so that our EMLs can develop the knowledge, the skills, and the competencies needed to be ready for the academic and linguistic demands of the 21st century as global citizens. And so we've already begun professional learning on this research. We've had trainings this past summer and fall, and we continue to develop and guide the system in this work. We have had meetings with our curriculum advisory committee uh, teams. We've received some feedback and informing them of the revisions you're seeing and hearing about today. It's essential to appreciate the multilingualism of our emerging multilingual learners, along with recognizing the linguistic and cultural assets that they contribute to both the classroom and the broader school community. And so we must promote an educational landscape that recognizes and maximizes the potential of linguistic diversity. And this policy does just that. And so I'll turn it over to Sally. Thank you, Mr. Velasquez. I'm gonna give you a high level work through the policy and then if you have further questions, we can come back. Can I just comment on, while I do appreciate that this is an emergency in terms of urgency, I'm, I think there's a typo in the, okay. Just wanted to clarify that should be emergent, not emergency. It so. is. Okay. We Go are ahead. moving quite fast. Okay. <laughs> it happens. So sorry. No, it's totally fine. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> okay. All right. So let us begin. Uh, we are changing the title to uh, Education of Emergent Multilingual <laughs> Learners. Uh, you'll see at uh, page one, as Mr. Velasquez has referenced, the reference to an asset-based framework at line 11. Um, I'm going to just 
show you where it is, but pages two and three are the references to research and our obligations under state and federal law. Um, I will hold, I'll, let me point out a few things. Line 59, that we will hold emergent language learners to the same high expectations of learning established for all students. Line 63, provide opportunities to develop full proficiencies um, in academic and interpersonal English in the domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Uh, line 70, meet or exceed, that is an upgrade from the previous draft, challenging MSDE content and performance standards. Um, if I could take you over to page uh, nine, I'm just going to continue to move through this. Um, page nine and the desired outcomes recognizes the various starting points for our students. And uh, page 228 services offered to emergent multilingual learners will, be, will accommodate the diversity of student backgrounds and levels of English language proficiency. Um, I'm going to move down to 238, and I, I will suggest some wordsmithing we did there to um, not change the meaning at all, but just to make it flow a little better, and um, I will give you the notes on this, but the way we suggest is that language shall not impede emergent multilingual learners from accessing the same quality, high quality education, educational opportunities available to all students in MCPS. I like that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, and then my last point that I'll just bring up is on page 10, among our desired outcomes, uh, line 248, MCPS shall value emergent multilingual learners, multilingualism and literacy in other languages, as well as the linguistic and cultural assets that emergent multilingual learners bring to the classroom and the school community. And with that, we are ready for your discussion. Open up to my colleagues. Oh. Just um, a quick question for you. Uh, changing to the word emergent, that came from what, the blueprint? Or who, who do so we blueprint. take guidance from? Blueprint, it was also a recommendation from the Cal Report as well, and really thinking about how we, they are emerging in language, so they are not only just English language learners, it's about that asset-based approach. Oh, yeah, and no, so, and the research. One. So, yeah. I, I like it, but I like gifted better, you know, like <laughs> multilingual learners. <laughs> but I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you is how would you say emergent in, in Spanish? You were telling I, a family, explaining what this program because, uh, is about. Most of our, most of our students uh, in ESOL are Spanish speaking. So as a former interpreter, mm -hmm. I cannot think of something that is... Um, similar, and I think that's going to be an issue. But if you know it, please share it. So I do speak Spanish, but I'm going to have to get back to you on that because um, <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. I don't have one in what Chinese. I was trying very hard. I'm a native speaker of Chinese language. I cannot come up with a term. Right. Yeah. And it's not a direct, it's not often a direct translation. Right. So we'll have but I, I think it could also be in how we explain it to parents, right? So we could say emergent multilingual learner and the explanation behind it because it's the beauty of looking at you're adding another language to the student to their linguistic repertoire, and so really looking at... Right, which is why gifted is a lot better for me. <laughs> gifted, I can, I can actually, you know, because it is a gift to be... Absolutely. To speak mm -hmm. more than one language or two or three. <laughs> right, gifted, because... And I know some other jurisdictions in California and Arizona and others in New York, they use gifted... Nevada. In Nevada, they use gifted multilingual. So I'm just wondering if we did some research on, on other jurisdictions that use an alternative, because... I just would like to make sure that we, are, we, we translate it into, you know, the different languages that it comes across of what it is. Um, that's why I was asking who came up with it, and, and I don't know if they thought of that when they were coming up with it. So, so it, was, it was, like I said, it was from the blueprint as well as uh, the Cal Report and just research in the, in the so, best practices. Sorry, sorry to, be, to, to, to rain on people's parade. <laughs> but I was breaking my brain right now trying to think 
what would be the closest, and I just can can think of any. I did the same thing. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. Mrs. Evans. So just real quick, I was gonna, in reference to um, Ms. Rivera Evans talking about the word emergent. Ms. Hazel, um, who was the gentleman that came? He's, before we did the Cal report, he came and spoke to us. Jose, what? Medina. Medina, okay. So Jose Medina was very engaging, very alive. He had just done a um, professional development um, session with a good bit of our staff. And he, we were so taken with him that we wish that we had been a part of it. But I remember specifically sitting over there somewhere and he came before the board and talked about how we just wanted to view our kids as an asset. And that was the, that's the first time I heard the word being used long before we even talked about doing the Cal report. Like how long ago was that? Like two, three years? It's before the pandemic. Right. So I just wanted to say Jose Mendina who is on Twitter, if you want to follow him and see all the great work that he does, was the person that... I um, think he might have a word for... <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, he thought emergent is multilingual. <laughs> he thought it was a fabulous word to use. I just, I didn't know if anybody else remembered that. I just thought I would share that little tidbit of information that I retained for whatever reason, but anyway, just sharing. I just wanted to say that I, you know, obviously support and like the asset-based approach. I also like the mention of high expectations. Mm -hmm. These are not poor little language learners, no. Mm -hmm. They are brilliant. They can learn just as much as everyone else, and we have to have high expectations um, in order for them to maximize their learning. So um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? Seeing none. I will, I guess, just read the two resolves since it's coming out of policy. Uh, resolved that the Board of Education take tentative action on committee recommended draft board policy, IOD, education of English language learners, and be it further resolved that committee recommended draft board policy, IOD, education of English language learners be sent out for public comment. All, all, all okay? All in favor? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's unanimous. Thank you so much for your work. We look forward to hearing from the public. Okay, um, we're scheduled to take a recess at this time. Uh, do people want to take a recess? Um, do we have the staff here to move on to the next presentation? I don't think we do. Um, but you've called them, Dr. Felder? Yes, I texted Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take a five-minute bathroom break, and then hopefully the staff will be back uh, by that time, and we can continue. Back at 2.15. Um,
And we're back. Um, we are moving on to our next agenda item, and that is agenda item number nine, uh, the mid-year evidence of learning and on-track graduation presentation. Again, this is an um, extremely important presentation for the board because we get to see how our students are doing as they have transitioned to those critical grades um, and third, sixth, and ninth grade. And so we are looking forward to the presentation. Um, and I move it, pass it on to Dr. Felder. Thank you so much, President Silvestri. And you are absolutely correct. This is a very important topic. So MCPS's evidence of learning framework designed to meet Maryland's high standards examines how well students are prepared for college and careers using various measures from the classroom, district, and external sources. It was developed during the 2016-2017 school year and is a critical part of our overall strategy uh, to monitoring student performance in both literacy and mathematics. This data forms the foundation for important conversations on how to make teaching and learning better and ensure each and every student has the opportunity to succeed. Today, the team will share the mid-year examination of student performance. This data serves as a check-in to see how we are doing at the end of the first semester and provides opportunities for us to continue to support students who need more acceleration as well as those who are not yet meeting expectations. With the evidence of learning framework, principals, teachers, and staff collaborate closely to try new ways of teaching and track every student's progress, whether they need extra help or are reaching their full potential. Right now, I'm going to ask Dr. Keisha Addison. Uh, she is a director of strategic Shared accountability. Shared, what? Okay. Shared accountability. <laughs> and she's very strategic in her work. <laughs> Had to fix that. Uh, to introduce her team and to share the mid-year results. Thank you, Dr. Addison. Thank you, Dr. Felder. Good afternoon, President Silvestre, Vice President Harris, and members of the board and the community. Um, can we go to the next slide? Because I'm going to do the team in the slide. Uh, so to help today, I would like to share who you will hear from in the context of the agenda. So right now, for those first three bullets, as we engage in talking about evidence of learning, that mid-year check-in, or what we tend to call it, evidence of learning transition, you have myself, Keisha Addison, and Dr. Keisha Logan, who is the director of pre-K-12 curriculum. And we will do um, a lot of our tag teaming on the first three bullets. For after that, we will transition to a focus on grade nine on track for graduation. And at that time, at the table, you will hear from Mr. Kerry Demick, principal of Gaithersburg High School, and Ms. Brittany Love Campbell, who is an assistant principal at Gaithersburg High School, Ms. Stephanie Valentine, principal of Springbrook High School, and Dr. Jeannie Dawson and Ms. Nicole Sasek, both directors of school support and well-being. And so again, they will focus on that last portion of our presentation, which are those two bullets on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So as we begin, this slide um, is our reminder of the focus of the evidence of learning framework and the importance with regard to our use of multiple measures. We often share when we get to this presentation about our value of using multiple measures to determine what students know and are able to do. Our evidence of learning framework allows us to answer the questions, are our students learning? Are they learning enough? If not, why not? And what are we going to do about it? So as we prepare for today's presentation, I want to take you through a brief reminder of the focus of the transition reporting. Next slide, please. So each time I come before you, I share this slide and I say that this is your cheat sheet, if you will, around understanding the evidence of learning framework. The bottom section, which you can't see really well, but hopefully on a printout you can see it, um, are the key points or your key talking points, if you will, about the framework. It is our local accountability structure that includes multiple measures, which enables educators to monitor student progress, analyze results, and inform instruction. The use of multiple measures increases opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning in the two content areas we examine, literacy and mathematics. And it is designed to help us in maintaining standards for all students. 
And so, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the focus of today's presentation is transition. And upon reflecting on the use of the word transition, I realized that we're typically talking about the transition grade levels and um, the framing that Dr. Felder shared that this is our mid-year check-in. So a lot of what I'll continue to say is mid-year check-in as a reminder that this is not the end of the story, it's the middle of the story. This is our opportunity to make change. And so where are students performing at the end of the first semester, which provides us that opportunity to continue to support them in ways that they are needed. And so as you look in the middle, that triangle, it shows you each of our levels that we assess primary foundation, kindergarten to grade two, intermediate grades three through five, middle school grades six through eight, and high school grade nine. And what you'll notice under the purple box, which is transition, you'll see our transition grade levels, kindergarten, grade three, grade six, grade nine. And again, as a reminder, transition grade levels were designed to say, are students making a successful transition to the next level? So last school year's grade two students were at the end of that primary foundation. They are now our current grade three students. So are they successfully transitioning to grade three is the question that we're asking. And so as we show you the data, we're thinking about those students in kindergarten grade three, six, and nine. The right hand side, classroom, district, and external, Again, our measurement categories. They help us understand the multiple measures. We want students to demonstrate expertise in two of the three of those classroom, district, or external measures, the measurement categories. So a student can demonstrate and meet evidence of learning by meeting a measure in classroom and district, classroom and external, or district and external. Next slide, please. All right, so um, earlier this school year, we launched the Pathway to College Career and Community Readiness, and this is the second time you are seeing this visual layout, which is to show the connections between the pathway and the evidence of learning framework. The first column details the academic milestone measure in the pathway. The second column identifies the measures in the evidence of learning framework that aligns to the way we measure it in the pathway. And the last column includes which grade levels we examine each of the data points, which is a bit broader than what you see at the academic milestone measures point. Next slide, please. One thing we do not frequently share with you and the community is how we refine measures embedded in the framework. As we can sometimes have a changing landscape as it relates to assessments, we have to ensure that the evidence of learning framework remains up to date with how it is examined. Some refinements that occur um, are based on collaborative decisions with our content supervisors. For example, our identified district assessment measure which may lead to needing standard setting, so that means that the expected cut score is changed. Um, additionally, when we engage in a, um, an examination of the relationship between the MAP assessment and the state assessment, that may lead to our expectations being changed for expected cut scores. And so when the state, for example, changed from the park assessment to the MCAP assessment. The state adjusted the scoring on that, and we wanted to make sure that the identified cut scores for MAP align to that. So we do statistical analysis to say, is this score predictive of a student meeting the state expected score? And we ensure that the measures we use, the cut score embedded in the evidence of learning framework aligns so we aren't looking for students to meet a lower score, which does not align to where the state wants students to be. And so the refinements applied this year to the framework were related to the MAP expected cut score and district assessment cut scores. Next slide, please. So before we begin with our typical view of evidence of learning attainment, we thought it best to start with a longitudinal view of data showing where our students were performing at each transition reporting period. And so you heard Dr. Felder indicate that evidence of learning began in the 2016-17 school year. 2017-18 was the first year that we did the mid-year analysis. So this is from that year one of mid-year transition reporting through last school year's transition reporting. For clarity, this is students in kindergarten through grade 12. So all grade levels, not just the transition reporting grade levels. 
And as a reminder, the focus of the evidence of learning framework is students meeting two or more of the measures. So classroom and district, classroom and external, district and external. So the percentages that you see are the percentages of students meeting two or more of those measures. And so this is intended to be an overall snapshot of the performance of students because while we come to you sharing performance of students in the transition grades, we always analyze the data for all students because it helps inform schools in terms of their monitoring and whether or not um, what supports need to be provided to students. So I will start with the first row just to walk you through, which is the all students row. You will notice that during the 2017-2018 school year, 83.8% of all students met two or more measures. The following school year, 2018-19, there was a decrease to 76.9% of students meeting two or more measures. Dr. Addison, can I ask yes. you a clarifying sure. question? So I'm looking at 2017-18 and 2018-19. Mm -hmm. And in 2018-19, every subgroup improved. So why did the overall student group drop significantly? Yeah, let's, uh, let me... <laughs> Yeah, let, let us go back and look at that one because that may be a Cause, typo. Because let's report it right. Yes, 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 yes. So, yeah, the all students. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't. You are correct. So let us go back and look at that just to verify. Maybe and, it's a typo. Um, we'll maybe determine. the seven should be an eight. I don't know. Yeah. But there's something maybe. wrong there. So thank you for that. We did not catch that. So we will definitely look into that. Um, so we'll skip 2018-19 and hop to um, in the red box because that's where I was heading in terms of. So the red box. That is the height of the pandemic. Um, students were in the remote year, and one thing you will, remote learning year, and you will notice the um, drastic decrease in the percentages of students meeting two or more measures, upwards of almost 20 percentage points for some student groups. Now, the other thing that you will notice, though, as you look beyond the red box, is that we're moving in the right direction. So when we look at our students for 21-22, you'll see for all students an increase from 59.0% to 62.3%, and then for last school year um, from 62.3% to 64.7%. Now, I would be remiss if I did not highlight what you see on the screen in terms of differences and percentages across racial ethnic student groups meeting two or more measures. The all students line is in the blue in the middle of the graph. So that middle blue that you see represents all students. Above that line are students um, in the Asian, white, and all other student groups category. And the all other student groups category includes students who identify as two or more races, American Indian or Alaskan Native, and Native American or Pacific Islander. And then the two lines below the blue all students line are black or African-American students, which is green, and Hispanic Latino students, which is purple. Now, one thing we know, and this is why we present our data in the way that we present it, is that aggregate data can mask differences, right? And so we're looking at aggregate of kindergarten through grade 12, and now we will transition to our typical view where we're looking at specific grade levels for our transition grade levels. Next slide, please. Continuing with our focus on literacy, we are starting with our comparison of our mid-year view for 2022-23 and this year, 23-24. This slide includes per performance at the transition grade levels for students in grades three, six, and nine. You will notice on the left side the results for all students. As you look at grade three, you will see that for 2022-2023, 52.6% of grade three students met two or more measures. For this year, grade three, 54.8% met two or more measures, a 2.2 percentage point increase. For grade six, which is below grade three, you'll see that in 2022-23, 66.5% met two or more measures. Bless you. And for 23-24, um, 73.9% met two or more measures, which is a 7.4 percentage point increase. And for grade nine, you will see a close to eight percentage point decrease in comparing the two years, with fewer students meeting two or more measures during the, our mid-year check from um, in 23-24.
the right side of the slide shows the performance of students receiving free and reduced price meal system services or farms services, special education services, and English language <coughs> development services, um, which you'll see is indicated as our EML, which is Emergent Multilingual Learners, which you all just talked about, as well as our recently exited Emergent Multilingual Learners. And you will notice a similar pattern of increases in the percentage of students meeting two or more measures for grades three and six, and a decrease for students in grade nine. Next slide, please. Remaining with the focus on literacy, this slide details the percentages of students meeting each of the measurement categories, that is classroom, district, and external, and the overall um, meeting evidence of learning, which is two or more measures, which is in the purple box. And the purple box is where I will focus um, my talking points as we go through the slide. So the focus is going to be the percentages of students meeting two or more measures across the different grade levels. The percentage of students meeting two or more measures for grade levels range from 54.8% for students in grade three to 73.9% for students in grade six. And again, on the right-hand side, there's a focus on our students receiving services, and the percentages range from 29.6% for students receiving special education services in grade three to 58.6% for students receiving free and reduced price meal system services. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see the mid-year performance for students in kindergarten across the measurement categories of classroom, district, and external. Each section here represents the different racial ethnic student groups overlaid with the receipt of farms services. Again, I will focus on what is in the purple box. The first five columns um, represent students not receiving farms services, and the remaining five columns include data for students in the respective racial ethnic groups receiving farms services. You will notice higher percentages of kindergarten students meeting two or more measures when you compare them to their racial ethnic peers. For example, for Asian students not receiving farm services, 81.1% of students met two or more measures compared to 59.8% of Asian students receiving farm services. Also, 70.2% of black or African American students not receiving farm services met two or more measures compared to 58.2% of black or African American students receiving farm services. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question? Do we think that there would be a correlation? Like, so I'm, I'm looking at the district numbers. Do we think that there would be a correlation between the schools that have like the math coaches? Do we? Do, you, you think there would be a difference? So, I, I think that's an opportunity for us to explore. Um, typically, when we do our analysis for um, things like math coaches. I know my team, who's working on program evaluation, tend to ensure that we bring in evidence of learning attainment as part of it. So that's something we could definitely ensure that, because math coaches is one of our program evaluations for this year. So we can definitely ensure that we do an examination and what that looks like for those who do have it and those who do not. Dr. Felder, did you have your letter? No, I did. Okay. Let's go on. Uh, we're on literacy, so shifting to our mid-year check-in for students in grade three in literacy, you will notice a similar pattern as that for kindergarten, and that there are higher percentages of students not receiving farms services meeting two or more measures compared to those receiving farms services. For grade three, for example, percentages of students meeting two or more um, measures range from 26% for Hispanic Latino students receiving farm services to 81% for, for those, I apologize, I got confused, to 81% for those in all other student, 81.1% for students in the all other student groups section not receiving farm services. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question? I just want yes. to understand something. Maybe I'm missing it. Go back to slide 10 for me. See on number 10 in the classroom, you're in yellow on the top. Yes. But the district is in red. Yes. What is that telling us? So, and, and this is not a new question you've asked us, right? We, we have this conversation every time we I come know, forward. What is it telling and us? one of the things that, first I will start with what we would want to see, and then mm -hmm. I'll share, and then I'll turn it to Dr. Logan to also share. Um, when we think about the three measurement categories, 
ideally across each of those groups, classroom, district, and external, we would want to see percentages that look similar, right? Mm -hmm. If we see 50% of students meeting the mm -hmm. classroom measure, we want to see similarly at least 50% meeting the district measure and at least 50% meeting the external measure because we're measuring the similar content area in different ways, and that's kind of our validation check to see like, oh yes, the student or the students are grasping the content in this area. Um, one of the things we frequently see, however, are our students are not yet meeting our expectations on the district assessment. And um, I will shift to Dr. Logan to kind of share more. Before, on. before you do though, go to slide 11. Mm -hmm. And slide 11, you have a similar profile. Mm -hmm. I wondered if I was seeing grade inflation in the classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of what I'm going to talk about when I talk about some of the context be behind some of the data. The questions that we ask when we see some of these differences, because as Dr. Addison shared, we're looking for some consistency between classroom, district, and, and external. Certainly with classroom um, data, we know that teachers are able to, to do reassessments. And, and students, we're, we're looking to see through um, reteaching and reassessment, we're, we're helping students to be able to attain mastery of standards over a period of time with instruction in the classroom, whereas with a district assessment is one point in time, um, and as well as with the external assessment. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. When it comes with district assessments, which are aligned to our curriculum, um, questions that we ask ourselves and that we really are studying is around pacing of the curriculum, because a, a teacher's pacing in the classroom really has a lot to do with whether students are prepared to take that district assessment at the time that the district assessment is given. Um, if students aren't prepared, then they're obviously not going to perform as well on that assessment when it is time in that testing window. So those are some questions we think about with pacing, as well as implementation of the curriculum. Um, we think about um, resources and supports around curriculum study to ensure that teachers have the support that they need to be studying the curriculum and implementing the curriculum as, as, as designed. Okay, I'm going to wait because it looks like grade inflation to me. It's, I'm looking at grade 9, too, seeing the same kind of number pattern. Um, so you're saying that grades are always going to be high because teachers have the opportunity to reteach and get the kids to understand what they missed the first time they took the test, for example. As well as grades are representative of instruction over time, whereas the assessments are one point in time. So it's, yeah. You just have to understand. But, yeah, but I, it's still, I mean, okay, so so in, in slide 10, because uh, my colleague, uh, Bob and I, we were kind of looking at this. So in, in, in slide 10, like for Latinos, you have 52% um, in the classroom and 27% in the district, right? And then when you go, and these are not, they're not, these are not the English learners. These, these are kids who are, who are in farms, right? And then when you look at third grade, they're performing worse than they were performing in kindergarten, but yet in the classroom, they're performing better. It just makes no sense to me. So I agree with, um, and I think it is important to reiterate what Dr. Logan shared in terms of when the classroom grade is determined using many different assessments, um, what's happening in the classroom, it's more of a, um, a compilation of everything that has happened in that class through the marking period. Whereas when we think about our state assessment, for example, right, students are taking an MCAP right now, my 10th grader is today. And so that's one point in time. And there is not an opportunity for a student to retake the MCAP if they do not perform at the level that we would want. So, however, it is still a good measure in terms of checking for their understanding in the content area. But it is important to remember the classroom grade provides more opportunities and more information for a teacher to assess whether a student is earning a C or higher, for example. 
Um, and Mr. Fair, up to your point, an another thing that I do know as a student in the classroom, when you're learning in the classroom, you're taking tests unit by unit, right? So you learn that unit, you take the test, you're really fresh on it, then you learn the next one and the next one. What I notice a lot of the time is the district tests will then have you do all of them, like you said, at one point in time. So students will tend to forget what they learned earlier. But when they're doing grades, it's grade by grade by grade. So they can get a B and then an A and then a B. But then when they're like, okay, tell me now everything you've learned at w in one day, and students aren't you know prepared for it that causes a big gap and I know that happened to me a lot as a student because I'm like okay I, I'm studying for this test I have next week I memorize that and then there's a new topic so I'm like okay now I'm gonna study for that test and then I tend to forget the older ones so the district test now I'm not saying that's a hundred percent of what that gap is but I know that's another thing I've experienced I know students experience that's just a part of the structure of the school system as a whole now I, I, I'm not saying that there may there may be great inflation I, I don't deny that either but that's another way that I know you guys probably know as well is an explanation for this and I think the district test that standardized testing does have gaps that are not addressed like they are in the classroom no no I I, I totally get that yeah for having to have kids and <laughs> but my point is in kindergarten they're doing so much better by third grade it should be getting better not worse and the difference between the classroom and the district at least for Latinos is like over 50 percent yeah so I, I know it's not all accounted for, but what I can say when when you get older, the material gets so much harder, and it's a lot more to remember and understand. Uh, I, I, I hear you. I hear you, Sammy. That makes that makes a lot of sense to me in math. That builds where the skills build. It makes less sense to me in my mind in literacy. That's a good point. That's you know? I was thinking about math. And that's what disturbs me. Yeah. Is this is the literacy category? Yeah, I was thinking about math and math. math. Exactly. No, I understand it in math a little bit more. Shall yeah. we go through the slides and ask more questions at the end? All right, can we go to, I believe we left off at grade six, so if we could go to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, grade six, again, focusing on the purple box, which is the percent of students meeting two or more measures. Um, and again, you'll see that the percentages range from 54.4% for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms services to 93.2% for Asian students not receiving farms services. Now, I do want to just make um, one point based on the discussion we just had in terms of how you're looking at the grade level information. Keep in mind, we're not looking at the same students who have progressed from kindergarten, three, six, grade three, six, and nine. These are individual groups of students. So I hear your point in terms of there will be an expectation for students in grade three to be doing better, but keep in mind that the, the kindergarten data is not the same, they aren't the same students that are currently in the grade three. We do, but this is not a longitudinal view of the same group of students across the, this school year. We, it, would, it wouldn't look like this if we did it that way. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, this is the last slide for literacy, which is grade nine, um, in terms of this data view. And percentages of students meeting two or more measures range from 46.1% for our Hispanic Latino students receiving farms services to 91.7% of Asian students not receiving farms services. I will now turn it to Dr. Logan, who will share insights and reflections based on these data and the work occurring in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs. Yes, we've already gotten to some, some great discussion around some of the, the insights and some of the questions that um, we ask ourselves within the Department of Pre-K-12 Curriculum and really within Central Services and that I know our schools are engaging in these discussions as well. I was going to, just before I get into my talking points, talk about the fact that we're looking at different students. I do think that's important. And then the other piece I just wanted to mention about the discussion that we just had was um, about how... The um, benchmark is, 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 current, is always raising. So uh, Ms. rivera Oven, you were mentioning about students coming in in kindergarten, and then you look at the performance in third grade. And just remember that um, that target is always raising, and, and there's so much learning that happens in kindergarten. It's constantly um, 
students are always being held to a higher standard as, as they get older and older. Um, the other piece to just think about as you look at and contextualize this data is with grades, and I don't want to discount the comment about grade inflation. I think that's something that we, you know, we always look into as well. Um, but the opportunity that teachers have within the classroom, particularly within literacy, to be able to um, create assessments, formative assessments that are meaningful and engagement, engaging for students, performance-based where students are really able to, over time, engage in work, get feedback to demonstrate their learning, makes a difference in the end of what that grade ends up to be. So I think, again, I'm, I'm talking about context behind some of the data that shares some of the context to why the grades may appear to be higher. But it is important that in central office and also in schools, we're asking these questions. Because the goal is to see some consistency between the, the three categories. That is what we, we, we intend to see. Um, so thank you for that great discussion. Um, so again, um, we are here to, to share some, some um, context and some contributing factors, as we've already been discussion, discussing, from the lens of curriculum and instruction. So when we compare. I'm sorry, can we? Yep, we got it. OK. So when we compare these data to the same time last year um, in the Office of Curriculum Instruction, we, we like to, as Dr. Addison shared, we look at transition to transition because we want to see over a year's time, um, again, different students, but just how, how, how are students doing um, with the different measures? We note that literacy attainment for grades three and six has slightly increased from transition to transition. So when looking at grade three in particular, for this year, we saw a decrease of 33% um, proficiency, and that did stand out between with the uh, district data between the classroom and the external. And so we asked ourselves some questions about that. One of the contributing factors that we attribute to that decrease is really looking at um, the need for support with writing instruction, um, a need that we've had to to reinforce through professional learning with our reading specialists just because our current curriculum, um, there are some deficiencies there that we've had to supplement, um, quite frankly, um, and that we have been doing all year long. Our current district assessment um, does assess on writing. We've been hearing from teachers, and we certainly have been seeing in some of our formative data that there's a need from our students to receive more explicit instruction in writing, and we attribute some of the uh, percentage there to that. We've been providing that through professional learning to our reading specialists. We think we're going to be having that additional um, writing instruction in our new curriculum next year, so we're looking forward to that. For our external measures, it's important to note, as Dr. Addison shared, the, the cut scores for MAP are increased based on the linking study with the MCAP assessment. And so um, it, it was more difficult for students to meet that external measure, is, is really what that means for grades three and six this year than it was last year. Um, the threshold was raised in order to align with the MCAP, again, just to provide some additional context behind the data. With that said, we do see a connection in grade six between the increase in the data for the classroom measure and the explicit efforts in our middle schools to elevate literacy across the content areas. And I wanted to elevate that for you today, um, particularly when you think about grade six. We placed a significant focus at both our middle and our high schools around literacy across the content areas. And what that basically means is ensuring that at our secondary schools, and this is particularly important when our sixth graders transition to the middle school, um, that schools have put in place specific reading strategies that our teachers are implementing in the different content areas consistently. These are short reading strategies that are intended to help support students in social studies, in science, as they are grappling with informational text um, that they're going to see over and over again, that their teachers are going to encourage them to use over and over again. And so then it becomes a habit for them to use it. They're going to use it on those assessments independently, and they're going to be using it all day long. And we're seeing improvement with that. Um, it's becoming a part of our, our culture and the language that we speak in our schools. And we do attribute some of the gains we've seen with our sixth graders to some of those habits being formed at the middle school. 
Shifting gears, uh, when considering the decrease in the external measure at grade nine, it's important to be aware that this measure requires students to have a 3.0 marking period um, average for at least one quarter and to be on track for graduation. So we're going to be hearing from our uh, two of our high schools today talking about their efforts in, in, um, in that area. So you'll get to hear some of their strategies for uh, helping students to be on track for graduation. But this points to the impact of factors such as absenteeism, related concerns, elevating the importance of our collaboration with the Office of School Support and Improvement. Literacy is not the only component of that um, measure that we just wanted to, to elevate. And finally, for the grade nine district assessment, that outlying um, red data points, 42.3%, can be attributed largely to incomplete data entry. We wanted to elevate that because we've been doing a lot of work with our, our uh, English language arts leaders. We see this at the math uh, level as well. Just to ensure that teachers are, um, as they give those district assessments, they're ensuring that they are entering all of the data as well into our Performance Matters platform so that the totality of the student data is accounted for in the platform and they're getting all of their credit for the assessment. Um, so students with missing data are calculated um, as not completely meeting the measure. And we have many students who have not had their complete scores entered for the district assessment. That does impact the data that you see. In response to this, again, we're working closely with our leaders um, to rectify this. However, when we look at student performance um, on the district assessment, we do see that scores on the district assessments, looking at grade nine again, that their achievement is at a much higher level than this data point would suggest, as you see here on evidence of learning. On a positive note, grade nine has increased since last school year, 15.4 percentage points, even with what I just described to you as being an area that we're working on improving with some missing data, showing that our, our efforts are, um, are making some headway. Um, and once we are able to continue these efforts, um, we, we do expect that uh, the, the data will continue to improve. I will now turn things over to the board for further discussion and questions. Okay, uh, board members turned their lights on. Uh, could you just explain a little bit about the missing data? How is that possible? Sure, so for, um, there's really a two-step process for, for evidence of learning, and so Dr. Addison, please jump in. Um, but when, uh, for portions of the district assessment, for example, some of it is students can input right on the computer. Some of it, there might be an essay, for example, that teachers have to actually grade and then input the data into Performance Matters. And what we have been seeing is for some of our students, that last step, of inputting that data is missing. And it does impact the, the student's overall score. My question is how, why is that allowed that you don't enter the entire assessment into performance matters? That is what we are working to rectify. That's a great question, Ms. Silvestri. Ms. Harris. Uh, yeah, and I'm just looking at uh, slides, because I think we've asked a lot of questions about the earlier data points. She made some, she helped us to understand there. But just looking at slide 14, when you're talking about grade 9, so I'm just trying to rationalize, given everything you've said, missing data points, this is ELA, so English Language Arts, um, so mostly we're talking about students in, in English 9. Um, so we're seeing a decrease in their external measure of 19.2 points, but an increase in their district measure of 15.4 points. So what, how is that, I mean, what do we, what are these two, because um, usually they do least well on the district measure, or mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the typical trend we see. So here in grade nine, you're saying, well, it's going up, even with missing data points. Mm -hmm. So help me out. And what is the district measure for grade nine? 
the, the district measure first, I'm going to call Jackie Lightsey down here to help <laughs> with this one. Um, but there's a combination. It's actually integrated into instruction. So she's going to talk more explicitly about that. But the external measure is on track for graduation. So that was what I was sort of describing as having some other factors uh, outside of literacy. Right, right, right. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so for first semester, we actually have our two district assessments are embedded in instruction. They're both writing tasks, and they are ones that the teachers do with students over time throughout the whole um, several weeks of instruction. So it's the whole writing process. So the reason why we're elevating the data being missing is that you know, teachers will spend a lot of time on this with students. Students work hard on it. They get a grade for it, right? So that extra step of going to performance matters and entering the data, it doesn't really, it's just, it is just an extra step for teachers and it's, it's something that, you know, we would love to be able to streamline. But essentially, when we look at the scores of students on these assessments, they do really well because the structure is there to support them. The first marking period is a narrative writing task. Students do great on that. And the second quarter, um, depending on grade level, is analysis or research um, or argument. And so it's a multi-week writing task. Second semester is when we have our more traditional like timed assessment. And the one that um, Dr. Logan was explaining where part two is writing and teachers have to go in and score that part, that's right now our push because that window is just closing. So we're making sure to say, OK, it's really important to go in there and enter the score for that writing part so that at the end of year, EOL data meeting, we can so, show more uh, data for yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's important for people to understand. So it's not that the kids aren't getting a grade. Right. The students are, the teachers are entering grades. Correct, yes. What we're asking them to do in Performance Matters is another extra step. It's data entry, exactly. Yeah. Which, you know, when we ask our teachers to do another thing, you know, we need to fix our bureaucratic, they, this stuff, the grade needs to talk to, you know, Performance Matters. They shouldn't have to do it twice. Um, but what you're saying is, so the, the students are getting grades on this, and their grades are pretty good. So... It's just we're missing teachers taking that extra bureaucratic step of entering what's already entered right. into performance matters. So we have it to that, that metric in that place as well. We've right. had this system for years and years. So it's not like it's something new that suddenly surprised us. So the, I, it's always been a hassle. As a former teacher, I can tell you. Yes, it, and we, we recognize that. And we also recognize how much teachers have on their plates. And we, yeah. we don't want to have to give them more to do. So we're trying to figure out ways to encourage um, also using the data through Performance Matters so that it has so much more value so that that step just doesn't feel like it's just checking a box and that it's something that actually is used school-wide. And we have a lot of resources to support that. Um, but yes, yeah, students are getting a grade for it, um, absolutely, and understand how they've done on it and tend to do quite well. Thank you. And because we're sharing with this the community, I mean, what's the plan for getting that data inputted so that we can update these charts and give the community the real right. story? Yeah. story. Mm -hmm. Well, the first part of the plan is to, we have to partner with our schools. So we have been um, really <laughs> ensuring that our principals have this information, principals have the data at their fingertips. They are monitoring the data. Our, our English language arts leaders, through the meetings that we have, um, have the data. They're aware of this. So they're not only monitoring um, at the schools, but then on top of this, a third level of monitoring, our teams are monitoring here. And so reminders along the way, um, we, we have committed to ensuring that we're sending reminders during the testing window um, to principals, to leaders, you know, just to get them to check. So when can the board check back in to see what the actual picture is for ninth grade? Uh, during the next, the next assessment window, mm -hmm. we can take a look at that. Which is when? For third quarter? For, well, we just finished yeah, third so quarter. I just, I just want to see that what, what the actual data says once <coughs> all, the in, all the assessments are input, which we weren't able to do for this presentation. So Right, and, and keeping in mind, too, this data is from second quarter. So we just right. finished uh, third quarter, so we right. can share with you um, data from third quarter Ooh. and with the community. So, when, so check in back with you when? How soon? Window just closed. Yeah. In about two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wolf. I, I just have one quick question. Um, I'm trying to recall. Is this our first full year structured literacy for everyone? No, second year. This is our second year. Can, do we, can you tell me or can you send me data about the pilot versus where we are now with the other school? I'm trying to see if structured literacy is doing what we 
hope it would do. So I need those schools that were in the pilot because they were far enough back identified so that I could compare them. Can you send, I'm not asking you to tell me it now. Can you send me that data? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, we can do that. And I, I just wanted to, you know, I, I always have to share in terms of our program evaluation plan for this year. We are doing a second year of evaluation related to structured literacy, mm -hmm. where that is also our opportunity to um, share exactly what you're asking for in terms of are there differences in the schools that were piloting it that very first year versus mm -hmm. those who are just in year two, because the pilot schools would be in year three. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vedavan. Okay, so um, what do you guys then are doing for specific schools who are doing really poorly in third grade? Like, what is the action plan that you have? So, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, school in my district, Daly Elementary, right? Um, for African American kids, twenty nine point two. For Latino kids, fourteen point six. EML 21 and Farms 20. But then you go to Glen Haven and, and Glen Haven for Latino kids is like 10%. So what you know exactly where these pockets are. You know exactly what schools there are. So I guess what is your action to ensure that we're giving some of these schools what they, what they need? And for the ninth graders, um, for collecting the data, I hear I hear my colleague uh, Mrs. Harris. You know what the the burden that already teachers have in doing so many things. So, is there somebody else in the school that can take that on, like the staff development person or somebody else who can? You, know, you can can you you know when exactly those are? So can you bring somebody you know who can actually put that data in? Um, to be able for us to have a full picture. And, and can I can I just tack on another que question? Also, when you look at the data, there are some schools that are doing really well with Black and Hispanic yeah. students. I want to know what you're learning from them that's being s scaled up to other schools because right. there are some that are doing really well. Like Gibbs Elementary for African American kids, they are at 81 percent. For Latinos, they're at 50 percent. And that's in my district. Well, literally, they're two miles apart from Daly Elementary. So you have a two-mile radius where you have a school that is performing at 80% for African-American kids versus one that is performing, like, at 20%. So I'll start with the middle question, and then mm -hmm. I'll have Malika Brown kind of address some of the specific questions about supports to specific schools. Um, about the data entry piece, with the staff development teacher. The staff development teacher and, and teachers in the building or positions, staff members in the building with similar um, positions, they can certainly support structures that principals may put in place in support of data entry. However, when the teacher is responsible for the, they know their students and they're responsible for the, the specific grades on those assessments, they really do need to be the ones to, to input the data. Um, I think that that, is, that gives the most integrity to the, the process and, and to the grade itself. Now, certainly there's room to provide some, some ideas to schools about how we might be able to ease that burden um, through some creative thinking, and that's something that we can do. My other question. So my team, we have their eight specialists, and we, they are each assigned to schools. So each specialist is assigned to, they have 22 schools that they work with. Daily, for example, one of the things that we're doing, and we actually are um, working with the director in OSSWB, we're going out on Monday to do classroom visits because we have these same questions. What's happening in the classroom um, that's causing your data to look the way that it does? And so we are going to spend some time just observing instruction and being able to provide feedback and that continued support to the reading specialist. One of the things, and it kind of addresses the, the structured literacy, um, there are a lot of, lots of things that need to be in place in order for us to really start to see the transformation of the data. Um, and we were able to put really great reading in place in K-2, and so that helps. That's why our kindergarten data looks much better 
better um, because the skills that are being measured, we have a program that directly aligns with it. Um, and explicit instruction is happening. In three to five, remember, we didn't really make any programmatic changes there. Teachers receive professional learning, but that's something that needs to happen in an ongoing way. Um, that one-stop summer, summer training, yes, it's very helpful, but that continued coaching and job embedded training that needs to happen daily in the building um, in support of the reading specialist, that's something that we have to continue to push for um, and to make happen. And so when we see in some schools things are happening and it's going well, like you mentioned with Gibbs um, and what they're doing for their African American students and their Hispanic Latino students, we work we work with those schools as well as to then how do we think about, well, what needs to happen in the schools where it's not working um, right away? Um, and so it's a collective partnership that has to continue to happen. It's continued support and coaching and professional learning that needs to be in place. And we have gaps in teacher knowledge and, and capacity. And so uh, just thinking about, well, what additional support and learning do the teachers at daily need in order to ensure that explicit instruction is happening. And so again, that's the work that we do through the reading specialist. All of our teachers are not in the same place with where their knowledge around effective literacy instruction. And so we are working to get there, but it does take some time. Was that all your questions? Mm. Just sad. Ms. Yang? Yes. Um, I have a few things. One of the uh, first one is a request. Um, when showing us slides like this or data charts like this, I, I would prefer and appreciate having the end number, knowing what's the total number of students. Mm -hmm. Because a larger number may be you know, the variation, then I understand this is a consistent. Maybe in some of these groups, Maybe it's only five kids, right? And that one or two kids might greatly impact the data. So I, in the future, I will appreciate having that end number. Um, now, uh, second thing is um, I have an observation, right? And But I haven't heard our discussion on this. Of all our grades from kindergarten to third to sixth to ninth grade, if you look at the subgroups, and one thing I notice is our farm students, regardless their subgroups, are performing lower than their non-farm counterparts, regardless. So that is demonstrating a need <coughs> of, of our instruction and support. So I would appreciate hearing strategies that we deploy in order to help. They might be in the same school, right? And so they are receiving same instruction and from the same teacher, but they are performing differently. Um, then what, what are we doing and how can we help? Number three, in listening to all these discussion, I would also like to hear the component about I will work with our communities, um, our parent communities, our other warm-hearted communities, that how they can be a partner in this work. Students are with us, um, with us, but it's all our job to help our students. And I really would like to hear some strategies that we have in educating our parents are uh, all working with our parents and understanding our parents um, in whichever way so that that is part of our work and strategy in working with all our students. And lastly, um, another observation. Um, the word great inflation has been mentioned today. I just want to share one observation I have. So a few years more back, in high schools uh, around graduation times, and some schools have the ceremony say, if you get straight A's all four years, you know, kudos to you. At that time, schools have less than 10 or 10 students who are able to do that. But if you go to the same school now, and if the principal make the same announcement, we are applauding a large number 
a much number, a much larger number of students who has the same four quarter or four year straight A's, a much larger percentage. So although I understand there are variations in different cohorts, but this is a strand, it's a trend in every one of our high schools. And I think this is very dangerous because what, what is setting up is an expectation. If I don't get A, I fail. And also, am I going to take intellectual risk, right? Um, or is it creating academic resilience in our students? If I don't do something correct or perfect, I don't try again? Or is this defeating if I, so I, I, I am getting incoherent because I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling that um, data, data have to inform our action. And this comes to the board table like so many, like several times a year, at least twice a year. So if our conversation uh, can cover more about um, our work, we mentioned training, but but really like cover then these these trends we notice how we are going to tackle it. Then I I appreciate it. Thank you. In terms of the grade inflation, I mean we've heard anecdotes, right? We we're parents, we have kids, so we 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 the, the assembly. But what are you doing to make sure that we don't have grade inflation? or to standardize it so that our, that you feel confident that our teachers are doing a good job of giving the grades that are deserved. Could you speak a little bit about that? I don't know if, who the right person is. Sure, I can just share anecdotally. Um, I think one of the things that we've really been trying to emphasize, at least I can just speak for ELA um, and not for any other content area, but. You know, one thing we've been trying to move toward is assessing students on really what they know and can do as opposed to the behaviors of a student. And so I think that previously grades, and still to an extent they do, but they have tended to represent a lot of things besides what a student is able to do in the context of that class. And so we've really been encouraging teachers to stay away from that and to really try to measure, you know, does a student understand this particular standard? Did they do every single assignment tied to that standard? Maybe they didn't, but they've mastered that standard. So how can I reflect that in the grade? And so trying to have those conversations so that the grade really reflects what it's intended to reflect and not you know, other factors that don't really reflect that academic piece. Um, it's a much larger discussion, um, but you know, our interest is really just in ensuring that our grades are a fair reflection of the student's ability and not being used in a punitive way um, and not being used as a reflection of, you know, a behavior concern or anything like that. Do you do any spot checks to make sure that teachers are following your guidance in terms of how to best assign grades? Okay. That's not something necessarily that, that we do. I mean, that's something that certainly is a practice at the school level. Um, and certainly once the schools come down to the table, that might be something they may be able to, to talk a little bit more about. Um, I know that our leaders, our English language arts leaders, for example, um, and our principals may have those expectations for our school-based leaders. Okay, thank you. Um, I know Dr. Floyd spoke about a study that the state is doing in the context of college and career readiness yesterday at the county council uh, meeting. So it is of great interest to the board, as you can see. Uh, Ms. Wolf. Oh, yeah, um, I was just listening to you say that you want the, what the student actually knows to be measured and not their behavior. I'm wondering, wh what are we doing to help those teachers whose students aren't succeeding or aren't there, you know, the numbers just don't look good. What are we doing specifically in those buildings with those teachers? And one, have we even identified those teachers? And, I, and I'm not looking to be punitive at the moment. I'm trying to figure out who needs the support, where the support needs to be. Because, that, you know, when you say you've got 50 percent, less than 50 percent of your kids that can read at grade level, that, that's really abysmal, you know, and 
we have to constantly justify a budget. So we have to be able to raise these scores. And there's no reason why we can't if we're providing the supports that the teachers need. So I'm wondering, what are we doing? Because there are an awful lot of schools, like I said, there are schools on here that are doing well, so that there's something that's going on in that building that's not going on in another building. That's a really great um, question, Ms. Wolf. And I just saw Peter Moran get up. This is where we, and I'm going to ask Mr. Moran to, to come come join. I thought he was coming. He heard the question, and I, it was, I yeah, because it was. It, this is where we partner with with uh, with our colleagues and, and school support and well-being with our principals on on that exact question. It is a partnership because. We really rely on our, our school-based um, colleagues to be able to help support with exactly what you, you've just described. So good afternoon. Uh, great to be here with you. Um, so, um, so one of the, the, the key um, roles of the, of the principal is, is, is creating a um, monitoring structure within their school. Um, we have principals here that are going to, you know, present around some of their practices. So, in terms of teacher grades um, at all three levels, there is practices in place to monitor uh, data entry, grade entry, um, district assessment um, entry, and have a process of following up with teachers when there's variance or um, even at, at with in certain cases, a, a lack of, of entry potentially altogether. So um, those are those are practices that are that are um, standard expectations in in place across all of our schools. But what's the expectation when nothing is improving? What what do you do then for the the teacher or the school or the principal? What's there has to be something. I mean, you you can't keep justifying a budget every year and paying a lot of people, what, 90 percent of our people a salary, and there's no movement. So the, so the first thing I, and, and if, if, I'm, if I may, okay. So the first thing that I would say is um, when you are looking across a department and you are giving an assessment and you see an outlier um, of a, a teacher, um, it is an opportunity for um, one to go in and collect the most important data that uh, isn't reflected in the evidence of learning, which is observational data. And that's a critical part of the work that our offices do together is to go out and look at actually what's happening in classrooms, um, what teaching practices are being put in place, um, instructional strategies, and um, see where there's, there's needs for, for growth, and then providing the resources internally through the school, through the staff development teacher or the reading specialist, or um, externally through the instructional specialist um, in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing, or through um, our um, Office's Chief Academic Officer. Um, so it, you'll, you'll, it's, as, a, as a principal, um, the the responsibility that you, that you have is 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 profound when you see that there are a group of students who, when compared to another group of students across the hall receiving the same content, are performing at the same level. So uh, that's when you're providing the intervention directly to uh, the teacher um, through those resources. But again, I I think that. The other key part is that there's this the standardization that needs to happen across an entire grade level or entire content about best teaching practices in the place that those and um, that happen and, and I and I want to refer to our equitable uh, teaching and learning framework is I can't stress how critical the before teaching piece is the planning that takes place where if um, I'm working with you know Miss Brown and she is making those academic gains right across the hallway, I need to be in space with her to be influenced and understand what instructional strategies you're using. So earlier you were talking about seeing academic achievement growing in some of our schools. The networking that needs to take place principal to principal, teacher to teacher, to understand and even go into that classroom and watch someone like Ms. Brown teach so that I can actually see it, not just hear about it, those conditions need to be created you know, by our offices col uh, collaboratively and then work with our principals to ensure that they're standardized across all schools. Okay, I just have two final questions. 22 schools is a lot of schools. Uh, yeah. That means you're not going to get there very often. 
do you have what you really need to accomplish what we're trying to do? Not that we're going to be able to get you more. I'm just, I just need to know, is that part of the problem, the resource level, to do this job in a system this size? And the second question I have is, I look at the numbers on here for Drew Elementary. They're doing very well. Am I seeing numbers because they have a gifted center in there? Is that what I'm seeing? You know? So their data would their data would be included because they also take the same assessment. Because they're high farms, but they have a gifted center. So I was trying to figure out is I guess what are we comparing apples to apples when we when we, when we look at stuff, you know? So uh, your first question that I'll respond to, the, the resource question, right? So I, I think one of the things that we are really trying to um, improve in terms of you know, resource deployment and support from central office is understanding that we can't have a one-size-fits-all strategy for schools. Uh, we have to really be tiering our supports and looking at those schools. You know, the evidence of learning data is a great you know, source for us to determine how you're going to tier um, interventions and supports from the Office of you know, Curriculum and Instructional Programs, from our office, and you cannot provide the same support to every school, nor should you be. Um, it's very similar if you looked at it as a, as a classroom. You would not provide the same level of intervention to all students, and so we really need to um, become more strategic and more purposeful around the utilization of data for why you're going into a school, when you're going into a school, and also when you start to see gains to begin to pull back on the support so that you can redirect them to other places. And that's a, that's a cycle that has to be implemented throughout the course of an entire school year. Can we turn some lights off so people... So, Drew's data is included because it's all students and even the students that are in the Center for Enriched um, Studies in Drew, they take the same assessment. So their, their numbers are included in that. And just to really quickly add to, so yes, we have each of our specialists, my specialists, they're assigned to 22 schools. Not all 22 schools need the same level of support. Of course, you know, having more is always helpful, um, but we do that. We do, there is some prioritizing. We look at the data, we look at the structures, we look at the capacity of the reading specialist to then make determinations around how much the, the frequency in which they need um, support from our team. And it's always an ongoing partnership, you know, being able to get into the schools, building relationships, you know, um, not everybody's as loving and, and, and welcoming of central office sometimes. And so we do our work around building um, relationships so that we do show and we can show schools that we are here to partner with them in support of student achievement and outcomes. But are you comparing apples and oranges if you compare a Drew, let's say, to, let's say to Cloverly that doesn't have a gifted center? Um, if you take out the students that are in gifted, what do the numbers look like for the black and brown children in those schools? That's what I'm really trying right. to figure out. So I, I do want to um, highlight that when we develop the evidence of learning framework, the intentionality around the measures that are included are meant to be outside of what program our students are in. And having um, district assessments that are examined for students regardless of their program, um, when we think about our students receiving special education services, we ensure that assessments that are appropriate for those students are embedded in the framework. And so I, I don't want us to um, unintentionally think that because a student is in maybe Centers for Enriched Studies that the assessments aren't, are different for them because they are using the same assessments. And it is an apples to apples because we're looking for all grade three students, for example, to demonstrate their knowledge and skill set on what has been identified. Are they getting the grade of a, a C or higher or a B or higher in that content area? Are they mastering and showing proficiency on the district assessment? And then when we look at that map assessment expectation, which is highly um, correlated or the relationship to the state assessment, are they where we want them to be? So we want all our students to meet these expectations. I hear you. It still sounds like if you take out the students mm -hmm. in the gifted center, because they are more advanced. Right. So when you test, you're getting students that are more advanced in literacy. Their experience in literacy has been different from the students, let's mm -hmm. say, I, I'm going to use the term regular education classes. 
if you take out the students who are in the gifted center, what are the percentages for the black and brown students in that school? And I, you can only send me that one school, and then I could tell whether that would be impacting in other schools. Sure. So I just want to do a time check. We still have the math, the math section and the on track for graduation. So just uh, I ask my fellow board members to keep their questions succinct. Yes, Ms. Dr. Feller. Yes, I just wanted to add that I would think at the school that's certainly the work that they're doing, right? So they're looking at their students' data in lots of different ways. Uh, by class, they're looking at them um, based on what program they are in. They're looking at them at, at the individual student level. So at the school, they're certainly looking at the data in that way. Ms. Yang. Yes, so um, I know that every one of our elementary school has a reading specialist. What year did we make that investment to, to have them in all our schools? Two or three years ago? And we, we, had, uh, we had them in most schools. I think we completed the ones that we didn't have, maybe added three more. But we've had reading specialists in every okay. elementary school for and a while. And then uh, in some of our schools also have reading initiative teachers to help to reduce the class size for primary grades, reading instruction. And some of our schools have focused teachers that might do reading instructions. So, so we have various different roles. And I don't mean to put it all on central office, right? Because, because there are school staff that are doing this work. So have we ever looked at, because that is a big investment, like 130 some elementary school all have a position dedicated to reading and might be another half position, a full position, to help reduce the reading instruction class size. So do we ever, ever, or is it on schedule to be evaluated, the effectiveness of these positions? Let's start with reading specialists. That's what <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so we do have, we recently yeah, did the program evaluation Thank on you. the impact of staff, not the staff, but the impact of having that position of reading specialist that was completed from last school year. This school year, our focus, we have our part two, as I mentioned earlier, as it relates to structured literacy, where we bring in to what Mrs. Brown shared in terms of also looking at the supports that they are provided to help um, ensure fidelity of implementation as it relates to structured literacy. Your poor, small, but mighty office. Yes. <laughs> Can you please send that, resend that uh, evaluation to us? I oh, appreciate having that. Thank you. Mrs. Majewski? Yeah, thank you for that, by the way. So that's what we're looking for in terms of returns on our investments and being able to measure what's working and what's not working. Um, you, one of you all mentioned before about some of the data may, may be off the, um, like if teachers don't input the data um, in, at the right time or whatever. And I was just curious, um, are principals given that information? And how much information are principals given in terms of who's not being successful in which classrooms and, and how that's affected. Yes, um, everyone has access to the Performance Matters platform. So um, what we've been doing, um, as I mentioned, in, in our efforts to just elevate this issue, um, as we've been noticing, uh, the impact is just ensuring that, A, our principals um, ha know exactly how to access the data, that they have it on their radar, and that they can be working with the leaders in their buildings. Not only can they be monitoring, but they're checking with those leaders in their buildings. So yes, they have access. Um, they know how to, um, they know where the data are, and they can work with the leaders in their building to access the so data. So I, I really was asking more about, I assumed that they had access mm -hmm. to the data and that they, but how do they know if it's missing data? Like, so if, especially if each teacher's putting in different types of things for, to fall into the one of the three categories, how do they know if they're missing data? So that through the platform, there's a, there's a white box okay. that just shows that it's empty. There's okay. no data there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Evans? I'll be quick, and it may not be this section. I was going to ask the question. Um, Ms. Silvestri and I attended the, the Black Coalition for Excellent, Excellence in Education. They had two parent seminars, as well as we've attended the Black and Brown Coalition with the parents. And there were a lot of parents at 
Kennedy High School on a Saturday morning, like more than what you would expect from mm -hmm. uh, from every level. And so how are we engaging our parents when their students are not on track and the data looks like this? What I heard parents say in the cafeteria that day is they want to know and they want to understand. They don't want to get it. They don't want to see it when they get their report card. Right. They want to be engaged early and often. So I don't know if we say that, that question for later, but how are we engaging our parents to understand what how their students are performing? And... Um, either A, not to be alarmed, or B, do this at home with your student, or just know that we're doing these things in the classroom. So that's my question. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, and that was a, um, I attended the, uh, one of those seminars with, that was at uh, Blair, and that was a, a common theme that, that came up from parents as well. Um, and I think, um, so we talk a lot about dashboards and, and putting things out for our parents. And, and frankly, that, that's not the, the best way to communicate how a student is performing, right? Like, so when you look at data on a dashboard as a parent, um, it's, not, it, it's not giving you like a, a picture of specifically what is it that my, you know, my child's struggling with? What are there some strategies that I can use at home to support? Um, so that is more about standardizing the communication process at the school level. When you sit down through parent-teacher conferences, when you sit down at PTA meetings and unpack that um, data to ensure that um, parents know specifically um, in a Dibbles assessment, what it is specifically that their student is struggling with and why the score looks the way uh, uh, that it does. Um, and I think that's something what we're working to, there are schools that do that really well. Um, there are schools that need work on it. Um, and we're trying to work together to standardize those practices across all 211 schools so that all parents are receiving that information in a way that they can you know, digest it, understand how concerned should I be? Um, what is the teacher, you know, doing in terms of instructional strategies that they're using um, in the in the classroom? And the, I think the key part, and parents always ask this, and we need we need to work on this, is what can I do at home to help my child? Um, and um, so so you know, again, you can create all the dashboards in, in the world, but it's the conversation that takes place at the school level that that's going to make the difference. Thank you. That's really helpful. And um, and, and I did email Ms. Davis because I think I was very impressed at the very end. What she did is she went through a variety of groups talking about what everybody's capacity is, right? And she even explained to the parents, like, the principal's capacity, I mean, you know, we think that they're not doing anything or they're, that they're sitting at their desk only able to respond to our emails, but they're doing all these things. And so here's some things that we could do as parents to kind of help be supportive or maybe understanding as to what's happening. So I just thought that was a really great, towards the end, how she shared that with parents. Because I, I feel like I saw parents in the room having aha moments, but mm -hmm. people want to know. They want to understand, right? And we need them to really understand, too, um, well, I don't, I, what everybody's plate looks like, if that can be explained, so that when... Um, we're not getting back to them as quickly, or um, when there are changes coming up or about, that it is our intention to keep them informed and to share. So I just wanted to add that and just note that we can never leave, and I know we don't, but it has to be stated, the parent piece out so they can have, have a better understanding of their students and what's happening in the classroom. Dr. Felder just commented to me that there's a lot to talk about here and discuss and unpack, and maybe um, we can schedule some follow-up conversations to get to all of our answers. But we do have to finish with the presentation. So if you could take us to uh, the, let's finish the slides and hold our questions till the end. All right, if we could uh, pull up this slide, slide 16. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and so we pick back up um, with mathematics, starting with a similar trend line graph of performance for our transition reporting um, that we saw for literacy. And um, again, I will focus on the all students row. And so for 2017, 2018, you will see um, at that mid-year check-in for that school year, 59.7% of all students, which is kindergarten through grade 12, met two or more measures during our transition reporting period. 
And if when we look again at that red outline section, which is the height of the pandemic, where the majority of the school year was remote learning, you will see decreases in the percentages. And similar to what you saw for literacy, um, you're seeing increases as we are coming out of um, the impact of the height of the pandemic um, in the percentages of students meeting two or more measures. And so at the height of the pandemic, 57.3% of all students and last school year, that mid-year check, we had 60% of all students. And again, though um, there are differences in our percentages of students meeting two or, two or more measures across the racial ethnic groups, and so you'll see that as you look at this slide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is the view you saw for literacy, which shows the percentages of students in grades three, six, and nine, meeting two or more measures in the 2022-2023 school year, and the percentage of students meeting two or more measures this school year, the 2023-2024, again, that mid-year check. And so for each grade level, and looking at the left side of the slide, you will notice slight decreases this year for the percentages of students meeting two or more measures. On the right side, you see the changes between 2023 and 2024 for students receiving services, where there's some slight increases and decreases across each of the groups. Next slide, please. This, this slide for mathematics includes the percentage of students across the identified grade levels meeting two or more measures, and the percentages um, is in, are in the purple box. The right side includes the percentages of students meeting two or more measures for students receiving um, services, that is farm services, special education services, and English language development services. Next slide, please. Focusing still on that overall row in the purple box, in kindergarten, the percentages of students meeting two or more measures in mathematics ranges from 49.6% for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms services to 93.9% of white students um, not receiving farms services. Next slide, please. Here we see the math results for grade three students. Percentages of students meeting two or more measures at this grade level range from 37% for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms services to 90% of Asian students not receiving farms services. 67.1% of Asian students receiving farms services met two or more measures, and 56.8% of Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms services met two or more measures. Next slide, please. Percentages of grade six students meeting two or more measures at this grade level range from 17.6% for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms services to 84% of Asian students not receiving farms services. Next slide, please. For grade nine, 55.8% of white students receiving farms services met two or more measures in math, and 84.9% of white students not receiving farms services met two or more measures. Additionally, 44.8% of black or African American students receiving farm services met two or more measures, and 63.7% of black or African American students not receiving farms services met two or more measures. And I will now turn it back over to Dr. Logan for observations and insights. Thank you so much, Dr. Addison. So for mathematics, um, just again, some context. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the classroom and district measures give us information about how our students are learning the required content of the grade level and works in tandem with the external measure, which helps us to predict how our students will perform on the MCAP. And so that's how we kind of use all of these measures together in mathematics um, to help us know how to provide the best support um, for our teachers, for our leaders in, in the building. The classroom measure can inform the district about how students have transitioned as math students to meet the expectations of the learning environment as established by our teachers, while the district measure indicates how students are mastering specific grade level standards that are addressed during the predetermined window of time, um, again, to help us to ensure how our students are going to do on the MCAP at the end 
of the year. These data also guide our differentiated supports. As for the external measure, it provides the district and schools with diagnostic and predictive information about the MCAP, should again confirm the district assessment performance. So that's just a little bit inside of how we use these data. In comparison to last year, our students' performance has remained consistent for the classroom measure, with the exception of a seven percentage point increase for grade nine students. Additionally, at every transition grade, the percentage of students meeting proficiency for the math district assessment increased most notably at grade six with a 12.6 percentage point increase. We attribute this growth to the consistent efforts of our central service support teams um, to provide ongoing coaching and support to teachers in building their capacity um, to deeply know the math and know the students in front of them as they're providing instruction. And of course, our steady progress forward can also be attributed to our teachers' efforts with curriculum implementation. So I talked before during the literacy discussion about um, just ensuring that the curriculum is being implemented with fidelity by our teachers and how we in central office um, are providing that coaching with curriculum study, with planning to support teachers because where we see some difference with district assessment in particular, which is aligned with those standards, is when teachers get off pace. And in math in particular, we hear that struggle from our teachers about trying, you know, how hard it is to stay on pace when you see um, students struggling, let's say, with a particular concept concept um, in a unit and how do I move on to the next thing when I see that they haven't quite grasped where we are. It comes with that curriculum study and deeply understanding those math standards. If you can understand that curriculum and when that standard in mathematics is going to show up again, whether you need to take the time on that standard to go deeply or whether you can move on because you know it's gonna come back again. That happens in that curriculum study. And that's where that support during planning really helps our teachers. Um, and that's where we believe that we're seeing, we're seeing the growth moving forward um, to help teachers to remain on pace. Lastly, we wanna talk about some of the impact we're seeing with our math coaches at the elementary and middle school levels. So the purpose of the transition data is to prompt us to ask deeper questions. Those questions have led us to see that daily instruction is moving, particularly when we parse out. So we were talking about looking at data in different ways. When we parse out the data to look at how our students are doing for those teams that are receiving support from a math coach, we see that our students that are furthest from the desired proficiency on both Map M and the district assessment on teams who are serviced by an instructional math coach are really uh, demonstrating great gains. And in the short window of time from fall to winter, um, it really is impressive what they've been able to do. And so they're making these gains in schools traditionally that have had usually um, lagging data behind MCPS in overall growth when we compare. It's showing up in the district assessment as well as the two administrations of MAP, and this should lead us to seeing improvement on MAP in the spring. Um, I will now turn things over to the board for discussion. Yes. Oh, and that's the school. Yep. If we could. All right, um, if we can go to the next slide as we transition. And so uh, joining us again at the table are um, Mr. Kerry Dimmick, principal of Gaithersburg High School, Ms. Love Campbell, assistant principal, Ms. Nicole Sasek, uh, director, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jeannie. Dawson, Director um, in Office of School Support and Wellbeing, and Ms. Stephanie Valentine, Principal of Springbrook High School. And so, um, 
as we are transitioning to our focus on grade nine students and monitoring on track for graduation, we know that helping students successfully transition to high school, especially monitoring in the first semester of freshman year is important. When we stay on track for graduation, we are looking for students to obtain the number of credits they need by the end of grade nine to successfully move to grade 10. And research reveals that students on track by um, obtaining requisite credits in grade nine courses are three and one half times more likely to graduate from high school. And so on this slide are four bullets which provides what I think are some of the essential reasons for monitoring grade nine students. Monitoring grade nine students allows for early identification of students who may be at risk of not graduating and allows for early intervention to support students in academic, social, and emotional challenges and help them get back on track. Active and ongoing monitoring can serve to support prevention of students who may drop out of high school. Additionally, this measure aligns with college and career readiness expectations as outlined in the blueprint for Maryland's future. And finally, monitoring grade nine students also helps ensure equity and access and supports reducing opportunity gaps. Finally, um, grade nine on track for graduation is not only one of our academic milestones in the pathway to college career and community readiness, but also, as we mentioned earlier, has been one of the external measures included in our evidence of learning framework for a number of years. Next slide, please. So this slide details results um, for students at the end of the 2022-2023 school year. And again, we are looking to see the extent to which students are on track for graduation and obtaining the requisite credits by the end of ninth grade. And so what you will see on this slide is overall at the end of the 2022-2023 school year, 84.5% um, of all students were on track for graduation. Um, and then when you look across our racial ethnic groups and our service groups, within our racial ethnic groups, you'll see that percentages range from 73.1% for our Hispanic Latino students to 95.6% for our Asian students, and, and also 95.6% for our white students. And when you look at our students receiving services, you'll see the ranges from 65.1% for our emergent multilingual learners or recently exited multi, emergent multilingual learners, and 74.7% .7 for our students receiving farms services. Next slide, please. So this slide um, is our mid-year check-in, I would say, um, for our current grade nine students. And so this slide details the percent of students at the end of marking period two, currently in grade nine, who are on track for graduation. So do they have that mid-year, the number of credits they needed to earn by this time at the um, point? And so what you'll see for all students is at that mid-year, at the end of the second marking period, 88.6% of all students are on track for graduation. Um, and when you look across our racial ethnic groups, you'll see that it ranges from 81% for our Hispanic Latino students to 96.8% for our Asian students and for our students receiving services, ranging from 75.8% for our students receiving special education services to 81.9% for our students receiving farms. And I will now turn it over to Mr. Demick to share the story of what's happening at Gaithersburg High School. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Felder, President Silvestri, and Board of Ed members for having us here today. On behalf of our wonderful Gaithersburg community, um, Thank you for having myself, Ms. Love Campbell, and Ms. Sasek here to, to explain the work that we're doing at Gaithersburg High School. Um, I think the next slide. As you can see here, uh, this slide shows the growth in the Gaithersburg trend data, which you can see resulted in marked increases in not only all of our grade nine students on track for graduation, but most notably increases in our emerging multilingual learners, our Hispanic and Latinx students, our multi-race students, and students qualifying for free and reduced meals. Our success in moving our data has really been a collected effort of all of our instructional leadership team, leveraging three major areas that have resulted in this growth. First and foremost, we've implemented resources and practices from our partnership with Support Ed, which over the past two years has been a foundation of our annual professional learning plan and our school improvement for the three, I'm sorry, three consecutive years. 
Second, we've sustained strategies and practices from our five-year partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools, which has steadily increased the overall number of students enrolling and completing AP courses, as well as enrollment in subsequent AP courses. To support our students in these areas, we've implemented AP resource classes, which provide direct support and leadership to students who are first-time AP test takers. And lastly, our focal area in the implementation of our Freshman Connections classes, which have been implemented to provide rising ninth grade students with intensive academic and social emotional support to help in their transition to high school. Most importantly, at Gaithersburg, I've maintained a shared leadership structure, building the capacity of our assistant principals, which will one day be our future principals, to lead this work in shifting the conditions of our teaching and our learning practices, as well as altering our adult belief systems. To share the amazing work she is leading, I'm gonna turn it over to our awesome assistant principal, Ms. Love Campbell. Good afternoon. Again, I'm Brittany Love Campbell, assistant principal at Gaithersburg High School, and I appreciate the opportunity to just share some of the exciting things that are happening at Gaithersburg. So for context, Gaithersburg High School has the largest number of emerging multilingual learners, the largest population in MCPS of high schools. We have over 700 students, which makes up 10% of all high schools in MCPS. As a partner with Equal Opportunity Schools, which focuses on enrolling and retaining student partic participation in advanced placement courses, we offer an AP course to incoming freshmen and concurrently enroll them in an AP resource support class that is specifically designed to provide them with support and tools around time management, organization, writing, et cetera. We have to ensure that when students are placed in our higher level courses, that they have the supports in place in order to be successful. So it goes beyond just enrolling them, but how are we going to ensure that they are met with success and then that they continue to take AP courses? In order to ensure access for all students, we have also removed teacher recommendations for AP courses, and instead we focus on the student qualities as identified in the EOS survey. We have increased the number of students who have enrolled in our AP classes by 14% from last year to this year. We have also developed our school improvement plan with the focus on meeting the evidence of learning measures in literacy and math while fostering an anti-racist environment. So we are, we're using the same learning cycle as the support ed, which Ms. Sosick will speak to in a few moments. Um, and we've been providing this professional learning to our staff over the past two years, specifically around scaffolding and differentiation. We have built on that this year with intentional planning in the areas of building background knowledge, teaching academic language, developing text-dependent questions, and then all around anti-racist practices focused on the black and brown student experience in the classroom. In addition, we have courses specifically in place for our incoming ninth grade students. For students who are coming in with a history of trauma or social emotional concerns, we have a connections course where students receive support with coping strategies and in learning skills necessary to create a strong academic foundation for their high school career and beyond. Two of these sections are taught by our, one of our teachers who has studied trauma-informed practices and has been successful in helping students to navigate through these experiences experiences. Additionally, all staff in our college career and graduation support department have received training in trauma-informed practices. And as I previously said, Ms. Sosick will speak to this momentarily. We are continuing with the structure from our support ed work to help our teachers in their learning cycle to better improve outcomes for students. We are focused on how to continue to replicate this work across all grade levels as we aim to shift the conditions for our students. And now I'll turn it over to Ms. Sosick to share more about support ed. <coughs> Thank you, Rep. Brittany. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Nicole Sasek. I'm one of the directors in our Office of School Support and Wellbeing. Thank you, Dr. Felder and Board of Ed members for bringing the Gaithersburg team here. They're truly an amazing administrative team, and so I'm proud of the work to be able to support them as well. Um, the support ed partners that we had uh, a few years ago, about three years ago, and we're thankful that we had um, Ms. Nikki Hazel and Ms. Tamara Hewlett that really were welcoming of the design of this unique project. Our support ed partners have been previously working with many of our elementary schools. And three years ago, um, we had come with them, myself and our learning achievement specialists that support the cluster around designing a project specifically for high schools. Um, as Ms. Brittany Love Campbell had shared, the cluster of Gaithersburg does represent 10% of all of our EML students as a district. So moving Gaithersburg as a cluster does move our district data as well. 
So the support ed partners of schools to provide practical professional learning and coaching to shift conditions for the learning experience for students, specifically for um, our EML students as well. Um, so as we developed this project, we were very thoughtful about the specific needs of the, what the data show, showed us were areas for teachers to change their and shift their planning practices. Year one of the goal uh, for the support was to really focus on the administrative team and the instructional leadership team and having the administrative team become credible coaches as well as the teacher leaders. So year one was the capacity of all teacher leaders, the entire instructional leadership team for an entire year that went through professional learning, their classes were observed, they had feedback, they looked at data, and then they cycled back to more professional learning throughout the entire year. Year two, then we scaled it up for professional learning for all staff. So the teacher leaders, um, as well as the administrators, became coaches then of the rest of the teachers in the school as they went through the professional learning cycles as well to be able to build the capacity throughout that. Uh, this became their school improvement plan for their professional learning plan within that component, and they have this year then sustained these structures for that to be able to occur um, this past year to continue to work through that so there's sustainability in those structures um, as well as then they can continue to tier that learning as they have new teachers that come on board and how they're able to then be able to provide supports that are consistent so the classroom learning experience then continues. Um, as a cluster then, uh, this year we have our um, two middle schools, Forest Oak and Gaithersburg, who are um, embracing a similar design structure. And to date then, all schools within the Gaithersburg uh, cluster have experienced the support at partnerships. So they have commonalities within their school improvement plans for goals specific to the emerging multilingual, multilingual learners as well. Um, so that cluster really, um, I know my principals will hear me talk about, I also support the Northwest cluster as well, um, that graduation rates are really a pre-K through 12 responsibility of schools. And so that is really the focus of the work that our, our partnership here and our amazing team at Gaithersburg has really been able to leverage. So at this time, I turn it over to Ms. Stephanie Valentine, who will share a little bit about Springbrook High School. Thank you so much, Nicole. Good afternoon, President Silvestri board members, Dr. Felder, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon about the incredible work that we are doing at Springbrook High School. One of the things um, that I really want to talk about uh, is the trend that we're seeing from the 2022-2023 school year to 2023 to 2024 school year. We're seeing some great trend data um, in terms of our different areas that are shown up on the slides, but the one I really want to call your attention to is the, the dramatic growth um, in terms of EML students. We see a 13.8 um, upward trend for grade nine students on track for graduation. Now, I know that I have borrowed time here, so I'm not going to talk at great length, but I am going to talk about three key points, critical components that are uh, important to the work that we do at Springbrook High School. Instructional moves, the power of communication, processes, and structures. The first, instructional moves. This summer, past summer, I had an opportunity to work with my dynamic instructional leadership team, wonderful parents and students, where we talked about, we examined our data, analyzed our practices, and then we decided to focus and concentrate our efforts on the instructional move known as structured student discourse. This instructional strat strategy for us has really been powerful. Um, and I say that because when you think about the research, the research says that students should speak, read, write, and listen every day in class. Now, you may have heard this before when you think about WIDA and the, the assessment for the WIDA and also um, how we ensure that our students that are receiving EML services are really advancing in those domains. But the reality is that this is just great instruction for all students. The other thing that we really focus on is moving the cognitive load from our teachers to our students. And we do this by ensuring that we are providing prompts that are related to the curriculum and the content to engage our students so that they may share their varied perspectives and beliefs about the content. 
it is, it is, it is um, certainly it can, this can happen. The students can go to school every day and not utter a word to anyone in classes except at lunchtime. And that is not what we do at Springbrook High School. We want our students to talk every day to their peers, share their, their perspectives, their differences, and I call that creative abrasion. The next point I want to talk about is the power of communication. So at Springbrook High School, we use various strategies and, and structures to ensure that we are communicating with our students. One key strategy is that we, my administrators, deliver some grade level messaging and town hall structures. But what is unique to that is then following the town halls, then students meet with their counselors individually in this intimate setting and they're able to ask more detailed questions about how they remain on cohort with their peers. What are those graduation requirements that they need to make sure they're fulfilling in terms of SSL and the like. And in doing so, counselor also, counselors also talk about our powerful programs at Springbrook High School where students are able to make real world uh, connections. So at Springbrook, we have a dynamic international baccalaureate program. We have the Academy of Information Technology and the, and the Project Lead the Way program. Both of these programs at Springbrook High School have the highest designation that a school can receive. Additionally, we also have the Hospitality Management Program, Justice Law and Society, where our students in mock trial were second in the county, in the entire county in their performance. And we also have the College and Career Readiness and I'm missing one, oh, the Teacher Academy of Maryland program. Our students are able to um, engage in these programs, make those real world connections from the coursework to what they actually want to do in their future endeavors, and that is certainly powerful. Now I'm going to transition to processes and structures. I'm really big on processes and structures. Um, and so we really capitalize on those structures that are in schools. The first thing is that each administrator has a monitoring tool for their caseload. They have all their students, their IDs, the services they receive, the credits that they are earning in this one document. So we hold bi-weekly meetings. Those meetings focus on attendance, academics, and social-emotional well-being. At these meetings, we really drill down to, student, to the student level to determine what our students' needs, what are the interventions that we need to implement, how are we going to execute those um, interventions, and then follow up. Additionally, we use the early warning indicator data that is provided by the county. We use that data and we also um, dialogue with our feeder middle schools in terms of articulation to identify those students who are not necessarily meeting proficiency academically or may have concerns with attendance or absenteeism. And so we identify a select few students and those students are placed in our ninth grade academy. Now, the ninth grade academy is just like bringing a little bit of middle school to high school, where we identify teachers who are on one PLC for ninth grade, and those teachers talk about uh, the students that they are working with. They are working concentratedly on how to build rapport and relationships with those students, to engage those students, and they're collectively, collectively talking about strategies to help them be successful. Additionally, when you think about engagement, uh, one of the things that I, I really want to foster, we foster at Springbrook High School with our teachers um, and our students is we have our students take the NWA map, R and map M, right? And so in using that diagnostic tool, I'll call it, we are able to, that tool is the one tool that allows us to see the projected growth of students for the entire year. There is no other tool like that. And so we use that tool so that we are able to then see which of our students are really performing at a more rigorous level. Because sometimes when students register for courses, they're kind of under-registering for courses, right? There's, they're playing it safe. 
Once we identify those students, we have those conversations with them, we encourage them, we highlight them, we celebrate them, and they, we work with their parents to determine if they are ready to take some of these rigorous courses, and they are. They are excited about doing that. As a result, we see an increase in our, we see an increase in our students taking our advanced placement courses and our international baccalaureate courses. The other thing that we do at Springbrook High School is, you know, I don't believe that the language should ever be a barrier for students. I don't think that should ever be a barrier. But when students, you know, many of our students who receive EML services, they speak two, up to five languages, right? So of course we have to ensure that they have met the targeted language to some degree. But once we, they've met that, that targeted language to some degree, let's say our EML threes, um, those students are demonstrating some critical skills that are needed to really operate in those advanced classes like AP and IB. So I'm sure you all have heard of the Posse Scholarship. So I brought a Posse model to Springbrook High School and that program is called the EML Posse where the ELD teachers and our general education teachers are identifying students who are already demonstrating that they can handle the complexity of the work in these classes. And so we bring those students down, have a conversation, highlight what they're doing in class, and by far they all say, Ms. Valentine, we're ready. We want to take these classes. So we've placed these, class, these students into, into um, IB classes and AP classes. Um, we meet with them, my team of, of teachers who are working with the Posse students and the administrative team and myself. We meet with these students monthly to check in on them, to see how they're doing quarterly, quarterly, to see how they're doing, um, what feedback they're providing us in terms of what we need to alter, change, amend, modify, so that we're meeting their needs. When I have staffing, I am able to put a para in those classes to further support them. But also I have dynamic, open-minded teachers that certainly are willing to, to do their best to help those students be successful. So um, I don't want to leave any talent on the table. At Springbrook High School, we don't. And so that is why we ensure that we're providing our students with multiple opportunities to engage them, which is why I think we see this superb trend data here for our grade nine students. Thank you so much. And now I am going to turn it over to my director, Dr. Jeannie Dawson. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Hi, Dr. Felder. Um, President Silvestri. There's really not too much to add to that. Uh, what I want to highlight is the great work that Ms. Valentine and her team are doing. And some of that has to do with the intentional focus on the resource teachers and building the capacity of the leadership team. They do that with uh, the structures that they have in place and the regular uh, meetings that they have around data. And in looking at that, they have intentional monitoring strategies specifically uh, for structured discourse. They measure it uh, to see the impact with students. And again, as we work with our, our EML students, um, you know, how are we scaffolding for them? How are we um, elevating their learning experience? And I think she's described some of that already. But we have to move adults before we can move kids. So the professional learning that is embedded in their work is really structured through our school improvement process. The supervisory meet meetings that we have involve the team of um, teachers and leaders to really discuss what they're doing in the classroom and taking it from you know, a strategic plan level into the classroom is the key. And, and to have these programs with supports and have staff supports is essential. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight too is the vertical articulation piece. You know, we have um, learning and achievement specialists that we work with on a regular basis. We work with them, uh, as Nicole has said, from elementary, middle to high. You know, graduation is a K through 12 process. And working with our LASs, um, we are being really intentional about what you've been talking about all day in terms of, you know, where are we with K? How are we moving our students in fifth by fifth grade so that they're ready 
to be in that transition for sixth grade because you really only have 540 days to move a kid from a fifth grader to a ninth grader. And, uh, you know, having that, um, that readiness is, is critical. So the work that the high school is doing with middle school, with our, our two middle school feeders is important. You know, does the algebra class look the same from the eighth grade to the ninth grade? What are we doing to ensure that those transitions um, and the collaborative planning and discussions are there? The other thing that I would um, say too is highlighting Stephanie's point around speaking, learning, uh, speaking, listening, reading, writing, and that focus for the English content specialist and resource teacher to have with her department um, around, you know, how are we ensuring all of our students in our classes are having rich dialogue, but also, um, you know, being able to write. So this is a embedded process. Um, everything is connected, and you can't look at, you know, your departments as um, silos, so and that's that is a great thing. When I look at those resource teacher meetings and PLCs, you see the connection and the data is being discussed on a regular basis. So with that, I turn it back to President Silvestri for questions. Very interesting presentations. I mean, you your your measures are all about grades and uh, assessments but you described so much more in terms of engaging, right? In order to get those good grades and good assessments, you've done a lot of work to engage students so that they're actually connected and caring about their studies. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, start over with Ms. Harris. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for all the great work that you all are doing. I, um, I have had a lot of fun this year doing shadow days in a bunch of our high schools, and I just see so much good stuff happening in our high schools, just being a student in the classroom you know, doing the geometry, doing the group work, whatever we're doing that day, so much good work happening in our high school, in our high schools. And so I just really appreciate these really creative approaches. Mm -hmm. We're treating students like individuals, not like numbers or, you know, demographic, demographic cut lines or anything like that. Just a quick observation when I'm looking at, for both Springbrook and Gaithersburg, we're looking at ninth grade this year, um, this year's students, and we're seeing um, a, a, impressive numbers of these ninth graders that are on track for graduation. But then we also see significant numbers of them that aren't meeting the transition evidence of learning, I'm guessing in math and, and literacy. So just just share for us, what, how, how does that, what does that mean? And how do those two things intersect? What were the numbers last year? <laughs> <laughs> Don't everybody I'll, jump away. I know. I said, geez. <laughs> um, I, I don't mind starting. Um, so certainly in the on track for graduation, where we're looking at all of their different courses and the credits that they need to be able to move on to the next grade levels, right? So that does involve courses beyond certainly their English classes and their math classes, right? They have elective credits. Um, other other aspects within social studies and science as well, right? So that is so certainly there are students that uh, they have to be on track and graduation within those core courses, you know, as well. Um, I think the aspect around necessarily meeting the measures, while the measures for within literacy and math do involve district measures as well, um, that might not necessarily be connected to the course requirements to be able to pass the courses. So there's some variables that do come into play there that could contribute to some of the differentials that you would see within the data. So I'll, I would offer that to start and certainly uh, if anybody else would like to also add. No, I think the only thing that I would add to what Ms. Sasek shared is that when we, for example, and I know our classroom grades are typically higher, but from the evidence of learning framework per approach in terms of a measure in the course grade, we're looking for a C or higher. But we know that students can earn credit with a D or higher, right? So that's another thing to factor in as you look at the data that's on the screen. Okay. Thank you. And, oh, sorry. Yep. No, and I think we got to this a little bit earlier, talking about another conversation, another time, talking about the potential for grade inflation and how are we grading and what are we grading, and um, um, yeah. So I think it's, it'll be interesting because um, Ms. Lightsey said a couple things earlier that I would like to follow up on when we get to when we do that presentation at a later time. But it does look to um, I, I mean I just do appreciate that we are seeing gains. Um, for all of our students, which is the right direction. Mrs. Vandrowski? 
Yep, thank you very much, all of you all, for your presentation and the good work that you guys are doing in your schools. We really, really appreciate it, obviously. Um, I think you spoke to it a little bit more than uh, Mr. Dimmick, but um, I'm always interested in how some schools are, seem to be able to find the time or the um, whatever they need to get together as a group, as one of you, you both mentioned, um, and talk about each individual student. And I'm just kind of curious, like, how, when do you do that? Like, is that an after school and all of the staff comes? Or are you going classroom to classrooms and meeting? I'm just trying to figure out how some schools seem to be able to do it and some schools maybe not as much. Um, well, it's how you, you, you budget your time, right, and what you prioritize. Um, and for us, in high schools, we definitely are looking at the graduation rate, right? And so it's certainly important that we are looking at our students individually. But for me, I believe we have to start at ninth grade and then continue that work to 12th. We do the same thing for each grade level, but um, for this conversation, it's ninth grade. And so um, it's a bi-weekly meeting. It happens in the morning. Um, I have, and they're every, every other week. Okay. So one week I have attendance and um, academics, and then the next week is social emotional well-being meeting and we just continue to do it all year long and have these conversations and who's at the table you asked it would be the administrators counselors ppw pcc social worker and school psychologists nice yeah. thank you You're welcome. Yep. and i wanted to add at gaithersburg um and Ms. Valentine mentioned is it's it's how we budget our time um we have um a number of barriers that our students um mm -hmm have to incur every single day. So uh, we've created teams, and Ms. Love Campbell has, has led several of those, uh, where we do speak um, weekly about attendance and what are the barriers to students coming to school and why. Um, that's where a lot of our creative thinking is coming, where how can we support these students with their real life um, struggles and pressures and to be able to come to school. Um, we also, our student well-being team is very evolved. Um, our administrators and counselors meet every week uh, to elevate those students that are just not responding to the supports in school. So we can just kind of wrap our arms around and find out what more intensive supports that they might need. Um, we have regular admin team meetings every single week. Our instructional leadership team meets. Our, uh, we have our RT, which is our resource and admin, uh, PLCs. Um, and that's in addition to the department meetings and the PLC meetings. Um, much mm -hmm. of what Dr. Moran mentioned before is so much of the planning that goes into the implementation of the teaching and learning in the classroom. That's what we really want to monitor and how we're meeting the needs of all of our, our diverse students. Um, and we really do at Gaithersburg really focus on cultural attentiveness is are we being attentive to the students that are sitting in front of us and what do they need on an, on an everyday basis. So um, our, our staff is employing this. They're, they're embracing it. It is a lot of work. And um, Ms. Harris, I think you mentioned earlier about everything putting on uh, teachers' plates. Um, but I think when they see that our students are responding to those supports and the conversations that we're having, um, similar to the middle school teaming approach, where we talk about teams, um, it, it encourages them more to do more work and just kind of go above and beyond what's expected. That's great. May I share this as well? Sure. Oh, you want to go? Ahead? It's all the other piece is that our teachers are also doing this work, even though they're not sitting at the table. They are doing this work. They are calling parents. They are emailing parents. They're having one-on-one -on -one conferences with students and encouraging them to come. They're sending emails. Um, and like I said, we also use the other structure, which is the ninth grade academy. And at Gaithersburg, we also have monthly data chats. So that's when all of our PLC teams get together and they actually look at their data. So I know one question was about performance in one teacher's classroom versus another. And so that's when those conversations tend to come to the forefront. So teachers come with their classroom data. So if I notice that one teacher has a significant number of A's and B's and then another teacher has a significant number of C's and D's, we want to talk about the practices and strategies that are happening in that teacher's classroom in order for her students to be successful successful. And then from there, we'll have those PLC members go in and observe that teacher in practice to see how those strategies are being successful. And those conversations just become cyclical. So they happen within every data chat meeting that we have. That's fantastic. And as Thank Ms. You. Love Campbell said, the other thing is that our, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. You said something about, um, I forgot, data chats. It, not data chat, something else you said. I wanted to I jump in. The observations, but it'll come back to me. You can jump in. Mr. Red Oven. 
Yeah, well, thank you so much. I, um, I'm i sorry I haven't been to Springbrook, but um, my alma mater is Gaysesburg High School, so I have been a couple of times to Gaysesburg High School. I'm just very curious because um, I think Gaysesburg High School is one of those high schools that has, you have the largest uh, ESOL population, you have the largest special ed population, largest METS population. Um, so you were able, especially with Remind me how many students you have? About 2,500. Right. Um, it's a city. It's a little city in there. So, especially with the Latino students, how were you able to go, f like, almost 13 points from one year to the other? Mm -hmm. Because I look at schools with a, with a similar population, like Watkins Mill and Kennedy and um, uh, Wheaton and others, that... It would be great to share whatever you guys are doing, because you and I have talked about the challenges of a lot of the kids, especially with, within the immigrant community, the fact that a lot of them have to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they go part-time to school, really, to be able then to, to help provide for their family. So what, what are those ingredients that you guys saw that, that work for that population? When we looked at, so this is my sixth year at Gaithersburg High School, and from day one we looked at um, what is keeping students from being successful in school. And Ms. Harris had mentioned earlier, they're not a number, they are a person. Um, and we've really had to change the way that we do business with having um, very intensive one-on-one -on -one conversations with our students, um, really re-engaging our community. Uh, we've done a lot this year to host uh, parents, uh, welcome parents. We've had community fairs, um, but just really making an, an intensive effort um, to find out what they need. And I think sometimes we enter into a pattern of we define what everyone's success should look like, and that's not always fair. Um, we do have the highest mobility rate in Montgomery County. We have one of the highest um, absentee rates every single week, sitting at close to 60%. But we do have students who come to school, and they want the best, and they deserve the best. Um, so we really uh, kind of stepped back in terms of what wasn't working and really kind of looked at what do they need to be successful in school. Sometimes that's just a matter of acknowledging that they have to work at night. So we've employed creative scheduling. Uh, we've asked to pilot a program next year to um, allow some of our kids to go hybrid, to be in person for part of the day and do virtual learning for online pathways to graduation um, for the rest of the day. Um, but also, um, having truthful conversations, what do you want out of your education? Um, I think sometimes Sorry to say this, but I think sometimes we just think that they want to go to college, um, and we we develop that pattern for them. Um, that's why we started started the College Career and Graduation Support Department. Um, we want to make sure that we get all students to graduation, so they have choices beyond there. We have a very involved CTE program. We have an amazing NJROTC program. Um, many of our students uh, learn leadership skills in these programs that then transition into the workforce. We've had a number of students that have deferred college to go into the workforce because they found a passion there, uh, working with their hands something that they love to do. Um, and the amount of time it takes, again, going back to staff going above and beyond, um, our leadership team has really stepped up, and especially our administrative team, in having dozens of one-on-one -on -one conversations every single day. And, and showing that we care about them and really having that care reciprocated has brought students to school and has really kind of engaged them to get more out of, of Gaithersburg High School. Once they know that we have them and, and we're supporting them, that they get more effort when they come to school. It's, it's those one-on-one -on -one relationships that really matters at our school. I, I really appreciate that because um, I think especially that connection with students after COVID, is, it's just so vital, that ingredient, that one-on-one -on -one and, and challenging them. And I think you said something about, you know, the kids sometimes sign up for classes that they know they can get an A in, but their potential is so much more. So when you have adults recognizing that and saying, no, 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 you can do more. I'm going to challenge you to do more and do your best. I think it resonates with young people. Um, so I, I, I really want to thank you, both of you, for doing that because um, it, it can be challenging these days, right, to to be able to, to connect at that level. And then I had one question going back to the presentation. Um, on page uh, 19, um, I know at the end of the presentation we said that every we, sh we showed an increase of, of everybody uh, when it came to math, but on page 19, um, the only, the slide 19, the only group that did not meet the standards are the farms 
in kindergarten, which is really concerning to me, um, are the Hispanic Latino kids. And I want to know kind of why, what's, what's going on there. Because we all know that if they are behind in kindergarten, we're going to be playing catch up all the way up. So what is it that, that did not resonate? What is it that, you know, um, that is that missing ingredient that did not get these kids at, at a level that we should see? Mm. And how many kids are we talking about? Because again, for me, when I look at these numbers, I don't know the number, if that makes sense, mm. right? So, so we can definitely follow up um, in regard to the question that Ms. Yang shared in terms of seeing the numbers so we can follow up and send that so you see how many students are within each of the student groups that are identified here um, on average for grade and can each grade level on average has about 10 to 11,000 students but when we organize it for the different numbers that will be helpful so we can follow up with regard to that piece. And you know what else would be helpful for me at least when we're talking about pre-K? is how many of those kids had pre-K or did not have pre-K. Because we know when kids do pre-K, they come much more ready um, to kindergarten. And what is that relationship? You know, is it more than 60, 70 percent that did not have pre-K, which I guess will give us... I think it's about 70 percent for Latino kids. Right. So farms. that might have... Right. A, a correlation in that number, which then, you know, is something that we can we can work on. But it's just very really concerning because everybody else, you know, was able to meet standards except for that group. And one of the things, um, and, and we can definitely explore how many students of this kindergarten cohort were in pre-K, but I just want to caution in terms of what we provide is remembering that our pre-K opportunity is income-based, right? So we can we would know definitely the students who engaged in MCPS pre-K because we have that information. But for example, my, if my child wasn't an MCPS pre-K program, but they did a different pre-K program, it's a little more challenge, challenging to be able to report that my child was in pre-K because it's not our MCPS data. So it will be limited in terms of what we know about our MCPS. Right, but I guess I'm saying which of these kids had pre-K and MCPS? Yes. And, and, and what I, how I would shift your request yeah. is of those, so I would have the question, of those who participated in MCPS pre-K, what does their kindergarten yeah. data look like? You, you, can, you can do whatever you want with my request. <laughs> she has <laughs> that data. Yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. So thank you for both of these high schools. Uh, tremendous work. Um, I think you have heard this question before. When we, whenever we hear these wonderful success stories in our uh, one particular school or two particular school, we always want to know how do we scale it, right? So, like for example, I I heard you mention connection classes for ninth graders. I have seen connection classes for upper grades, right? You mentioned the AP resource support class, right? And that's not, I know that's not across the board that we have in every school. And you, you mentioned about expectation for reading, writing, listening, speaking in, in every class. And, and that's the first time I heard it around this board table. So I think my question is to our leaders. So what opportunities do our school-based leaders have uh, to exchange ideas? And you know how, how we are using these um, terrific examples to, to you know, make it um, widespread, maybe each school deploy based on their local situation, deploy different strategy, but, but they have a toolbox of strategies that, that can be used and deployed. We're very fortunate, I believe, for the past two school years, at least four times a year, we're, we're brought together with a small cohort from our school, which usually our staff development teacher, administrative representation, and then either the math resource teacher or the English resource teacher. Um, we have one coming up, uh, I think, on the 23rd of this month. For we're, school -wise? Yeah, for all of the schools in all of Montgomery County. There's okay. a secondary version, an elementary version, and that okay. is an opportunity for, to, uh, for us to bring artifacts, best practices, processes, or structures that we put into place, and we are able to share those with other 
teams. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is sometimes unique to the school. Um, mm -hmm. We are very diligent every uh, Ju or June and July to really look at our data because mm -hmm. what is working this year might not work next year yeah. um, and right. we really want to get a solid foundation yeah. um, but what is really important is that articulation someone had mentioned graduation is is a K through 12 mm -hmm. uh, process and we really need to look at um, what students needed in middle school and help mm -hmm. them transition to high school because the needs are going to be dramatically different mm -hmm. you know one of the benchmark years is sophomore to junior year where kids really kind of come into their own and they really mm -hmm. start thinking about their future um, so the work that's done with ninth graders may be different than with the 11th and 12th graders. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for our, our leaders to come uh, here today. You know, like I said, this is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you are uh, at the front lines, and I want to thank you for your good work. I would be remiss if I didn't say that there's still too much red up there, right? We, <laughs> we want to support you. We want to give you all the tools that you need so that we can move those red to greens and blue, whatever the highest color is, because that's what we want for all of our students. So uh, keep up the good work, but we, we can do better, um, and we want to support you so that uh, we can get more, more students to achieve at their highest level. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our next agenda item. Safety and security, agenda item number 10. Another very important discussion everywhere we go. Parents, staff, students talk to us about uh, safety and security and uh, you know where, where we are doing well, but oftentimes where we need to improve. Um, so this is a very important conversation and uh, I will pass it on to Dr. Felder. Thank you, uh, President Silvestri. So, um, this afternoon, uh, you will receive an update on the status of safety and security in Montgomery County Public Schools. As echoed um, in the Safe Schools Resolution, unanimously adopted by the board in the fall, the mission of ensuring the safety of our students and staff remains our top priority. In response to this mandate, MCPS undertook a rigorous examination of its protocols, practices, and infrastructure concerning school safety. So at this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Brian Hall, our Chief Operating Officer, to introduce his team and begin the presentation. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, Dr. Felder. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Board of Education. Um, I am passing around an updated packet. Uh, we did get some updated uh, arrest data from our uh, police partners this morning uh, that is included, I believe, on the slide deck that will be uh, uh, shown here and then also in the handout that I just passed around. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, yes, this is a very uh, important and heavy topic. Um, we all know that uh, Things have changed after COVID, and our young people are dealing with a lot these days, uh, whether it's you know, social media, um, uh, the impacts of bullying, the impacts of mental health uh, issues, many of them uh, likely tied to the effects of COVID. Uh, but our young people are dealing with more than they ever have before. So I'm excited to uh, introduce and welcome to the table uh, Ms. Uh, Michelle Ezefor Andrews. She uh, came to us as the Director of School Safety uh, security and emergency management and is currently serving as the acting chief of that department and along with her is uh, our coordinator uh, in that department Katie Ramadi and so I really want to just uh, highlight the great work uh, that this team has done this year and uh, they really stepped in there has been a lot of transition in the office of safety and security management um, over the past you know 10 months or so we've had a number of uh, different leaders in there and and some, some fits and starts and stops, uh, which has been very challenging. But I really want to thank um, Michelle and her team for stepping into a very difficult situation during a very difficult time uh, in this area for Montgomery County Public Schools and really hitting the ground running and doing some great work. Uh, I also just want to highlight the great work that all of our uh, school-based security staff are doing uh, every single day in our schools and all the other adults in our schools that are uh, supporting safety and security because the job goes far beyond uh, the six or eight security personnel. It really is the job of uh, every adult in our schools to make sure that we are creating a warm, welcoming, and safe learning environment um, for our students. 
So if we could go to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, our agenda for today, we're going to start with an update from the 2019 uh, safety audit recommendations. Then we will look at some current year data uh, for this school year. And then we do have uh, a pause for discussion after the first two topics. And so uh, if possible, if the board can hold their questions uh, to that point, uh, that would be great. Um, then we're going to talk about safety and security uh, recommendations that came out of the community of practice uh, that Ms. Ezefor Andrews led this uh, winter, uh, along with Ms. Ramadi. Then we're going to talk about the short-term safety and security recommendations. So these are things that uh, we believe we can implement by the beginning of next school year, if not sooner. And then the long-term uh, recommendations that um, are more complex, more costly, uh, but equally important that will just take a little bit more time for us to implement. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the district did commission a safety audit back in 2019. Of course, this ended up being right before COVID, which no one knew at the time. Um, and so the work kind of uh, halted during COVID because we didn't have students in our buildings. Uh, and so uh, building security was not top of mind for anyone at that time. There were many, many other things that we were doing to support our students uh, through virtual learning and all of the other challenges that the global pandemic um, created for uh, our society and specifically for our young people. But I just want to highlight a few of these uh, recommendations that had come uh, now, you know, five years ago. Um, Data-driven accountability, and so we really have focused on making sure that the decisions we're making are driven by data. Uh, some of the outcomes of that have been uh, including serious incident data in our security allocations. Uh, previously, that was not done, but of course, if you're not looking at where the problems are, then you're not going to be able to uh, identify solutions. We've also done a lot of benchmarking with other districts as far as what does a robust security model look like. Uh, and the result of that has been the addition uh, each of the last two years, and again next year, of additional security staff in our schools, but also, as I said, using additional data to make sure that they're allocated in the most effective and equitable way possible. Um, technology. We've done a lot with technology um, over the past two years. Uh, outfitted about 50 schools just this current year with uh, security cameras that previously did not have them, um, and uh, even more the year before. So we've done a lot there. Um, looking to have the vape detectors installed in all of our secondary schools by the beginning of next school year. Uh, we've done security uh, facility enhancements. Um, one of the recommendations that came specifically out of the 2019 review was to have security uh, vestibules at the main entrances of all of our schools, which we did not have. We do have that now. Uh, the last one was just completed earlier this, um, this school year. Uh, and then positive behavior, early intervention. Obviously, Dr. Kapunin's office has done a lot of great work around substance use, uh, education, and prevention for our young people, which um, was highlighted. And actually, I meant to, to lead with this, uh, thanking the, the folks who came to uh, public testimony today uh, and our uh, others in our community that have been very vocal and supportive around uh, uh, security needs in our schools and making sure that uh, our students do have that safe, warm, and welcoming environment uh, where they can come to learn every day. Um, back to the facilities, we also had um, have put in key fobs uh, throughout the buildings. Um, and then with the early intervention, we've uh, ro uh, robust restorative justice uh, program that's been implemented. Um, we have reviewed the student code of conduct. Uh, that's an annual um, review that is done and updates made. And then collaboration with our police partners was another recommendation. And so we have uh, really strived over the past couple of years to increase the collaboration, uh, communication, not just with our police partners, but other, other county uh, partners, including uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, because a lot of the behavior uh, in challenges that we're seeing today, as was noted earlier in the meeting today, um, does stem from, you know, challenges that students are facing with uh, social, emotional, mental health um, challenges. So if we can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so just a few updates here. Um, so we did uh, issue new uh, ID badges this year uh, for all of our staff. That, so they have um, picture IDs that's 100% complete across the board. All of our staff have been issued these new IDs and FOBs. Uh, the camera updates, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have done a lot of uh, updates to our uh, security camera uh, program across the district. We now have security cameras at all of our secondary schools and all of our elementary schools um, except for two, and those are uh, in progress as we speak. Uh, so now we're at the point with the security cameras where we're going, we're going to start going back to schools uh, that were you know, uh, some of the first to have the cameras installed, and that may be 10 or more years ago, and they're kind of outdated at this point. And so it's it's really with all of this, there's no there's no finish line. There's not going to be a point where we get to and we say, okay, we're done. We can spike the football, and we're not going to have issues anymore. Um, so we continue to work on that, uh, and we'll go back and be retrofitting some of the schools that uh, that already have cameras but that are outdated. The other one is our security staff. And so um, we have increased staff each of the last several years, and our staff uh, is 99% um, staff full right now. We only have a 1% vacancy rate across um, our security staff in schools. And so uh, the team has done a great job in conjunction with human resources of making sure that those critical positions are filled. Um, and then with our SROs, so the SRO slash SSE uh, training, this is the uh, required, the mandated uh, training by the state of Maryland. Maryland Safe Schools offers this training. And um, we additionally uh, offer training for our security folks. And so before any security uh, personnel is deployed to the schools, they go through robust uh, internal training uh, that is run out of our uh, school uh, safety office, um, but the state uh, training is something that's offered about six times a year in various locations across the state. And so 94% uh, uh, is, is great. Last year we were uh, somewhere in the 70s, um, and so we have you know been able to get that up. There's always going to be a bit of a lag. We'll never be at 100% because as we bring on uh, new personnel and there is a significant amount of turnover. Um, in the training only being offered about six times a year and not always within uh, accessible distance from Montgomery County, um, there's just going to be a lag. So the next one where these remaining 15 will be uh, trained will be in June is the next one that's close enough for us to be able to send our folks there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, no doubt we'll have some turnover over the summer, but we do have um, structures in place now to ensure that as we hire new people, they are required to attend the first available uh, of these trainings that comes about after their um, higher date. And so, you know, I highlight all of that just to say that um, a lot has happened. Uh, a lot has gone on. We've made a lot of improvements, but there is still a long, long ways to go, right? We can feel the landscape shifting under our feet as we speak. And I think um, I'll speak for myself. I think others probably feel the same way. Um, the impact that the global pandemic and COVID had uh, is cannot be understated. And we're seeing challenges, whether it's uh, fentanyl or other things, um, the proliferation of guns that have created, you know, uh, challenges that couldn't even be uh, imagined back in 2019 when the uh, last audit was done. And so uh, Ms. Ezefor Andrews will talk about uh, the addition, uh, the ongoing work that we are doing to uh, meet the changing landscape and the changing needs of our schools and our uh, society. And I will pass it on to Ms. Ezefor Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, good evening, or afternoon, evening, uh, members of the board. Um, thank you for having us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, first, in collaboration, um, we want to give Sammy a shout out um, for his uh, contribution in terms of the uh, BOE resolution, um, giving the student voice perspective. And so, um, sorry, next slide, please. Um, so here you will see uh, different areas of the cycle that we worked on with the work that we did. Um, a lot of it involved uh, using the uh, BOE resolution as a foundation for us. 
um, uh, collaboration with the student staff and community voice data, um, the community of practice subject act, uh, matter expert, experts recommendations, um, CEO engagement, and um, serious uh, incident data and student arrest data. Um, so though it's a cycle, um, a lot of the work that we did involved different aspects of what you see on the image. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, on October 23rd, 2023, the BOE passed a resolution focused on safety and security in our schools. Um, in acknowledgement of the paramount importance of maintaining a safe and secure learning environment, our office recognizes the evolving nature of security challenges within our school system and has proactively responded by engaging our students, staff, and communities, as well as our subject matter experts to enhance safety across schools. Um, the information that we're gonna be sharing today reflects our unwavering commitment to fostering academic excellence while prioritizing um, safety and security for our students. Um, I'll now turn the presentation over to Katie Ramadi, our trainer, um, who's gonna share some um, student voice data with you. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Esavar Andrews. Good afternoon, President Silvestri, members of the board. Hi, everyone, I'm Dr. Felder. Uh, in order to assess our current status and security needs, I met with Mr. Saeed in January and developed a plan to conduct student engagement sessions where I introduced the board's safe schools resolution to students and asked them to weigh in. Middle and high school administrators were asked to invite me into their school buildings to speak with 20 to 30 selected students with different educational um, backgrounds and experiences. I visited 17 um, of those schools and talked with over 350 students. I think it's worth noting here that most of our students were already familiar with Mr. Saeed's work, um, and it became evident to me that that all around the county, the, the students were connected to the board because of the work that Mr. Saeed's doing. And I can just say as, a, as an administrator, as a teacher, that that's really a big deal. So thank you for that. During our one hour sessions, um, I first presented the tenets of the resolution and then we engaged in open dialogue um, where I asked students to share their ideas, their suggestions, or any additional um, uh, concerns that they had. We asked the expansion, I'm sorry, we discussed the expansion of the ID pilot. Uh, the majority of students agreed that ID badges would enhance safety and security, but there were some reservations regarding logistics, such as um, how the cards would be carried, um, how they would be checked and um, replaced if lost or stolen. Students also expressed concerns about staff compliance, consistency, and potential biases in enforcement. Um, these are all relevant concerns that we will definitely address before ex um, any expansion of the ID pilot is put into effect. We also discussed the current anonymous reporting channels. Uh, the majority of students felt that the current tip line is effective. Many of those students also reported having used the tip line at some point. Um, however, most agreed that we need to do a better job of advertising the reporting channels. They offered excellent suggestions for uh, how schools can broaden awareness of the tip line um, as an anonymous reporting tool for serious incidents. One of the suggestions was, for example, um, adding the link to their Canvas classroom pages. Uh, another topic that we talked about was technology enhancement and security. There were a range of opinions and considerations there. The majority of students believed that enhanced security measures such as updated cameras, weapons detection, vape detectors, and door alarms would improve um, security in schools. But there were, again, some reservations regarding privacy, um, impact on arrival times, um, unwarranted suspicion, which are all excellent points um, to take under consideration before any decisions are made moving forward. Um, students also offered practical suggestions uh, regarding the use of vape detectors, enhanced staff training, and the possibility of digital hall passes that some of our schools are currently using, and we're definitely researching those in the coming months. Finally, there's a call to prioritize addressing threats and fighting alongside concerns about creating a safe environment and ensuring effective communication with students, not just parents, during an emergency incident that was um, that, that was discussed thoroughly. Recommendations including utilizing communication platforms like the Remind app more frequently and ensuring bilingual staff are available for non-English speaking students. 
Um, this feedback from students has helped us reevaluate emergency messaging to prioritize key information to prevent panic and misinformation. Next slide, please. So when I met with students, in addition to the open discussion and actually right before we started talking, um, I asked each of the students to give me a word or a phrase that summed up their concerns or suggestions or impressions of safety and security in their specific buildings. Um, I used their submissions to create this word cloud, which underscores several recurring themes that came up in our discussions. So as you may know, in a word cloud, the word or phrase gets larger the more, um, the more uh, it's it is mentioned, so I collected the information and compiled them into appropriate headings or topics. The image here that you see effectively um, reflects the common themes that consistently came up in every building. Uh, as you can see, fights, bathrooms, and drugs emerge as predominant themes that underscore concerns about physical safety and substance use prevention, while technology and teacher awareness point towards areas of improvement in utilizing technology and uh, enhancing staff awareness of safety concerns in the building. Other topics, such as stairways and doors, highlight specific areas of the school environment that may require attention, while the word training emphasized the need for comprehensive and ongoing work with both students and staff. Other prevalent concerns include speed, suggesting the urgency in addressing safety issues, while calls for more security staff and proper ID checks emphasize the importance of staffing and procedural protocols in maintaining a, sa a secure school environment. I'll now turn the presentation back over to Ms. Ezefor Andrews to review uh, the community feedback regarding CEO 2.0, uh, serious incident and arrest data, and this office's recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ramadi. So as part of our ongoing partnership with Montgomery County Police, uh, we surveyed the community as well as hosted um, various listening sessions with diverse populations to ensure that we continue to hear feedback from our stakeholders regarding the efficacy of our community engagement officer program, also known as our CEO program. So last year, um, Office of System-Wide Safety and Emergency Management, also known as OSSEM, um, reached out to the community and mainly learned that many of our parents and our students were not really familiar with the program to share their opinion when surveyed or engaged. This year, we continue to solicit feedback and have learned the following. Next slide, please. The majority of respondents from all demographic groups express support for the current CEO program. With MCPS parents and guardians demonstrating the highest level of endorsements. Additionally, a significant number of participants favored the program, but solely in response to serious incidents with MCPS parents and guardians, again representing the largest portions of this group. Conversely, a smaller percentage of respondents voiced opposition to the program, with MCPS students registering the lowest number of dissenting opinions. Furthermore, a notable proportion of respondents, particularly MCPS parents and guardians, indicated having no definitive opinion, suggesting the need for continued community education regarding the program and the details outlined in the current memorandum of understanding between MCPS and our CEOs. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide captures a summary of serious incident data for the school year. Um, reported as of March 13th, 2024, please note that the demographics are not included in the data presented on this table. Serious incidents reported to Synergy encompass a wide array of categories that have the potential to impact school safety and security significantly. These categories include alcohol-related incidents, instances involving drugs or controlled substances, incidents related to inhalants and tobacco, as well as more serious occurrence like attacks on students, adults, fights, trespassing, and incidents involving firearms, knives, or other weapons. Additionally, the reported incidents cover a range of serious situations such as death, serious bodily injury, extortion, ar arson, and sexual attacks. Schools adhere to establish protocol for communications, documentations, reporting, and investigation tailored to the specific type of incident reported. These protocols ensure that appropriate actions are taken promptly and effectively to address the situation and to maintain the safety and well-being of all of our students and staff. 
Moreover, an analysis of reported incidents revealed distinct patterns across different school levels. For instance, elementary schools may experience a higher frequency of incidents related to knives and other weapons or false alarms. In contrast, middle schools often report more incidents involving drugs or controlled substances, weapons, and fights. Similarly, as you see, um, high schools commonly encounter incidents related to drugs or other controlled substances, weapons, and fights as well. The differentiation, the differentiation highlights the unique safety challenges faced by each education level and underscores the importance of tailored approaches to address these concerns effectively. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we're going to talk about these student arrest data. Um, so as we get into the arrest data, it's important to share with you, um, as uh, 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 Mr. Hall mentioned this, uh, this afternoon, um, we did receive an, uh, updated information from our police partners um, concerning the data, which we will share. Um, so we have updated this presentation to reflect those numbers. Um, this table represents uh, arrest data that has been shared with you over the past two years. Um, it includes full custody physical arrests as well as paper charges or referrals to the Department of Juvenile Services. Um, upon receiving the corrected data this morning from MCPD, um, we felt it was important to further disaggregate the data to clearly show the differences in numbers. Um, next slide, please. You know what, um, Ms. Sylvester, can I ask a question? I have to leave at 5 o'clock. I just wanted to jump in with two questions. Can we go back to the last slide? Um, so I think it was really great that we had the presentation that we had prior to this and talking about um, how important it is for our students to develop relationships with the staff in the building. And so when we think about this chart, um, like the number of arrests aren't really a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. So then that gets back to like, what is the bigger issue? Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. And so we need to really get down to that. Yes. And then also um, uh, maybe two slides back. I don't remember you have the um, you have the percentage of 76 percent and something else. And I heard Mr. Hall and I appreciate you talking about, you know, it's a lot of things happening and going on in the system. Um, but. Even still, how many people contributed to the data that we're saying? So 76%, is that 10 people? Is that 50? Is that 300? Is that 1,000? Because that says something, too. Mm -hmm. And if that is a low number of respondents, then we need to do this again. We need to go back and engage our community in a different way or, or figure out how we get the information that we need to better inform us. I, I don't know if I'm... You're mentioning you. the um, CEO. Can, I, can we go back to the, because I'm, I'm talking and I don't see the slide, but it was. Or the serious incidents. Page nine. And no, it was. No, no, no. I, let, let, me, let me look at my. Page nine. No, the community engagement piece. Okay, the CEO's yeah. uh, yes. survey. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that feedback. feedback. Or what are we using that feedback for? And if we don't have a number, if we don't have an adequate number of respondents, if you can't tell me that right now, then we actually shouldn't even be using that data. Right? Correct. Yeah. So you all know what the numbers are specifically. I just see the percentages. Number of respondents. Yes. For the, for the CEO survey. Yes. Uh, 2618. Can you turn your mic on? Two, wait, 20. 2618. 2000. Oh, 2000. 2618. 2618. Yes. Okay. That represents 76% of the, that number of people community participating. Oh, no. I'm sorry. The, uh, for the, for the in favor. You said 76% feel safer and believe CEOs are necessary. 44% don't mm -hmm. know enough, have no interactions. Was that 2,000? I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. Parents and guardians, 1,350. Uh, staff, 476. And students, 71. Okay. So we didn't get enough students, right? Mm -hmm. And didn't, let me ask one more question, and I'm sorry, colleagues. Mm -hmm. the, um, well, I'm not sorry, but um, <laughs> I, 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 I said two, three. Did we get the students, I know when we had the conversation about going out into the community and engaging the community around this topic, we talked about getting the students that are actually impacted, right? The students that we are talking about up on the screen, we mm -hmm. said that we were going to include their voices. So of the 17 or 71 mm -hmm. students, were any of the students that are actually impacted 
or are they students that we just asked a question about how they feel? The, the students that were involved in the student engagement, we did have students who um, are represented different differing educational experiences in those engagement sessions. In those engagement sessions, so the focus was all about the resolution and coming up with ideas and feedback for um, the, the resolution itself. It was not a conversation for CEOs, about CEOs. Uh, okay, so um, I thought that that was something that we made clear um, before you all went out. And then I'll even go back to my colleague who's no longer on the board, Dr. Judy Daka. Like, that was something that she'd always talked about, wanting to ensure that we capture the voices of our students who are actually being impacted. And so that just, I mean, it just makes it that much more valuable. Um, I just wanted to ask those questions and then have us really think about what we're going to make as our priorities, or what are we saying as a result of getting this information that came from some people that we actually need information from, and then some that we don't, right? And that's just my opinion. I'm not speaking for my colleagues. That's just me. Yeah, okay. so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so there was, you know, uh, a, sub, a few different ways that we attempted to collect this data, and we did when we went out to schools, um, specifically asked principals to provide a diverse, um, you know, set of students for us to talk to. Uh, I think from, you know, looking at the data and then hearing from uh, Ms. Evans and, and others on the board, um, we probably need to go deeper. We probably need to um, be more intentional about touching some of those student groups that you uh, specifically mentioned there. And so we will take that back uh, as a, a as a to-do. And you're right, the, the charge was clear uh, from Ms. Wolf and from others. Uh, and if it, I think we may have missed the mark there. And so we will go back um, immediately, you know, following this and uh, be intentional about how we can cast, I think, both a wider uh, net, but also uh, deeper discussions with um, all of our students. I appreciate that. I, you know, what it is hard to do is to, um, people have expectations of the system and what we say we're going to do. And then when we fall short, just saying that, as you've done, because I know people are watching. I don't know if it's millions, but I think it's hundreds, right? Maybe thousands. But anyway, the people that are watching, we're looking for something different. I'm going to make that assumption because the way we talked at the board table some months back and we just want people to know like this is not what we were looking for and you're aware of that too and we're going to say that. We're not here to waste people's time but we do want to be honest and say what we need to do a little bit more of and that's this. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, it's one more slide <coughs> for the data okay. and then can't we can even take get off. Okay. Let's Please do the, let the next slide and then we can Okay. Okay, so here you're looking at the arrest data for the desegregated um, physical and referral arrests. Um, as of March 30th, there have been a total of 62 student arrests. Two were physical or custody arrests, and 60 were referrals to depart the Department of Juvenile Services. Um, to compare last year, five of the 57 arrests uh, that were reported were full custody arrests. Um, next. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So, um, the slides back on, please. Yes. Slide back Previous on. slide, please. Thank you. All right, so as of March 30th, um, there have been a total of 62 student arrests, two were physical or custody arrests, and 60 were referrals from the Department of Juvenile Services. To compare, last year, five of the 57 arrests that were reported were full custody um, arrests. And so um, I know there may be some questions about this, so we can go to the next slide. Um, we do have um, our police partners here um, that can answer questions about the data, um, and this, we want to use this time now to answer any questions that you might have before we move on to the next slide. So um, just I'm trying to unpack the arrest data. Yes. Um, so you gave us 21, 22. Yes. 44 total. Mm-hmm. 22, 23, 57 total. And then this school year until March, 62 or 60? 62. 62. 62. Okay. So we're trending up. Um, and this is with the CEO model. Yes. Mm -hmm. All three years? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, and uh, I, I think I know the answer to this, but before the CEO model, the numbers were similar. I'm not sure. Do you know? Okay, it's okay. Okay, I apologize. No I wasn't here. <laughs> Sorry. That's what I remember, but that, Mr. Hall? Yeah, it, we can follow up. Okay. Uh, Ms. Yang. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, I think this is, like Mr. Hall mentioned at the beginning, this is a very complex work, and I truly appreciate that um, Dr. F you know, safety, security, Dr. Felder sent out a very clear communication to all families um, after spring break about our behavior expectations and different ways to support our students in terms of safety and security. And I appreciate you joining us after a succession of personnel changes. Um, now, um, I am trying to understand a couple of things. Now, first of all, um, we talk about e looking at the CEO program, collecting community feedback, and I'm, I'm wondering what any of our CEO officers were also involved in this process uh, at all? Um, I can say the level of involvement that I'm aware of um, involved allowing them to preview the uh, survey questions um, for the CEO survey. Um, as far as any level of community engagement collaboratively for listening sessions, uh, virtual sessions, et cetera, I don't believe that they were involved. Mm -hmm. I am um, wondering that um, when we evaluate a program, typically we hear from different stakeholders, we also will ask the people who conduct the program. Right, like this year we got a review of our staff development teacher. We asked students, teachers, administrator, and staff development teacher of their voices. So um, since we are going back to gather more community feedback, I want to ask, uh, also hear from their perspective, is the program working, right? Uh, or what's working and what's not working? Uh, I, I will appreciate that. And then, um, second question is, um, when we are looking at from system transition from a SRO program to a 21-22 CEO program, then to now currently the CEO 2.0 program that we have, um, is it time that we look at if um, not only looking at community feedback, but also looking at the uh, implementation, right? Because we went through so many changes. Are we consistent across the board all over all our 25 clusters? If we say they're supposed to be engaged with our clusters, that what are the opportunities there, and are we consistent across the board? If we say um, this and that according to the MOU, how are we really uh, following the MOU, right? And I think that will be uh, something of interest that I think I would like to know now. Um, and I'm looking at um, a packet that was presented to Montgomery County Council um, on October 23, 2023. I think it's right around the time Mr. Saif put out his um, resolution because he actually provide a very detailed data, breaking down data in each category. Uh, about incidents and what type of incidents, very detailed. So I know that we have this data. So I will appreciate that when we're looking at this year's data, we have a percentage, right? Uh, elementary school, middle, high. But I don't really know what, what, what type of cases I'm, I'm looking at. The students are saying bathroom, the students are saying fight, students are saying drugs. But does, do our data tell us 
uh, that. So I would really appreciate that. And one more question is, I think if we are truly, and I'm wondering, right, I have never seen this data. I've never seen any victimization data. And I always wonder, like, we, do we need to examine our safety and security measure? Like, how are they protecting our students? Who are we protecting? And who are we not protecting? Who do our measures work for? And who our measures have failed? Um, if we really want to look at being effective and look at it through an uh, equity lens, maybe we need to do a deeper examination of, uh, of what incidents are happening, where they are happening, to whom you know, um, they are happening, so that we need to can adjust our, um, uh, our safety and security measures. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know this is difficult work, but I appreciate everyone. Um, today, doing public comment, uh, the word reimagine is used. And I, I really would like to, I know that we have more presentations, so I, I'm really looking forward to that part of the presentation. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, um, uh, Ms. Ezefor Andrews has actually used the same word in some of our internal discussions as far as how do we shift the focus just from being responsive to being proactive and making sure that we are um, building relationships with these students and, um, you know, working with them to ad ad address the um, underlying causes and being supportive um, as well as obviously uh, disciplinary when that is appropriate. And just to make sure I'm understanding um, there's recommendations and budget budget needs at the end of the presentation. Yes, towards the end. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rivetta Evan. Um, thank you. I um. Okay, I don't know where to start. I'll start uh, on page seven when you um, the student voice data. So you. So you involve seventeen middle. Um, middle and high school across the county, right? So you didn't capture anything with elementary? No elementary. No. Okay. Um, what is the total of schools that we have between? 40 school? secondary schools from here. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then 352 students participated in this between the high school and the middle schools, That's correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you have a geographic breakdown? I do. Okay. Um, I, and, I, and I can share specifically the names of the school with you. Um, uh, in we an, can follow up. Yeah, we can mm -hmm. follow up. Um, but I do, I, we, had, we had three from Down County, four in Mid County, and three at the, at the um, up, up County. Up county. <laughs> I want to say High <laughs> County. <but it's> <laughs> <laughs> and what do you consider Up County? Like Gaysesburg all the way up? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Hold on one second. Let me just find that document for you. No, no, it's okay. Uh, you, you can follow up later. Yeah, it's, Gaith it's Gaithers. It's, uh, it includes Gaithersburg and Magruder and, and uh, Gaithersburg, Damascus, Clarksburg, mm -hmm. Poolsville, Germantown. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I have the names okay. of the school. Did you want to, you want me to? This one. Oh. This one. Okay. Um, okay, so. Okay, that, that would be helpful to have a, uh, a breakdown and how many were middle school and how many were high school, like the breakdown of... of Ten those. and seven. Right. Mm -hmm. um, just because we have thousands of students, so I just want to make sure. So I, I'm just going to be very honest. I'm, I'm a disappointed on this, on this report, because I don't think this was what we had asked for. And um, so we'll leave it at that. Um, but when you do the community engagement, that's the one that you only had 71 students, correct? Mm -hmm. um, on oh, oh, no, the survey? On the community the engagement of the, of the, the two-point feedback, oh, yeah. the 2.0 feedback. Um, 
So the question again I have for that is is the geographic areas where you got the engagement of community members because we know and maybe this is something for our partners from the police department that there's certain areas in our county that have a higher incidence of crime than others and we know there's areas like the Germantown area that is becoming uh, the other day we just had a drive-by shooting near Fox Chapel right and that's why I was asking about elementary school children because unfortunately we're seeing more and more cases around elementary schools where um, in my opinion it'd be important to capture how those kids feel as well um, but did did this is only discussion about the, the 2.0 feedback. You did you guys discuss at all SROs? This is not this is not 2.0. No, no, I'm talking about the community engagement. That will be uh, slide, slide nine. nine. Mm -hmm. It was only CEOs. Right. So, at any point, did you guys discuss SROs with the community? During the community engage the during the uh, community listening sessions. Uh, where we met with, um, we, went, we met virtually by high school clusters. We shared information about the CEO program and we showed them the difference between the SRO program of what they were familiar with in the past and, and what the CEO 2.0 program is. So we just, we showed them the difference. These listening sessions were more for um, informational purposes, giving them more information about what the CEO 2.0 uh, program is and um, that was the only comparison that was made during those conversations. Okay. So there was no feedback for, for the community to say, we'd rather have this or the other, no. okay, or the students. No okay, that right, that was, the, what, that was one of the requests that we made us to, to, to understand. Understand. Well, yeah, to understand what the community wanted, right? Because since we have them engage. Um, okay, so then if we go to slide number 10, Help me understand uh, this chart because I don't. Um, I, I know you have percentages, but out of what? What is the number? What is the base number that we're basing this out of? Two percent out of. I have this. Out of all here. incidents. But I, I want to know how many incidents. I want to know. Yeah, okay. that's that's. So we have the. Mm -hmm. the I'm sorry, the data here. Um, so we have the school type, the number of incidents, and the percentage of incidents reported. So at an elementary school level for the school year, um, we rep have a reported 145 incidents. At the middle school level, we have a report of 232 incidents. At the high school level, we have a report of 356 incidents. Um, at special schools, we have 16 incidents with a total of 749. And our percentages, 19% um, elementary school as listed there, 31% middle, 48 high. Um, our special schools, 2%, 2 totaling 100. Okay. At least for me, it will be helpful to know because it says categories that could impact school safety, mm -hmm. right? So from having been a mom, we in elementary school, kids used to bring butter knives to cut their apples, and that was considered a weapon, right? Um, and then you told the kid not to, you know, I mean, I, so for me, that doesn't really tell me a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So for me, it would be helpful to kind of break down because when you look for uh, the data, let's let's go forward to the arrest data. Where in 223 we had four arrests. I don't know what was in 220, 2022. There were 44 total, but how many were physical arrests? I don't I don't think I heard that. Um, so I can give you more information on the serious incident data. Okay. If, if this helps. Um, so for the elementary schools, um, in the categories of knives and other weapons, we have 30. Uh, false alarms and bomb threats for our elementary schools is 21, and trespassing is 17. Okay, um, for our middle schools, uh, for drugs and controlled substances, we have 45. Knives and other weapons, we have 34, and fighting is at 17. And then for our high schools, um, same categories, drugs and controlled substances, we have 63. Knives and other weapons is 34 and fighting is 28. Okay. So you had four arrests. 
where were those arrests compared to this? Were they high school, middle school? Like, where did you see the arrests, the four arrests that you're talking about? Oh, the two arrests in 2023, 24, right? Two arrests. Were they high school? Were they middle school? The two arrests was one middle school and one high school. Okay. If you can, at least for me, can, can you get us all that data? Because one of the things we keep hearing um, a lot is that there's so many arrests and over proportion of arrests, right? Um, but we have 100, over 160,000 students, and you had two arrests so far this, this year, right? This is till March, Correct. right? And then last year, you had a total of four for the whole school year, five, 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 of five. Five, five. What was the breakdown last year? What were, were they middle school or high school? Sorry, I don't have that data, okay. um, but we can um, get that for you. Okay. okay. Because I think that helps to tell the picture, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. of um, sometimes there are perceptions in the community that, that you know, we're arresting thousands of kids. But when you look at the data and what we really have, uh, it's a handful of kids. And I think it's helpful to know the ages, like not the ages, but their high school, their middle school, and how many arrests they were. Um, so for me, that kind of is, is, is like an important point. And going back to the engagement, I think we're going to have to do that again. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think that we're capturing. Um, and I appreciate that you guys got three schools up county, but up county is huge. Absolutely. And there's areas in up county that are really, like I have, kids who had to walk through a, a homicide scene, you know, in, in Up County, um, going to school, right? Um, I think I, I shared it with my colleagues. I had, I, I took a picture of, it was all this great stuff that they were doing, and then there was a, a wanted poster of somebody who had committed a crime in the neighborhood um, in elementary school. So for me, it's really important that we really capture the voices of those people that are affected. So when we talk about the victims of a lot of these, these incidents, so for me, it would be the data, the general data of the student leaders and so on. But usually, I would like to know the kids who are affected directly yeah, by the victims you know, of, of, um, of, of, of the crimes. Because if we see the arrest data or, or the incidents, at least we know that, um, you know, we had so many incidents in high school or so on. So if we can at least capture half the data of those students who were the victims and recipients of that crime, that would be a much better understanding for us to what we need to do. Does that make sense? I don't know. If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Um, that is actually was a discussion point of ours going through the process. Um, so definitely capturing um, input for, from our students that are victims of uh, some of these um, incidents that occur. Um, we definitely want to uh, make sure that we capture that. But in addition to that, students that also are not victims but are impacted by that in the same environment, um, it's very important for them, their voices to be heard um, as well. Um, Different incidents impact students in various ways, um, though they may not directly impact them. Hearing about it can be triggering. Being in that particular environment will have some level of impact and could impact their um, their learning experience. So I agree. And then you had something out of the Department of Juvenile Justice. That were, those were referrals from Juvenile Department of Juvenile Justice to yes. us. Okay. So for the other way, sorry, referrals from us to from us to them. Correct. Right. So. So for me, because I juvenile justice was one of the things, one of my passions earlier in my life, it be it would be also interesting to know uh, those kids that we are referring to juvenile justice, the services that they get, and then the, you know there's 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 incidents and there's serious incidents and there's very serious incidents that, that young people are charged with. It can range everything from attentive homicide to manslaughter to there's series of incidents, right? So one of the things that we keep hearing, or I keep hearing from, from principals, from parents and PTAs, is that 
sometimes they don't even know there's kids in their in their community that have been charged with very very serious incidents um so the relationship between the Department of Juvenile Justice, the state attorneys, Montgomery County Public Schools, and HHS, is there like a triage where everybody is on board kind of making sure that the safety of other students at the school and the safety of the teachers are also considered in some of those cases. Or when the kids are already adjudicated, right, they, 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 they go sometimes back to school. Um, so. And, and also understanding um, their perspective of what is it that there was a lot of drug charges, a lot of kids were selling drugs, right? So getting getting an getting an understanding of what it is that you have these young people, um, why they're selling drugs? What is you know what I mean? Like, is it economics? Is it because they have to pay rent? Is it you know so? So I think we have both ways to kind of better understand. So that's um, Ms. Rivera Oven. I just I, I thank you for highlighting that. Um, that is something I've been in discussion with my team about um, going through this process and and just being in in this position for a few months, one of the things that I believe um, that we want to do and we will do is examining root causes. Um, it's very easy to you know, report out the arrest data and say we need this, that, and the other, but there is a reason behind every action, um, and so that is something that we will be um, integrating uh, moving forward. Ms. Wolf, Ms. Harris, oh, uh, we need to move on to the next set of slides, so let's take these two questions. Yeah, I'm going to try to make this quick. I just wanted to understand the student voice data. Now, we have approximately at least 65 middle schools and high schools. I don't understand why there's 17 here that were that were students were drawn from. That's the first thing. That, the second thing I don't understand is 352 selected students. I always have a problem with hand-picked mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. I, I, getting back to our original request, we wanted students who were impacted by, um, by these decisions. But selected students always raises a red flag for me. Those are just co comments. I also wanted to know, right over here where you said you had 1,350 parents you have demographic data on those parents that participated in this. And then you said 476 staff. Well, we've got 25,000 staff and 476 participated. I'd be interested in knowing whether they were teachers, principals, whatever, and why the number was so low. Uh, and 71 students, again, I have, I have some concerns about 71 students, and we have 160 some, well, 155,000. Well, I don't even know how many are element, how many you take out for elementary schools, but however many are in high school and middle school, I know 71 is not it. Um, and the only other, the only real question I have is about incidents. Are you double counting, or are these single incidents, single kids, or are some of these repeats? Um, it could be a combination of the two. Um, I, I can find out, because um, we don't house that data, but I can find out and um, report back. Um, we do have some students that may repeat um, certain behaviors that's captured as a serious incident. Um, but in addition to that, we do have some students that may have committed a particular um, event uh, as a first time. Um, but we can, we can dig a little deeper into that data. I think, I think I asked you this before, so you could probably just recount if you've already answered it. And I'm, because I'm tired, I'll be honest. <laughs> I may not be listening. Um, just that quick, I forgot it. You're tired. Yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> I forgot it. I'll come back to it if I remember. Okay. Can I just add to, you know, with the serious incident data, I know that's um, uh, an important data point. It, it really, it, tracks the incidents, not necessarily the victims or the perpetrators of the way that, so to, to, the, to the question, it, it definitely could be repeat offenders because we're looking at the number of particular incidents, not the number of uh, victims or. Um, I know what my question was. 
were these incidents that happened in the school building or were these incidents that the police came to the school to arrest the kids for incidents that happened in the community because they knew they were going to be at the school on Monday morning? Mm. <clears throat> um, to my knowledge, uh, the majority of the incidents are what occurred in school. Um, I'm not sure if the data captures uh, any community-related incidents, but I don't believe that it does. Is that a capturing of community-related incidents? Mm -hmm. they, they had been, in previous years, coming to the school because they knew the, the child was going to be at school to arrest them. Oh, OK, them. I see what you're saying. But the incident that led to the arrest wasn't in the school okay. building. That's what I'm trying to understand. Okay. So I, I, I can speak to that. And um, I'll actually ask uh, Captain Satinsky to come down um, and provide a little bit more data around the rest. But we, well, I'll just let him come down and talk to it. So I think the question, the, at least the, the, the most recent question on the table was, uh, were these incidents started in the community and arrested at school, or did they start at the school? So first, thank you for having me. Jordan Stinsky, Captain, County Police, run the school resource, school resource or CEO program. And I understand you all have been here since 9 a.m., so I'll make it quick. <laughs> I, I, I overheard a bit about that. Um, so in previous years, to your point, Ms. Wolf, uh, in previous years, yes, when I was an investigator, we did utilize the then EFO, then SRO, then whatever it was, uh, to track down suspects, but only usually of major incidents, sexual assaults, rapes, homicides, that we would use that are aggravated assaults. Uh, in the last, to the time that I've been here over the last just about two years, uh, we have made great strides in not doing that. Mm -hmm. We even try not to do it for incidents that occur in the school unless it is happening right in front and there's a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you of the times that we've had our officers just in the last, and I'll just use this calendar off the top of my head, from what I remember from talking uh, to Michelle and such, I think we've done it twice, and that's it. We've come to a school, and one time was for a carjacking, uh, where they had the undercover officers had actually gone out to the person's house several times trying to find them. And believe it or not, of all the places they went, the only place this kid went was school. He didn't go anywhere else. He went to school, and that was it. And the other one was a homicide. So that was the only two times they did that, to my knowledge, for this calendar year. And again, I believe it was this calendar year. And again, it was only as a last-ditch effort. And we've put some controls in place on the county police side where if that's going to happen, they call me, I talk to Michelle, and we work with the principal of that building directly to make sure it happens. As a matter of fact, in the one that I can recall happened in the northwest corner of the county, it went very smoothly. And as a matter of fact, nobody even knew what happened, which is exactly what we're striving for, right, because we don't want to put anybody out. Regardless of what the person's wanted for, we're not trying to make them look uh, bad. Everyone's innocent until proven guilty. So that's how we're trying to keep it. Uh, and so that, that's where this comes from, to Mr. Hull's question. Thank you. Well, is that the only part of it? Sorry. Broken down? Can we get this data broken down by school so we know how many incidents in any particular school? Are you talking about for me or for them? I, I, it would be for I'm us. Um, yes, be. we can do that, Ms. Um, Wolf. And we All can provide right. that as a, a follow-up. So it would be a ranking kind of of all our schools? Yes. That's what I'm looking for. Ready. Thank you. Uh-huh. Ms. Harris. Yeah, and I mean, I can to testify to, um, I was actually doing a shadow day at RM uh, in November 18th with Sammy uh, when they had an arrest, had to come in and arrest a student, and we didn't know it happened either. So, um, but uh, uh, my question goes, I want us to be really careful. When we talked early on in the presentation, somebody mentioned um, the robust uh, restorative justice program. Um, I don't believe that is an accurate characterization. Um, just on the f April 2nd uh, strategic planning meeting, we were looking at this very thing. We've still got 10% of our schools listed as reactive, which means basically they have no restorative justice happening. And 64% uh, are early. 23% um, are intermediate, and only 3% are considered mature. So that is not having a robust program of restorative justice throughout the system. And I think that's in part because we haven't really been able to make those investments because we know it works when it's well done with restorative justice specialists. So um, I want to be clear because the information I'm interested in is if we can triangulate the data, looking at where incidents are happening in relationship to what is that school status when it comes to restorative justice. Is it reactive? Is it early? Is it intermediate? Is it mature? Because I don't want to assume anything about that. But I do think that will tell us some really interesting information. Um, and I do appreciate, um, I think my, data, my colleagues have already asked for a lot of things. I, I would be interested to know specifically, and um, Ms. Wolf got to this a bit, looking at the arrest data for this year. And again, we're only three quarters of the way through the school year, and yet we're at higher levels than we have the past two complete school years. Um, but how many of these arrests, w whether they are uh, physical or referrals, are uh, for the same student more than one time? 
Are these in 62 individuals, or is this like 15 that have had multiple incidents? Right. So having that data, I think, will be helpful. And then the last thing I'll mention is that, um, and I shared this article with several of you and my colleagues, um, the, uh, one of the um, uh, Maria Sofronos, the uh, editor-in-chief of the Wooten Common Sense, wrote an article um, in, the, in, in their school paper in which she highlighted going to five different schools during the lunch hour, seeing how easy it would be for her as a non-student of that school to gain entry. And it was very interesting and telling. And I think one of the, um, first of all, shout out to Rockville that seems to have it all going on. Um, but um, it was interesting to see, you know, it's a very different situation. So we've got open lunch, which is a kind of a Wild West situation in high schools. But um, when a school, high school has portables, and so you have to have students coming and going in and out of the building all day long um, versus a school like Wooten that has no portables. Um, and so what is so that there's a difference there. Um, Rockville High School, I don't think they have any portables, but you know, RM does, Northwood does, Blair does. So you have students and the regular course of business during the day have to come and go. And so how are the schools who have to deal with those differing circumstances handling the security issues of, of a student maybe somebody that shouldn't be in that school mixing in with the flow um, as students are coming, going to different entrances um, because they have to, to get to a portable to go to class. So that's another issue for us to kind of, I think, bear in mind when we're talking about safety and security in schools. Absolutely, so, thank you. Um, I think we've made this request for data on restorative justice, but if we haven't, I'd like to make it a formal follow-up we would like to see the names of the schools in each of the categories, as Ms. Uh, Harris said, reactive, early, intermediate, and mature. What schools are where? And triangulated with incident data. Thank you. Was it, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, uh, no. OK. we got to go. OK. <laughs> well, mine, mine's going to be a really quick question. I just, um, you know, I appreciate um, the work that you guys have done on this. Very disappointed as well in the numbers of people. I had heard, I don't know where you're getting the number of parents, but I'd heard only like 28 or 30 people showed up to the uh, forum things, and I obviously was not there, so I don't know. My question is, though, I mean, I actually, I have to say, I'm a little embarrassed. I don't know what your background is. But have we considered looking at an expert in this field um, to help put together not just positive or, you know, f complete and accurate um, data broken down the way that best suits the work that we want to do as a school system and uh, makes recommendations. And I know you've got the community, but I'm not sure how many of those people are security experts either. So. So um, thank you, Ms. Mandronski, for mentioning that. Um, that is going to be part of our discussion when we talk about the um, recommendations, but it is something that um, I have suggested um, in order for us to really navigate this new landscape that we're in with security, we will need to engage subject matter experts just to make sure we're capturing our data properly and that the practices that we are, are exercising are, are in alignment to the needs of our students. So I, I completely agree with that, and that is a need. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Because I was going to say, we got a lot of responses for the calendar, so maybe there are dif just different ways that we need to uh, get people engaged in this conversation with us. Thank you. Can we move on, Ms. Yang? Can you hold your question? Uh, thank you. Let's move on, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we're now gonna be talking about um, our community of practice. Um, and as part of our process of safety and security um, reimagining, um, a community of practice was formulated um, after um, give, being uh, given a charge by the board um, some several months ago. Um, as part of our ongoing commitment to enhancing safety and security measures across all schools within our district, um, our office ensured the involvement of subject matter experts um, to provide invaluable insight and expertise. The slides list the various groups and community partners who were invited to participate and to contribute to the work, um, specifying the uh, specific partners that were available to participate. Um, we had representation from MCCPTA, NAACP, 1977, Two Action Group, 
McCat McBoa, McBoa, MCEA, MCPD, Maryland Center for School Safety, um, for Maryland Center for Safe Schools, apologies, um, and Montgomery County Health and Human Services, various departments there. Um, Charles County Public Schools, Howard County Public Schools, um, Montgomery County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, and several members of um, our MCPS team, which included OSSWB, um, principals, teachers, school-based security staff, um, and our, um, our, our chief uh, medical officer's um, office as well. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so from within our community of practice, um, we formulated two subgroups or um, um, subgroups within our community of practice, um, which focused on um, two um, areas. Um, the first was risk assessment and planning, and the other was information technology and infrastructure. We also identified a need to create subgroups for mental health and well-being, um, as well as account accountability and restoration. However, we found that in our engagement that these two focus areas are currently being discussed in other engagement groups within MCPS. Um, the risk assessment and planning entails um, assessing potential risk and formulating strategies to mitigate them effectively. Um, the primary goal of this particular group is to ensure safety and security of individuals, assets, and the environment. And we have our list of key focus, um, key areas of focus, um, as you see on the screen. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so our next subgroup um, is uh, titled Information, Technology, and Infrastructure. Um, so this group uh, basically focused on prioritizing the utilization of technology and the optimization of infrastructure um, to bolster safety and security measures within our organization. And those are our uh, key areas of focus. Okay, next slide, please. And so here we'll begin with the um, community of practice recommendations that came out. Um, these recommendations are um, from our SMEs and encompass various components aimed at enhancing uh, safety and security measures across uh, MCPS. Um, first, we'll be begin with the focus on ensuring uh, uniformity and proficiency in the application of our student code of conduct amongst administrative staff at all schools. Additionally, the recommendation is to prioritize an annual dissemination of updates regarding the student code of conduct to students and their families. Furthermore, there's a call to evaluate existing protocols governing suspension and expulsion procedures to guarantee equitable treatment. This is inclusive of a thorough examination of protocols addressing critical issues such as fights, weapons, and truancy. Moreover, our subject matter experts encouraged and promoted student involvement in reporting any suspicious concerns or activities through various channels, including the use of social media platforms and also promoting our Safe Schools tip line. Um, by fostering a culture of awareness account and accountability, the aim is to create a safer and more secure learning environment for all of the members of our school community. The next subject matter expert recommendation is regarding our visitor management protocols. In the domain of training and reinforcement, it was recommended that we prioritize consistency in the implementation of our visitor management protocols across all schools and also our non-school-based facilities. Additionally, the implementation of system-wide IDs for both students and staff members is recommended with a mandatory requirement for these IDs to be worn while on school property for any event. This measure enhances the accountability and helps to swiftly identify individuals within the premises, contributing to a safer and more controlled environment for all. Next slide, please. Okay, so next on our list is going to talk about um, our security operations, which we also title Overhaul of Security Operations. So our subject matter experts proposed that our office, also Office of System-Wide Safety Emergency Management, um, look at an opportunity to oversee school-based security staff to ensure proficiency in training and practices, thus fostering a consistent and effective approach across all schools. This effort would be implemented in collaboration with our principals and also OSSWB. Additionally, targeted training sessions focusing on strategies such as proper de-escalation, trauma-informed practices, and restorative approaches are suggested to be conducted annually to equip security school-based security staff with the necessary skills for handling diverse situations. 
Furthermore, to adequately support safety initiatives, this is a recommendation, there is a recommendation for a significant increase in school-based staffing across all levels, elementary school, middle school, and high school, ensuring sufficient personnel to maintain security effectively throughout all of our educational institutions. Also to bolster security operations within our educational institution, the introduction of our, we termed it, security operations managers are recommended. These individuals would particularly undergo enhanced certifications as special police officers, as a certification in an unarmed capacity. By integrating these individuals as part of security staffing, we aim to address the current challenges stemming from police shortages, which impact our ability to effectively support the significant increase in school-based incidents. The availability of this cert these individuals, also known as SPOs, will be instrumental in preventing and responding to such incidents, potentially minimizing the need for direct police involvement as a first-line measure. Moreover, the presence of these individuals will contribute to fostering positive relationships with our police partners, educators, and youth, thereby cultivating a more positive school climate. These security operations managers will also serve as a valuable resource complementing the role of our leadership in maintaining safety and security throughout our educational institutions. Next slide, please. Okay, so our um, next recommendation involves uh, funding. Um, so finally, uh, recommendations were made concerning budget. Um, to sustain safety and security operations effectively, it is imperative to continue, I'm sorry, it, to, to sustain safety and security operations effectively, it is imperative to secure adequate funding, um, particularly throughout our, our department office of system-wide safety and emergency management on an annual basis. Um, this ensures the continuity of es essential security measures across our educational institutions. Additionally, it's recommended to establish budget line items for each school guaranteeing a minimum allotment of funds specifically dedicated to pur purchasing additional security items such as cameras and access control card readers. This proactive approach enables schools to address their unique security needs promptly and effectively. <coughs> Moreover, while grant funding can be supplemented as existing resources, it has been advised to utilize it as a secondary funding source rather than a primary funding source. By prioritizing sustainable funding streams, we can ensure the long-term effectiveness and stability of our safety and security initiatives. Next slide. And we're almost done. <laughs> okay, thank you. The next set of recommendations uh, will focus specifically on technology. Um, it is recommended by our subject matter experts to implement weapons detection systems at schools to assist in mitigating potential threats. Additionally, enhancing camera surveillance is crucial. It was recommended that additional cameras be installed at all schools to cover critical areas such as blind spots, stairwells, front offices, parking lots, et cetera, which were areas that have been identified by numerous schools in our engagement. Um, our subject matter experts also advise that it is necessary to also update outdated camera systems system-wide to improve overall security. Um, to ensure sustainability, it's recommended that the installation of new cameras and their maintenance become a standard budgetary item managed through various funding streams, such as enterprise funds, ID to, IT departments, schools directly, or through our Office of System-Wide Safety and Emergency Management. Additionally, to fortify access control measures, it's recommended to install additional access card readers at all exterior doors of schools. It is also advised that door alarms be added to each door to prevent door propping and enhance school security. Additionally, upgrading radios, the school radios that are used for emergencies and other measures of communications, it's recommended that we update uh, our current analog radios to digital radios to better enhance our communications. And furthermore, uh, one particular area that is of challenge at many schools that students report is the cell connectivity. So a recommendation to look at um, purchasing uh, cell repeaters was given by our group as well. 
In terms of crisis management, it's also suggested to explore incorporating advanced technology um, that will be housed in the Office of System-Wide Safety and Emergency Management. This technology can aid in documenting and responding to critical incidents, supporting 24-hour operations, and enhancing our overall security measures. The final set of recommendations are related to emergency response protocols. For keys and locks, the subject matter experts concluded that it is imperative to, to establish a physical key map process at all schools, facilitating their use by police partners during emergencies. Regarding bomb threats, the, the group advised that it's essential to ensure that evacuation protocols align with FBI guidance, especially for low-level threats. This alignment enhances the effectiveness of response efforts and helps to mitigate risks associated with such threats. It is also recommended to reevaluate our current shelter and lockdown procedures, considering the adoption of common language aligned with local police department and departments in other school districts. Um, it's imperative to note that updating terminology can assist with minimizing confusion among students, staff, parents, and our community partners, and it also will aid in minimizing anxiety when you hear the word lockdown versus shelter, et cetera. Another recommendation that came about was to look at the opportunity to evaluate our current open lunch policy um, to ensure that it aligns with our current safety standards and best practices. Furthermore, organizing um, our annual student and staff safety trainings before the start of the school year has been recommended. Our subject matter experts advise that it is essential to equip students and staff with the necessary skills and knowledge to effectively uh, respond to potential threats or emergencies. To address challenges related to drugs and controlled substances in schools, it's recommended to explore comprehensive protocols aimed at combating these issues effectively. This includes implementing awareness and prevention campaigns to educate our student and staff about the risk associated with substance abuse. It is advised that collaborative partnerships with community organizations, our law enforcement partners, and our health care providers can also play a crucial role in addressing this issue collectively. Finally, our subject matter experts recommended the development of a defined policy of substance collection, detection, and testing, outlining clear procedures for handling suspected incidents and ensuring accountability. In terms of communications, our subject matter experts advise that it is crucial to evaluate the procedures between schools and central office to ensure efficient and effective communication channels. This includes reviewing messaging procedures during and after emergencies to ensure consistency and transparency, which are essential for maintaining trust and confidence within our school communities. Finally, there was recommend, a recommendation uh, for a safety and security audit. It is recommended that we hire a third-party consultant to conduct an internal audit or assessment of our practices every three to five years. This periodic review ensures the relevancy of practices in addressing current safety concerns and supporting the evolving needs of students. By leveraging external expertise, schools can identify potential vulnerabilities and implement necessary improvements to enhance overall safety and security measures. This concludes the recommendations brought forth by our subject matter experts who participated in our community of practice. The proposed measures aim to create a safe and secure, safe and supportive environment that promotes the student well-being and academic success. Next, I will present to you the recommendations from our office based on what has been shared with you here today regarding overall assessments, recommendations, various data analysis, and voice data collected since this board's adopted since the board's adoption of the Safe Schools Resolution in October. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so here we're gonna um, talk about our short-term recommendations um, to be implemented within six to 12 months. So we've gained a lot of insight regarding the current state of, state of safety and security through multi multiple measures. We've had the privilege of engaging with our students, our staff, parents, and community partners, and subject matter experts, which have revol resulted in the following set of recommendations by our office. In the next six to two months, we recommend implementing system-wide ID requirements for both students and staff to improve access control and identification processes. Conducted, conducting targeted security trainings to equip staff with necessary skills for handling diverse security situations effectively. 
We also recommend reviewing the current CEO memorandum of understanding to ensure alignment with the current safety standards and best practices at our schools. Additionally, there's a call for reevaluating the student re emergency response protocols, particularly evacuation procedures, to ensure that they are up to date and effective in minimizing potential threats. Communication protocols for students, families, and community partners should also be reassessed um, to ensure timely and transparent communications during emergencies. Furthermore, the formation of our a Student Safety Advisory Committee is proposed to provide a platform for student input and engagement in safety initiatives. Collaborating, collaborating with internal and external partners to campaign for drug awareness and prevention is essential and recommended to properly address substance abuse issues within the school community. Lastly, there's a recommendation to reevaluate the open lunch policy to consider its impact on safety and security within the school premises. It is anticipated that all of the rec mentioned recommendations will be initiated by the beginning of the school year. Next, I will present our long-term recommendations. Next slide, please. Thank you. To address safety and security concerns, we propose several long-term key recommendations to be implemented in the next 12 to 24 months. First, evaluating opportunities to integrate weapons detection is crucial to prevent po potential threats within the school premises. Additionally, in partnership with OSSWB and principals, we recommend seeking opportunity to realign oversight of school-based security staff under Office of System-Wide Safety and Emergency Management to enhance consistency of standard operating procedures across all schools. Moreover, increasing school-based staffing across elementary, middle, and high schools is essential to bolster security measures and provide adequate support. Enhancing security certifications for staff members is also advisable to improve their preparedness and response capabilities. Furthermore, we recommend allocating funding support uh, for technology advancements in schools to help facilitate the implementation of modern security systems and tools to be utilized. Lastly, conducting regular internal audits of, audits of safety and security practices with the assistance of a third-party consultant every three years will ensure the continuous improvement and adherence to best practices. We are still researching these enhancements, but as of now, the total estimated cost is $19.1 million. Next slide, please. With that, I bring to a close our presentation on the latest safety and security updates. I would like to take a note that the landscape of the safety and security uh, world or realm that we're in now continues to change and evolve over time. As a result, it is critical to address these gaps strategically to assist with mitigating all hazards and vulnerabilities. Though we have our short and long-term long recommendations, we will need to continue to remain proactive in our approaches to address challenges within school safety and security. This will require the continuation of our work to include the need for ongoing partnerships and student engagement. While addressing the mentioned short and long-term goals, a district-wide multi-year strategic plan will need to be developed in support of the work that needs to be fulfilled. I extend my sincere gratitude for your time and attention throughout this entire session. Um, at this time, um, I will turn it over to you, members of the board, um, to make time for any questions or comments that you have. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Um, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I just, you know, got to give uh, uh, Mr. Saeed another shout out. I think a lot of this work got started uh, with him. Really appreciate his work to engage students, but we need you to do more. <laughs> or we need to get him to help us do more. Absolutely. Because I think my Good colleagues have made like clear from this was inadequate mm -hmm. student engagement on many of these core questions. Um, and I did just want to I, I did just want to highlight that um, during public comment today, Mr. Ribeiro made a point of indicating that he was a member of the PTA at Kennedy High School. He was on the safety and security community practice. He did not find that to be a good experience, and I would like to understand why. Um, he's clearly felt like yeah. the, some, many of the things that the group wanted to accomplish, they just were not able to. So um, I would very much appreciate mm -hmm. that. And then um, um, I would appreciate the opportunity, if we're doing it, and I know some of us had this conversation before, to, to take a look at some of this technology that we're looking at that, that was recommended in action in other schools, like the, the weapons detection systems. I would like to see how that works because um, we want to 
see how the operations go and how um, disruptive they may or may not be to just getting into the school at the beginning of the day and that kind of thing. Um, and then um, um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out. I know we're not going to do the legislative update today because we're running over time, but um, uh, this year, HB 416, the active shooter drill bill, which is one that this board took strong action to support a year ago, it didn't make it through last year, but it did this year. And um, it includes in it a requirement that the Maryland Center for Safe Schools develop model content on Maryland gun safety laws for all LEAs to distribute. MCPS has been saying for three years now that we partner with organizations like Everytown to distribute that kind of information. It's not happening in our schools. It's critical information for parents and families and everyone to understand. And also, I would think, you know, they, they just made, they made precedent in Michigan just this week holding the parents of Dylan Crumley accountable for his ability to access guns. And so making sure that our Maryland, our Maryland families understand if they own them, their obligations keep them locked, keep them safe. And MCPS is in a unique position to help ensure that messaging gets out to all of our families. And that is just one more way we can help keep people safe. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Um, so I can um, start off with the um, community of practice and the public comments. Um, in full transparency, as part of what uh, Brian mentioned, part of the challenge that we had was the transition over. I was coming in. Um, we had previous leadership. And um, the vision uh, of, of what the group started off as didn't necessarily end that way. And so um, there was bits and pieces of information in terms of really being able to capture what your requests were. Um, during that transition, I stepped in and, and took over, and so I strategically tried my best to reshape it. Um, I, I will say in agreement, um, in full transparency, I do believe that the community of practice um, could have gone a lot better. Um, and and, and we, we still have some work to do, um, so I'm not going to deny that. Um, I will say what did help as a strategy was uh, taking some, getting, gathering feedback from those that participated to formulate these subject matter experts subgroups. So that helped us to steer uh, ourselves into a particular direction. So it did start off rocky. Um, but we were able to stabilize ourselves and at least uh, capture something um, to be able to present to you. I will say as part of our ongoing work and future work, that is a, a model that we need to reevaluate and do so effectively. And part of that is uh, engaging the appropriate subject matter experts to make sure that what we're starting off with, what we need to start off with, and what we're capturing fits the model of what we're looking for. So I, um, I agree, um, and um, we will do our due diligence um, to make sure that uh, the next level of engagement that we have is purposeful for our members, because they did take out time out of their day consistently to make themselves available. Um, and it, it's, it was important for us to even recognize them. So we own it. Um, we will do better um, to make sure that we fix that. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, um, talking about the technology and seeing what's out there, um, as part of our um, assessment, we did benchmark with other school districts as it relates to things like weapons detection, um, the different types of technologies that are out there. I will say as part of our assess assessment and engagement um, as a system and for our system to be as, as large as it is, there is great opportunity to enhance ourselves and enhance our, our, our methodologies. A lot of the... Um, processes that we have in place right now involves a lot of manual labor, um, and it's time consuming, and there's room for error. Um, if we do enhance ourselves in the area of technology, we will be able to better prevent and mitigate a lot of things. And you know, um, the one thing that, that I, I would love to see our district in terms of safety and security be in that, our posture is to make a lot more data-driven decisions um, and use the data that we have to be proactive and, and, and be more preventative, uh, prepare, um, anticipate, monitoring trends, um, and get on the front end of things versus uh, being in a, a capacity to respond. So um, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said. Um, and again, we will, we will work on that. Thank you. And uh, to your point about safe gun storage, safe weapon storage, um, Ms. Webb, if you could follow up. I had sent some a request. I think there's a new toolkit that Secretary Cardona mm -hmm. and President Biden have put together for schools mm -hmm. and principals. And I asked that our communications office take a look at that in terms of how we can distribute it to 
principals and schools. So if you could just follow up to see where we are with that, I'd appreciate it. And I, I believe wholeheartedly in that prevention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Prevention is, it's is key. key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ms. Wolf? Yes, I attended a briefing at Blake High School last Friday on safety and security, as you know. And one of the um, thoughts they had I thought was really important for us, and it's about crisis communication and um, putting out information several times a year about how we approach that, because they're thinking that a lot of the time the negative feedback we get is because people have certain expectations. So if we set out the expectation about what you're going to get and how you're going to get it and maybe when you're going to get it at the beginning of the school year, before they go on Christmas break or, or whatever holiday they celebrate, when they come back from that holiday, when they go on spring break, the, those times are very important to, to restate in people's mind this is how it has to be. At times, you will not get information because of whatever. But you, you were at the meeting. You understand what I was saying. So I think that's something that we really should consider doing because I think it would be helpful for parents just to hear, you're not going to get the whole story because we want the truth to get out there. We don't want a lot of falsehoods to be spread around. So that's all I really had to say. Thank you. I, I had really a lot of problems, you know, with the community of practice because, like Lynn, I sent you what Mr. Ribeiro said, and I thought that he laid out very well the, the, the concerns around the way that whole process went. So thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can just add, um, you mentioned the communication. So um, that, uh, amongst all other things, you know, we can talk about the weapons detection and all of that stuff, but the communications piece is a gap um, that can be enhanced. And one of the particular um, areas that I would like us to focus in as an office is who does what? Um, and you were talking about communicating that to the public. Where does the communication come from? Who does it come from? How does it come? Why does it come? How frequent? And so when we did our benchmarking with some other school districts, um, some of the models they had is start, middle, finish. So there is an initial communication that's gen maybe generic. It's letting the parents know that something is going on, may not have all the details, but you're saying in the messaging, there's a current situation going on in the community. Um, please be advised, students have been, you know, put in a shelter, et cetera, even defining what a shelter is in that, in that situation and giving parents also instructions as well. Um, some school districts also message community partners, uh, message neighboring businesses so that they are aware. Um, and then midway, there's a communication to parents of letting them know that there's, an, there's you know, where they are in the process, and then there's a closeout. And so um, that is a model that we are looking at um, to enhance um, in partnership with OSSWB. So just wanted to mention that that, that is an area that, that we can modify. A lot. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight, though, the fact that they want it out several times during the school year. I yes. think that is the key Absolutely. to let people know what to expect. And if I recall correctly, and I'm trying to recall without my notes, um, the question is whether the central office should do that or whether the principal should do that. Thank you. Correct. Um, in some of the school districts that we benchmark with, the initial messaging that goes out to the community um, and to the students, et cetera, comes from central office. And so that was, we didn't want to put everything on the slides, but that was part of the recommendation to reevaluate who it comes from first, um, especially um, the challenges that our principals are in, in the midst of an emergency, having to pause to send out messaging or having a designee send out messaging, which is the current model now. Um, it's effective in some cases, and depending on the severity severity of the situation, um, they may not be able to get to that. And so um, we need to reevaluate how we can support them better in terms of the communications. Thank you. Mr. Said. Uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible. I know, you know, we're trying to speed things up. But as you all know, I'm very passionate about this topic. And, and I, I do have a lot to say. Uh, first, I, I do want to thank you guys for your hard work. I mean, you came into a situation that was extremely complex, extremely difficult. And as Mr. Hole alluded to uh, earlier, the, the ground is really shifting under our feet. And we understand that. And um, I just want to reiterate one thing before I start is the importance of a student advisory group. 
we need to be meeting with students who are the victims of this, and we also need a continual student group that is advising um, our, our actions on all of this. But with that being said, I'm going to be you know, very honest and blatant about my thoughts. We are moving way too slow on safety. We are moving way too slow. It's a non-negotiable safety because when we look at it, it's students' lives at risk. I mean, look at what happened at Magruder three years ago. I mean, when we talk about the safety discussion, it's very different from other topics because literally people's lives are at risk. And so when I made my resolution six months ago, I did that purposely six months ago because I wanted to see the recommendations I had at least be started by this point. And what I have to say is that resolution, I mean, we look at the community of practice, a lot of the things in my resolution addressed exactly that. It said the same exact thing six months ago. The date, all, all, of the, all of the outcomes, all the solutions we're talking about now on, on April 11th, I had there in my resolution on October 23rd. And so, you know, I, I went to students, I communicated with them. We knew six months ago exactly what we had to do. And I, I do have to express I'm disappointed that we weren't able to start faster. I, 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 you know, I appreciate the hard work you've done, but we need to start faster. Things like the student ID pilot. We already had that at multiple high schools. Uh, a year and a half ago, we had it at multiple high schools. And we, we come a year and a half later, and nothing has been moved forward on that. And to me, that's unacceptable. That is something I put in there strategically because it doesn't cost money. All it is is we say we're going to put a security guard at the door and check student IDs. It's a policy change. It's that simple. The, the training for students and security staff, I wanted to have something in place for that as before the year ended, at least for students. Expanding knowledge about anonymous tip lines. Mon having a plan to monitor bathrooms. When we look at the student voice data, we know exactly what students are saying. The fights are getting out of hands. The bathrooms are not being monitored, all this. But then we're saying, okay, by, by next year, we're going to start. No, not by next year, but now we need to address it. These things should have been addressed six months ago, and now we're saying it's going to be next year. When I made that resolution, I told students across the county, this will bring, bring change now. Before April 11th, I am, I'm going to say we have to do it now, so by April 11th, we'll have an update, and it hasn't been done. And so I just want to express that I, I seriously am disappointed. Just yesterday, I put out a questionnaire to students and said, what questions would you want me to ask about safety and security at MCPS? The number one thing they said was literally, why is nothing being done? That's what they told me. Students believe nothing is happening. And I mean, I know that's a communication you know, issue as well as an action issue, but that's what students are saying. And so I'm going to give a, a few things, I think, you know, w reiterating some of the previous comments, I think we have to do better. And then I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, the first thing is being proactive, not reactive. I mean, this is an issue I know the system as a whole has, but in safety, too many times an issue will occur and then we'll address it. And I think with this resolution, it's kind of a clear example because I said, this is what students are saying. I put it at the table. The board voted to pass it. We know what the problems were, and now we haven't implemented Let's be proactive. Let's start implementing these things before it gets out of hand. I go to Richard Montgomery. There were three times a gun was brought into our building. I was walking around in the hallways when someone with a loaded firearm in their backpack was walking around as well. This happened months ago, and, and, and still... I feel like this ID pilot that we need to be putting in all high schools, it's not been moving yet. So we need to be proactive. Two is communication. Not just communication during safety incidents, which I think we, we need to overhaul that, that policy. We need to be really proactive on that. But communication about what we're doing with our community. You know, we need to be telling them consistently. I mean, I, I actually really appreciate the email that went out to our com community, but there needs to be more than one email. You know, there needs to be town halls consistently. There needs to be newsletters. There needs to be things going out consistently because I, I see students, I see middle school, sixth grade students who are saying they don't feel safe coming to school. We, we need better communication. And at the board level, I think that this is a topic we need to be hearing about at least three times a year. Uh, I, I think it was Ms. Wolf, you raised the point early on in the year, which is, you know, why are we hearing about safety in April? We need to hear about safety at the start of the year to know where we're at, in the middle of the year to know improvements, and at the end of the year around now to know where we're at. Not because... I want to make these changes now, but I feel like it's April 11th, and now I have to say, oh, now let's try and get these before the end of the school year. We need to be October 1st. Okay, here's where we're at. Here's the instances that happened this first month. What do you guys want to do? Mid-year, we implemented those. What else do you want to do before the end of the year? And then implement those, and then here report back. And I, I know that's a board-level thing, but we need to be talking about this more. We also have to have more transparent data reporting. The, the, the information you gave us here when we asked about it, that should be in the slides, the number, not just the percentages, but those numbers, they have to be in the slides. Because if one of us didn't ask about it, the community wouldn't have known, and I wouldn't have known that number, and that number is extremely important. 
because that could be 10,000 incidents and that could be 10 incidents. There's, that percentage gives you nothing on that. And so we need that information. I think that that's an overarching issue with the system is we have to ask for things to get them, but we should be getting those things straight up. So I, I know that that was, that was a lot. But I, I, as being really passionate about this topic, and I, honestly, I, I feel sort of embarrassed a little bit that I told students in October, guys, there will be change. I'll update you in April. And I, there hasn't. And, and that's really disappointing to me because students were really counting on this. And I know that in those, those voice groups, you said a lot of students were familiar with this work. That's, that's really great to hear. But now I'm going to have to tell them, well, nothing has been done yet. And that hurts. That really hurts. So uh, here's a few questions that I have that students have told me that I really think are important to ask. So the biggest thing I've heard that has been happening for two years really badly in the system and that has been increasing is fights in our schools, as we know. Fights in middle schools consistently all the time. I want to know what specifically is being done to address fighting, very specifically. Because we can hear all these overarching things, but I want to be able to tell students who are telling me every single day on social media, there's a fight, there's a fight, I don't feel safe. What exactly are we doing? And if we're not doing anything now, how, what's our action plan for addressing fighting in schools specifically? Because I mean, that is scary. We've had, I think it was, you said 28 serious incidents that were a result of fighting, serious fights. And that doesn't even count the ones that are just altercations in the hallways, like the ones I see all the time when I'm trying to go to class. So. What exactly are we doing around that, just so I have something to tell the students? Okay, so I can um, speak on, from I guess from Office of System-wide Safety and Emergency Management. Um, one of the things um, that I will say as far as staffing is concerned, we have been looking at our staffing models at the school to see how we could support. Um, right now, um, we do know that there are some schools that have security staff that are on leave. Um, we have been placing um, temporary part-time staff at the schools to support. Um, and most recently, we have been in engagement with um, OSSWB to evaluate how we could support the students a lot better with these uh, challenges that they might be having and to determine the why uh, behind it. Um, we've also been engaging with our um, police partners as well. Um, to find out the why. Um, some of these um, issues that we have found um, recently are challenges that are stemming from the community that are coming into the schools, uh, per se. That's been, honestly, a lot of what's been going on um, at various schools. So I can't really speak too much for um, OSSWB. I will say that um, we've been in extensive conversations with them to come up with a plan to assist in combating that. Um, and that, that is all I have um, to say to that. I do want to um, address uh, the points that you have shared, um, Sammy. Um, I wholeheartedly agree, and um, I believe that what you said um, is correct. Um, and you've kept, you're representing the student voice. Um, and I will say that um, the student voice is a priority, and we have, we have our work cut out for us. Um, but as you said, safety and security is not something that you wait on. It's something that you move on quickly. Um, so I will say with that, as we are built and how our system is, um, our shop can't do it alone. Um, we have to do it in collaboration. We are having the conversations consistently reaching out um, because the plan that we need to come up with is not one that is siloed. It can't be one that is siloed. We need to engage the right people. And so whatever we come up with, be it a short-term plan that we implement right away or a long-term, it has to be right. We have to get it right. Um, and the model that we're using may be dated and it's not working anymore. Um, so I agree with you. Um, I acknowledge everything that you said. And, and I'm giving you my personal commitment that we are going to get this right. I, I seriously appreciate that. And, mm -hmm. I, and I didn't want to mean this as kind of, you know, badgering you. No, no, no. It, it, it's, it's a thought okay. of the process. I know you guys are working so hard. And I know you guys seriously walked into a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And I pre and that's really what I just want to have is that personal commitment. Because sure. I'm going to be gone in three months, very sadly. Mm -hmm. So at the start of next school year in September, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to sit at this board table and hear an update. I understand. But I, I really, 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 really do hope that by September, October, mm -hmm. We have, we have that student ID pilot. We have that training for students ready for them. Because the day that that headline, headline comes out, that there was a serious incident, God forbid, a shooting at our school, we are going to be coming back to this moment and saying, what did we do Correct. wrong? 
Correct. And we, I just don't want that to happen because it's seriously, uh, you know, I helped host a walkout against gun violence two years ago because I was genuinely terrified something like that would happen. And I, I just want to make sure it's not. So I, I seriously do appreciate that. And I know you guys are working very hard, but I just wanted to express that because I feel a lot of the time if we're not clear and strict, things, things don't happen. And not specifically in safety, I'm saying overarching. So that's one thing. And then um, I'm just going to ask this other question just so I can be brief so we can get out of here. I'm not going to ask a million questions. I think this one is more for, for you, Mr. Hole. The, the vape detectors, we, we piloted that a year ago. Uh, we, we know, I, as far as I know, the companies that worked, well, we know that we need those in our schools. Students are asking me every day, like, I can't use the bathroom because people are vaping. I mean, there's stuff going on. Like, why haven't we installed those? It's not even on our operating budget money. It's money from a lawsuit that we're basically getting. Why haven't we been pr more proactive installing those? Because students are asking me, like, literally every week, where are the vape detectors? Because they really want them in our schools. Like, can we get an update on that? If someone could turn off the... So um, thank you for all of that. And it is very um, important and, and very um, seriously taken. Um, and I, I just do want to point out that uh, Ms. Ezefor Andrews joined us, you know, four and a half months ago um, and has, you know, hit the ground running. And so, you know, I take uh, the responsibility for making, there's been a ton of turnover, but, you know, it's my job as the chief operating officer to make sure that uh, we bridge those transitions and that the work continues. And, you know, I think that that is one of the, the vape detectors is one of the things that um, was kind of a victim of that. So we had, you know, a, a previous chief safety officer that came in that um, did not feel that that was necessarily the best investment of resources. Um, and so we kind of lost some momentum there. Um, and, you know, Michelle has come in and um, I think, you know, had some of the same questions. Is this really the best investment? And, uh, you know, I think it is a good investment f because of the challenges that we're seeing in the bathrooms, but it's also a good investment because it uh, reassures our students um, and, and is one of the th many things that we need to put in place to make sure that our schools are welcoming safe environments for their uh, for our students to come in uh, and, and learn and so uh, I appreciate all of that and just want to again mention you know uh, this certainly should not fall on Ms. Ezefor Andrews uh, being new to the system she has hit the ground running and done you know an incredible job as, as she has come in um, we do have you know another leadership position in that office um, Pre, you know, historically, we've only had one. We added a second um, and have just had trouble getting that staffed up. Uh, but I think given the complexities and the changing landscape of safety in schools these days, it's absolutely necessary to have both of those and to have them both filled uh, with experts. And so that is the direction that we're moving in. And again, thank you and, and uh, thank you to the uh, full board for um, the feedback today and um, you know I apologize that we missed the mark clearly with the uh, engagement and the feedback and we will you know get back to work uh, diligently on that and I think that we've got a, a good plan for moving forward with uh, you know a number of these other items that will be in place for the beginning of next school year. I, I appreciate that Mr. Owen. I think a big part of this is um, taking responsibility and I appreciate you know I appreciate that I don't think it falls on any staff in particular to be honest it was just circumstances there was a lot of people moving we haven't been fully staffed you know things have changed and so I, I really do think it's you know it's not on anyone in particular again I didn't I didn't want to say that it's based on circumstance but I do want to just reiterate that so um, I'm, I'm gonna let you know my other colleagues speak on this but I just want to say I, I really do hope that we, we can get going on this and that we can see this urgency as I know we all do. And if I can leave one mark on the system, you know, outside of the resolution alone, which I hope is a mark in and of itself, it'll be that hopefully next year we can have multiple topics on safety and security throughout the school year, not just one. Mr. Saeed, yes, um, the board had given us that feedback already that they want, especially mm -hmm. at the beginning of the school year. Okay. We want yes. to um, work with our agenda setting to make that be that be part of the opening of schools conversation. Perfect. We want to see how these recommendations are being put in place before we open schools. Perfect. So Thank you so much. Definitely yeah. uh, commit to doing that for our August meeting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, going on this side, and we're running out of time, folks. Some people have to leave because they have a 7 o'clock commitment. Uh, Ms. Rivetta Oven. Um, just quickly, I just want to echo what my colleague, Mr. Saeed, um, said, and I just want to say that um, from the student's perspective, right, we are the ones who make the decisions, we're the ones who implement a lot of these things, and they're the ones who live with the lack of consequences of our actions. They're the ones who go to, to the bills, and as an aunt and a godmother to a lot of kids right now in the system, 
of schools that have been on the news because of fighting and because they have a YouTube fighting channel. And I mean, this is this is like real time right now. This is what our kids are going through. And I am on the same boat. I, this is to me is very urgent. Um, and I know that we went through the community practice, mem you know, with the, with this membership. There is a lack of participation of certain groups, including the Asian group and the Latino group. That really concerns me um, that we did not get their voices. And I think if you only invite, you know, one group from that community, chances are they might not be able to make it. And the group that you invited, I think, is because they, they work during the day because many of them are are teachers, so they're not going to be able to make that commitment to go to all these meetings. But there are so many other groups. And I know the chief of police has these advisory groups from the various communities, from the Latino community, the African-American community, and the Asian community, that these people are engaged. They get their, they, you know, they get, they get all the reports. Juvenile delinquency has been on the up. I think it would be really helpful to actually get the data. When you give us the data, the data of juvenile, you know, delinquency crime in our county. So we can actually see a reality of the picture that we're talking about. Because we're talking about four arrests this year, right, so far? But when we look at the whole picture for the county, I think we need to have a more realistic um, picture of what's really going on with our young people. Because a lot of these young people are in our schools. They might not get arrested in MCPS, but they're certainly getting arrested outside of MCPS with some very, very serious crimes, right? So um, that is, you know, my feedback. I um, just like Sammy said, I think this is urgent. Um, and, um, you know, we can sit here and talk about it, but Sammy's folks are the ones who have to live with it. And I have to tell you, I, I have a really hard time going to sp sleep at night because it scares me that we really don't have these safety components in place in our schools. And God forbid that, you know, we have to be having a different conversation because we didn't put those, you know, safety measures in place. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Yes. Um, mine is a data request. Okay. So, um, you broke down this year's serious incident, but if I compare that to the previous years, I realized previous years, this number was not serious incident, it's all the encounter data, right? So if we say 13 fighting in middle school and 28 fighting in high school, that was, you read to me um, just now, but I think our students are telling us way more than this. So maybe the definition of, you know, what's a serious incident and might be different. So, you know, if we say only 28 fighting, but why are we getting reports about fighting every day or hear it from our family, right? So, you know, if, if what I, I know what I'm hearing is not rumor because people were involved. So this number doesn't reflect what I hear. So, so I am puzzled, so I'm asking for your help. Maybe you define serious incident with a certain definition, and this is the number that fit into it. Is but, there an a, a incidence? Yeah, law? if there may be an encounter data or incidents, that's just all incidents? So we, we don't house that data in our office. That's housed in off, uh, OSSWB. But that's a different um, category, just regular incidents versus serious incidents. You want to speak? Yes. Go ahead. The, the serious incidents that are reported um, that we collect and have presented for you uh -huh. are marked serious incident in our Synergy database. Okay. Um, a lot of times uh, a fight might occur between, like you were saying, like in the hallway, just a random fight between two students and altercation, uh -huh. um, and the school will uh, handle that incident in-house. Uh -huh. um, they don't require any additional resources and supports to come into the building, okay. and that's reported differently uh, in Synergy. So what we have access to is serious incidents mm -hmm. like what's reported here. Yeah. So that, you know, I want a, a more comprehensive picture 
Oh. There's incidents and there's serious there's incidents. incidents right? Same with arrests. There's the paper physical arrests, arrests and, and, paper and paper arrests, arrests. and yeah. then arrests in the community. That's a whole other cool. category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll just say, you know, that, that data is housed in OSSWB, and I don't see any of our colleagues from OSSWB there uh, here. But, um, you know, they play a critical role in our schools and our principals. Uh, you know, they're the ones who actually oversee the security personnel, the security personnel report to them. So it really is a collaboration um, with our schools and with OSSWB. Um, you know, not all of this uh, is just the responsibility of, of our safety office. But it really is it, has is to it be reported to the police that those are the, is that considered serious incidents when they're reported to the police? Is that the difference? Because I just want to get to the Turn bottom of it. Go ahead. Sometimes uh, an incident may require that we need police presence or the, the support of the CEO to report to the building, but it's not in every single case. Not every single case. Okay. So board staff, can you make that formal data request for just incident? I just want to put it out there. I'm, I want true picture. I'm not judging, say, oh, we have a surge, but I want to evaluate what's truly the picture in the building so that we can come up with plans to help our students. Okay, thank you. And for data from, from data from the police, I would like to know how many like incidents you guys get called for fights based on the data that you have, because I'm sure you keep data we as do. well. Anytime, anytime we're called, and we've been really pushing our CEOs and our uh, to make sure that if principals sometimes will contact the CEO directly about fights and things that happen in the building. We've been pushing, then the CEOs been pushing back, having them call the non-emergency number we have for MCPS so we can have that tracking because we don't have a tracking mechanism otherwise. But the way the MOU is currently set up, what we ter determine is sec what, under the color of the law, second degree assault, like a simple assault, pardon me, like mm -hmm. going like that, uh, wouldn't they, under the MOU, we wouldn't get called. So a fist fight, we wouldn't get called. If someone has a potentially permanent protracted injury or it was something of larger scope, then we would get called. So we'd have data on that. I wouldn't have, it wouldn't correlate. So just so you're clear, it wouldn't correlate to the data that these guys keep. It would be vastly different. Okay. But this, would this still get it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep, I'll be quick because I don't want to be repetitive, but I do agree with pretty much absolutely everything that's been said here. Um, this might sound like a weird question, um, but for our security staff, you know, you just mentioned if there's a fight, a fist fight, that you know we don't call the police. What do what are our security staff allowed to do? I mean, in terms of stop, I hear from students all the time that they don't like walking in their school because teachers, security staff can't even get the kids to go to yeah. class, let alone not fight. So I'm just curious how we're addressing that. So part of the challenge, as we mentioned earlier, is just the consistency across schools in terms of how the security staff are used and practices. Um, ideally, uh, part of their uh, job is to assist with minimizing fights, breaking them up, but there are certain restrictions in terms of how they can handle um, our students. Um, our, our security staff do take um, crisis uh, prevention um, training, um, but even with that, part of our, um, our assessment that we have done these past several months has been in, uh, looking at other uh, training that we can put our security staff through to use the appropriate techniques um, to de-escalate de uh, situations um, before even having anything physical happen, um, but to also use the appropriate techniques to minimize that. So there is an area um, of training that is needed um, with that. And again, um, as you mentioned, it, it's going to vary across schools. Um, and hearing the feedback from the students, and I even believe a, a while ago you mentioned um, there are fights that happen and students are not seeing enough involvement right. um, to prevent that. Um, and, they, and, and the fights are, are pretty, pretty bad. Right. Um, so it is an area of improvement that, uh, that we, we need to work on um, that has come up as part of the recommendations. Okay, well okay. if there's anything that we can do as a board, as a system in terms mm -hmm. of looking at the code of conduct aspect mm -hmm. or our policies, you know, mm -hmm. please speak up and let us know because mm -hmm. Um, it's, I feel like this is, you know, a big package that's going to need to be There's unwrapped a, by a lot of different oh yeah. people. There's a lot. There's and a lot. I know the community practice people, um, you know, I was 
curious of like who you were calling them subject experts. I'm like, other than a couple people on there, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a, so I'd really just, it's important to all of us to know that the recommendations and the work you're doing and the time mm -hmm. you're spending on this is being um, put together by actual experts who know, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in terms of what uh, Mr. Saeed mentioned about stuff not getting done and it not being urgent enough, um, I completely agree. And um, I think sometimes, uh, Mr. Hall, you mentioned, you know, we want to get it right and, you, you know, with the transitioning and everything, I think sometimes we sacrifice doing anything at all to get it right. <laughs> when sometimes just start get it, just start doing it. <laughs> and we can fix it later if we need to, if it's not adequate or whatever. But, um, but uh, you know, whether it's communication to families, you know, we don't want to put it out too soon because we're afraid we're not going to get it right. Kids are already putting it out there. It's all over social media. They're texting their parents. We're not keeping anything from anybody. <laughs> They're just getting their version of it instead of our yeah. version of it. And so it's just things like that that I just think that we need to be really cognizant of the fact that doing nothing at the uh, for the sake of doing it especially well or completely right, in my opinion, is is not worth the Thank you, Ms. Well, Montrosky. Um, if I can just um, add to what you're saying, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, one of the things that um, I'll just say, again, still being new coming in, um, that I believe would be beneficial is uh, we definitely need a culture shift. Um, again, with the uh, uh, reactive approach versus proactive, a lot of it is just historical practices of is that really happening versus it's really happening, we need to we need to move. So part of the engagement that I have been doing um, collaboratively with OSSWB, engaging principals, et cetera, has really streamlined a lot of the conversations that are being had now. Um, so um, I don't want to, uh, although it may not be visible, I don't want it to appear that no work is being done, that nothing with the resolution hasn't been done. Um, things are moving forward, um, and they're moving forward quickly. Mentioning the, uh, the the vape detectors, those will be in uh, before our students come back into school. Um, so there there are things moving forward. Um, is there area to move things a bit faster? Yes, um, but that's going to require collaboration. And um, you asked how um, we, you know, how you guys can support us. Um, we need that promotion of that culture shift. Um, the model isn't working, it doesn't fit, and we need to be very um, uh, uh, flexible to shift to the appropriate trends and the, the landscape. Our students today, what they're dealing with is not what I dealt with in high school. Right. Um, so it's different. My concerns about high school, I was focused on what shoes I'm going to wear, and right. our students today are focused <laughs> on, am I going to be in a fight today? Is someone yeah. going to be on drugs? So yeah. they're dealing with some critical issues, and there's a lot of trauma and stress that's there as well. So. I'm, I'm asking uh, on behalf of our office for support to change the culture. Yeah. Um, that right. has to happen. We are late, um, and we still have an opportunity. When I say I want us to get it right, yep. I, I not only want us to get it right, I know we can get it right. I know we can. Not everything requires money. Some things can be implemented right now. Yes. So, But we can't do it alone as an office. Yeah. Um, so we need help. Uh, we need the partnership, we need the collaboration, and I, I don't want us to take a siloed approach with this because we're not going to, we're going to fail. Right. Um, so, but it's a, it's a mindset, and so we ask for your support um, in that to, to, to have a, a major culture shift so we can make a difference. Well, I Thank will you. say, I, I mean, I can speak for myself, but obviously I think I'm speaking for my colleagues as well when we say, you know, we're all in. We want this, this is important, this is critical, and it's, um, we're all in. But one of the things in terms of, that's to me part of why the questions that we were asking about the safety um, audit, if you want to call it that, were so important, is because we don't like, you know, when you're talking about the CEOs point two and all of those other different things, we can't help you make that culture shift if we don't actually know what it is that we're supposed to be looking for. Correct. And so a part of the strategy that we need to develop, um, and I'm, I'm saying I don't know everything. Um, I have my background, um, but I, I'm not a know-it-all. And so um, just as I've come in with my expertise, um, it's important to collaborate. I don't have to know everything. You know, we have our appropriate partners, but if there is a strong recommendation to engage the appropriate subject matter experts. I'm saying not just in MCPS, but 
external to MCPS. There's a number of, of our partners that we engage that, that have gone through this and have a model that we can use. We're not reinventing the wheel. So that is part of um, our, our recommendation that we will um, implement. Um, and I, I just conclude with, um, I agree with what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to close the conversation, um, just reminding us that we will have you back before the school year opens uh, up again. Um, and I want us to work with our communications team to put together a one-pager in terms of what we are doing. Mm -hmm. We heard a lot of, we're not doing anything. And you said, yes, we are doing. Well, let's put it all in yeah. one piece of paper yes. so we can say, this is what we are doing. This is what you can expect to see when schools open in August. What's different? Um, I sat here a couple months ago during our budget work sessions and I said, where in the budget is safety and security? Um, and Ms. Pettifoot said, okay, we have X number of positions that support. We also have to show our community where, where we are investing in safety and security. We are still in a budget conversation. And money is tight, but we need to say, this is what we are investing in. This is what we need. Absolutely. Yep. We have to tell our community what we need because we can't do everything with the limited resources that we have. Yes. Um, so thank you for your hard work. Um, is, as you continue to get feedback, I want to hear from principals and teachers. You know, we heard from testimony today. Um, I don't want their voice to be lost in the big community of practice. Everyone's voice is valuable, but like the students, the teachers and the principals are living it every day as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we are almost there. We are going to have um, our legislative update uh, via memo, and folks can follow up if they have questions. So just in the interest of time, as you see, we're losing uh, board members as we speak. Um, because they have another commitment that they must attend. Our next item is item 12 for informational purposes only. Item 13, can I get a motion to move 13-1 and 13-2 in block? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. 13-3, previous business item. Uh, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. Wanted to bring back the career and technical education and dropout prevention program pilot that we discussed at the February 22nd meeting. I'm not going to go through a lot of this because in the interest of time, we need to move on. But this is a program to help students who are in their second and third year of high school and who don't even have enough credits to be considered really ninth graders. So I'm going to read the resolved, and that is that the Board of Education directs the superintendent to explore initiating a pilot program that will identify students from MCPS high schools who are at least 16 years old and who are at risk of not meeting graduation requirements prior to age 21 and currently who are not eligible for CREA. Identification and referral of such students will be made by school-based administrators with input from other staff as appropriate. A small group of students participating in the pilot will engage in a program of study similar to CREA and will work towards CTE credentials and certifications as well as towards a high school diploma or a successful completion of the GED exam. Program students and their families will receive additional access to wraparound services as necessary and through our established community partners, such as the Department of Health and Human Services, identity, and access to resources from the Black Physicians and Healthcare Network and the Chinese Culture and Community Service Incorporated. Internally, the program should be jointly managed by designated personnel in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer and designated personnel in the Office of the Associate Superintendent of Curriculum. The pilot program should be evaluated to determine continuation or expansion. So I just want to say two things. There are two minor changes from the, the, um, the one that, that we presented in February, and that was that the Chinese Culture and Community Service Center has agreed to also become a partner. 
and we have declined to specify the exact person who should be um, assigned to the activity and instead identified the office that should be responsible. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to, I guess I could move acceptance. Second. Is that appropriate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any uh, further discussion, questions? No, nope. seeing none, but all in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. Okay, our next um, item, we have another uh, business item, financial literacy. Ms. Yang? Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, to, this is uh, Mike. Mike. Start all over. No. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the resolution in terms of financial literacy. It has been a month, so I'm going to reread the resolve portion. Um, so. This resolution says, resolved, that the Board of Education direct the superintendent to continue to develop a full range of options for financial literacy instruction, including but not limited to course offerings, online modules accessible in multiple languages, and incentives for student engagement. The superintendent will provide an annual update on the number of students assessing financial literacy instruction and the number of graduating students who have had financial literacy instruction. So I think the financial literacy is an important life skills to prepare our students for college, career, and community. And uh, many of our students need an English proficiency level to assess the traditional uh, online module uh, in English. And now, as we know, that our data shows that at the beginning of this school year, um, back in June 1st, uh, 2023, there were 7,439 high school EML students in our system. And of them, 52% are at an ELP level one and level two. So this resolution directs the school system to create online modules in multiple languages and creates incentives for student engagement. Now, creating access and opportunity is a vital part of our work. Now, the board has discussed the importance of financial literacy instruction for many years. We have wrestled with wanting to make it a graduation requirement why understanding the challenges and obstacles to that? So every year we have taken incremental steps towards elevating financial literacy instruction because it is essential. So this is an excellent next step, ensuring that multilingual learners have access to this information. This resolution signals the board's commitment to create equitable access for our students for priority instructions. So I, I think um, with that, I will move uh, for acceptance. I'll second that motion. Any questions or discussion? I'll just say I know financial literacy is very important to our students, 100%. And I think this resolution expanding the scope at which students could complete that is 100% the interest of all students that I've heard. Everyone, everyone either supports it or has concerns that the class is not is not equitable enough. So I think this resolution just you know mm -hmm. saying okay, we're going to provide in multiple languages, we're going to give online modules is very helpful. So I just want to go on the record saying that. And Evan. just to add quickly, uh, we voted on uh, for the, to add the new policy that's going for private comment for the emergent multilingual learners. And in that, there is a specifically language about making sure that emergent multilingual learners to secure equal high quality opportunities in MCPS. Yep. So it goes very nicely with what we already discussed. Okay. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. All right. Board members, do you have any new business item that you would like to bring forward? <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> Seeing none, item number 14 is for informational purposes only. Number 15, can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands.
And that's unanimous with those present. We are now adjourned. And now? Now we have to close session. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the continuation of our closed session. April 11th, 2024, and we will now be read into closed session. Uh, without much enthusiasm. <laughs> I, move the I move that the board meet in closed session to address topics posted on the resolution for today's closed session and for the reasons and on the basis stated therein. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those. <laughs> we will now go into closed session.